Good morning, uh, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our second day of the conference and the first session uh, plenary lecture this morning. My name is uh, Dr. Tom Wolliver, and this is Professor Ginny Brand Miller from uh, Sydney. I'm from Toronto. And I will uh, turn the floor over to Professor Brand Miller to introduce our speaker. Welcome, everybody. I know that Professor David Jenkins is to the majority of you, but for the sake of the young um, here in the audience today, I want to tell you what a special person he is. Um, he is also a very special person to me. After my husband, he's probably the most important man in my life, but he doesn't know that. He doesn't know that a very quiet quarter all my life. So David is professor, university professor, Canada research chair in human nutrition, in nutrition and metabolism um, in the University of Ontario, um, Toronto, Ontario. He's a medical scientist. He studied at Oxford University. He has a, a beautiful English accent. He's never lost that. Um, even though he's lived in Toronto for so long. Um, he, he is the director of the Clinical Nutrition and Risk Factor Modification Centre at St Michael's Hospital in Toronto. He is an active staff physician in um, endocrinology and metabolism at St Michael's Hospital and also associate physician in the gastroenterology division in um, the Toronto General Hospital. So for those of you who are new to the field, um, Dr. Jenkins is um, known all over the world for his work on diet and the prevention and treatment of hyperlipidemia and diabetes. He has over 300 very original publications he was the first to, to define and explore the concept of the glycemic index of foods um, and to show the breadth of medical effects, um, met metabolic effects of viscous soluble fiber. So what we know about soluble fiber can be traced mostly to David Jenkins' work. Um, so he combined all the components of cholesterol lowering into a special diet called the portfolio diet. And it's an alternative to drug treatment um, like statins for lowering cholesterol. And it's the only dietary approach referenced in the updated guidelines of the US National Cholesterol Education Program. So now I'm going to leave the rest of what um, we're going to talk about to David Jenkins. Thank you very much. David isn't feeling extremely well this morning, unlike his usual self. Um, so we're going to allow him to sit down and uh, we're going to let him um, talk as much as he'd like, but he may be, his voice may be a bit low, so we're going to amplify it as much as we can. So thank you, everybody. Over to you, David. Jenny, what a wonderful introduction. Um, my wife is up pointing to me. Something's gone wrong. I don't know what it is. Oh, okay. So it's okay. So Jenny is wonderful. Um, she's one of the tremendous leaders in the field, in the field of nutrition, in the field of carbohydrates. And one of the great, I, I think, along with Tom, one of the founders of the glycemic index. So it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have her here and to be introduced by her in such glowing terms, and the feelings are quite mutual. Um, so let me just say, uh, I'm going to carry on um, in a way where Frank left off in terms of precision medicine. Um, <clears throat> and I want to thank all of you here who've come at what for, to me is two o'clock in the morning um, to turn up after a busy day yesterday and a late evening to actually come here and listen to me in the morning. So that's a great, great privilege. So carbohydrate quality in human health. 
does glycemic index deserve a place at the table with whole grains and fiber? Here are my conflicts of interest. As you can see at the bottom are my main conflicts. My wife, Alexandra, <clears throat> who's a scientist at Equus, and my two daughters, Wendy and Amy, who are here in the audience, fortunately, um, who uh, write books and uh, make money from them, I hope. Uh, although they're, they're, not, they're not shaking their heads on that one. Um, Dad has always been part of the treatment plan. Sorry, this seems to move on its own. The treatment plan in the Indian Adufi medicine, Chinese traditional medicine, with an emphasis on fruit, vegetables, and complex carbohydrates. So that's not new. Um, in the West, carbohydrates part of the diet was emphasized by the leaders of nutrition and fashion in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And I think it's worth just mentioning these people because I think they're great examples of people who had foresight. The first is the Reverend um, Sylvester Graham, um, 1794 to 1851. He was a Presbyterian minister, a major advocate for both plant-based diets and for good bread. He didn't invent the cracker named after him, the Graham cracker, um, but believed in consumption of unmodified whole wheat products. He was also a leader in the temperance movement for physical and spiritual health. So I think that the interest of the uh, of of, uh, of nutrition um, in its full sense and its environmental sense started coming at that point. Um, Ellen G. White is the next great person. I think 1827 to 1915 was co-founder of the Seventh Day Adventist Church movement. She promoted vegetarianism and paid for John H. Kellogg's medical training. She wrote much on plant-based diets for health and humanity, diet and the environment. Lived for nine years in Australia, founded the Sanitarium Vegetarian Food Company and the production of Weetabix and Vegemite. So she really had a, a, a broad career and a broad impact. And then, of course, there's John Harvey Kellogg himself, director of the sanitarium at Battle Creek that was a large and fashionable health resort, promoted plant-based foods, cereal foods, e.g. all bran, and colonic health. The sanitarium entertained many well-known people, Teddy Roosevelt, Bernard Shaw, and other notables, and was the first to produce cereals for widespread distribution. So that, I think, is... Uh, is where our, our beginnings in carbohydrates started. New, new draft guides, dark draft, sorry, new draft who guidelines, WHO guidelines in 1922, um, gave a grade of moderate certainty to this, but it was the key part of their guideline. Eat more whole grains, vegetables and fruit, legumes, to reduce the risk of all-cause mortality and major non-communicable diseases. When one looks at it, it's not that different from what was being said 200 years ago. So that's interesting. Their evidence was not based on just looking at local people and working out what was happening. <clears throat> but the evidence from systematic reviews, randomized controlled trials, and prospective observational studies conducted in adults found that the higher dietary fiber intake would lead to small reductions in various measures of body fatness, moderate to high degree of certainty, and is associated with reduced risk of developing and or dying from cardiovascular diseases, type two diabetes and cancer, or moderate certainty evidence. Similar higher consumption of whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and pulses are associated with reduced risk of developing or dying from cardiovascular diseases, moderate certainty. Unfortunately, no mention of the history and culture, just facts and grade. 
So uh, I do think that it, uh, it doesn't sort of uh, fill the bill of where nutrition is going, but nevertheless, it's based on solid science. Statistical science, I have to say, not nutritional science. Um, so the WHO conclusions are based on a meta-analysis of Redden's et al. Et al. And their data um, showed quite nicely uh, the dose response that one saw for all-cause mortality, coronary heart disease incidence, type 2 diabetes, colorectal cancer, with dietary fiber. So dietary fiber did all these things. And the analysis was large. They had uh, over 68, nearly 70,000 deaths um, on which to base this. So again, this good, solid science that we're very proud of. And for whole grains, same sort of effects. This time, even more deaths, nearly 90,000 deaths in this um, meta-analysis. So uh, showing the data quite clearly. It's interesting that when we talk about dietary fiber and whole grains, we talk about them as three words. Um, are they all the same? What is fiber? Is it just one particular co component, one, one compound? It's found in many, many foods, wheat, cabbage, beans, are they all the same? No, they're very different structure. Some viscous, some insoluble, some soluble. Was a fiber expert consulted one wants to know? What would Peter Ellis, for example, have said to the combination of fiber put in this particular way? I think it's very easy for people who aren't deeply embedded in nutrition to talk about fiber. It's much more difficult for those who've got some nutritional knowledge to talk about one thing when you talk about fiber. So early on, we showed that some fibers reduced LDL and some increased fecal bulk. So if you take the more viscous fibers, the guar and the pectin, the percent increase in fecal weight is very little. Um, if you took the change in total cholesterol, then they have a big effect and no effect on uh, fecal bulk, which is well illustrated by carrot, cabbage, and bran fiber. But yet these things are all classed as one, interestingly, should they? Um, what about whole grain, a food that's milled, a flour, or an intact grain, or both? It's called whole grain. So one assumes it's, the, it's a grain that's whole, or is it just the whole of the grain? FDA uh, may allow just over 50% of whole grain to call itself whole grain. So it doesn't have to be all whole grain if it is whole grain. And then what are the grains? Uh, we looked at the glycemic ind indices of uh, bread made from milled leavened white flour on the top, then bread made from will, uh, milled leavened wheat flour, then leavened wholemeal flour, then bread made from whole kernels and milled flour. Um, parboiled, lightly milled, cracked rice. Uh, cracked grain, rather, wheat. Um, whole grain, the intact grain, that is. And then uh, two sets of whole grain. And uh, depending on the nature of the, of the whole grain, um, one saw very different with wheat kernels versus rye kernels versus bulgur, pumpernickel bread, wholemeal rye bread, whole wheat bread, and white bread. All of these, if you look at the end, have different glycemic indices, ranging from 100 um, or 96, right the way down to 47. So the big difference is, so we think that um, one perhaps should be more careful when one talks about fiber and whole grain. And one would like to see what the effects were when one divided them into different sorts of fiber and whole grain. Are we actually covering up a lot of very different benefits? That's, I think, the concern. 
Anyway, should we be talking about whole grain versus whole grain flour? Um, what's the new you evidence, the new World Health Organization evidence? Well, that was on the glycemic index and glycemic load. Although evidence for low glycemic index and glycemic load was reviewed, there was little consistency observed in benefit or mortality or non-communicable disease incidence from observational studies, very low to moderate certainty evidence, and little to no improvement in cardiovascular risk factors observed in randomized controlled trials, obviously short. And this was classed as very low to high certainty evidence. My friends, that is the extreme of the grade system. And yet it says consistent. So I'm a little worried about the, the, the who evidence. Um, it seems to be uh, underselling things a little bit and uh, promoting certain things, but not giving the originators um, in the 18th and 17th century any credit. Um, so, what about the GI and the effects? Well, as you can see, there's not much in the way of dose response. Perhaps a little for glycine, for, for diabetes type 2. But if you remember, the number of deaths that we saw for whole wheat was around about 90,000 and about uh, 80,000 for fiber. Um, the total deaths in this cohort of meta-analysis, rather not cohort in this meta-analysis, was just 7,699. So about a tenth. So we really don't, they, they're basing their, their evidence on not too many studies. So I have a few criticisms of this. Perhaps I think the interesting thing is, is there a mechanism for postprandial glycemia? And I think one of the nice things that one sees here is um, a study showing quite nicely uh, the effect of a pulsed, a, 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 a clamp study where twice during the clamp study, glucose injections were made and the effects were seen on markers of oxidative stress. And this is in healthy volunteers. Um, and what one can see in this uh, publication by uh, Antonio Siriello, well known in this field, is you can see at the top the pulse in glycemia over the period. And then underneath, um, you see flow-mediated vasodilatation. And you can see that that's impaired unless you've injected vitamin C, in other words, the head of an infusion of C, to correct the oxidative stress. And at the bottom, uh, you can see nitrotyrosine as a marker of, uh, of oxidative stress, also rising in pulses, unless you manage in these diabetic patients and to infuse them with vitamin C. And the effect is uh, much less marked in diabetes because the vitamin C fails in this situation uh, to suppress uh, the impairment of flow-mediated vasodilatation and the rise in nitrotyrosine. So I think this is a very nice experiment showing that an antioxidant effect is important and oxidative stress can be induced by rises in glycemia. And here, a study by Monnier, um, again, following on with this work, showed that this is um, continuous glucose monitoring over the day. You can see the mean here um, with a couple of meals. And what they looked at was they looked at what the effects were of those who had the greatest mage, the greatest mean, um, uh, mean glu glucose excursion. And uh, the results of this were interesting. 
because here they found that uh, the rates of uh, uh, the eight isoprostaglandin uh, two alpha were uh, directly related to the MAGE, the maximum excursion in glycemia uh, during the day. So I think, again, we've got a lot of reason for there to be some potential damage when one keeps rising and falling blood glucose levels. In other words, when one gives a high glycemic index diet. So a reduced MAGE, well, one of the, the drugs that can reduce MAGE is ACABOS, uh, the alpha glycoside hydrolase inhibitor. And so what about the studies where ACABOS has converted the diet into a low glycemic index diet effectively? What does one see then? Well, if one looks at the stop NIDM trial, um, their ACABOS reduces postprandial glycemia, and one can see um, a very nice reduction in um, diabetes incidence. So one sees here a reduction in diabetes incidence in, in the ACABOS study um, of the stop NIDM study. That was a small study. It's been criticized. So we have a much larger study. Um, the, <coughs> the study that was done in, in China on fairly heavily medicated um, pre-diabetic patients, the ACE study. And there you can see, uh, certainly on the, the left-hand side, the diabetes incidence, and you can see ACABOs in control, basically over a six-year period. Um, uh, no effect on cardiovascular death, although I have to say uh, the ACABOs is certainly below the control there. And one of the arguments is that uh, when you get cardiovascular disease after diabetes, it takes time. So that's perhaps the reason why over that uh, very effective ACE study. They only saw the diabetes effect. But I think what one can say is that certainly looking at, at slowing the rate of absorption of carbohydrate does have effects in terms of uh, disease incidence, diabetes in this situation. And Jeff, who's here, Jeff Lizzie here in the audience has uh, done a large meta-analysis uh, looking at uh, the effects of uh, glycemic index in uh, various cohorts, um, those with uh, a better glycemic index and those called gl good glycemic index, in other words, the correlations are uh, uh, greater than 5.5 uh, five, and those which are not so good, uh, the less than 5.5. Five, five. And although the less than 5.5 five, five don't show the effect that dramatically, it's shown very dramatically if you've got a good uh, assessment of glycemic index in your cohort and overall a significant effect. So as with the ACABOs, uh, so with the glycemic index. And finally, um, eat pulses. That's one of the recommendations and it's a good recommendation uh, based on statistics based on cohort studies. But it's worth mentioning that um, these findings um, were found away quite a while away ago. Evidence for moderate certainty overall for a systematic review of prospective observational studies demonstrating associations between higher intakes of pulses and reduced risks of cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes in prospective cohort studies. There were, before the pulse statistics, quite a lot of studies showing that the glycemic index of pulses was remarkably low. Um, we showed this, um, I think it was back in uh, 1980, looking at grains, breads, breakfast cereals, biscuits, tubers, and dried legumes. And at the bottom, you can see the dried legume which is the low one, and uh, I think quite dramatically so. 
and uh, very different from most other starchy foods. So we decided that we weren't going to beat the Reynolds paper in terms of the number of studies, number of cohorts, but we thought it would be useful to use some large cohorts, often because they're very well done um, and it's easy to see um, whether there's any anything that's different in that cohort. So we use large cohorts with a very large number of participants, over 100,000, to facilitate a more precise estimate of the treatment effect and so make it easier to assess the representativeness of the sample and to generalize the results uh, for the duration to be less potentially important. So if you were slightly shorter um, with a very large cohort, it wasn't so disastrous as if you were short with a small cohort. And to look at less common outcomes, heart failure and the mor mortalities, which are less common, um, but in a big cohort you may get them. And for uniformity in approach, for a greater number of individuals to allow characterization of that population and useful if one wants to do participant level meta-analyses. So we took the data um, from uh, the uh, Richard Doll Consortium and also others in the literature who had these large studies and had had an interest in, in uh, the glycemic index. And we looked at their data. Um, what one can see, this is just the GI pooled estimates from large cohorts for associations with chronic disease. Uh, this is GI, and as you can see, um, certainly you, with type 2 diabetes, only four cohorts, but a really nice effect um, and highly significant. And one goes down stroke, one goes down to stroke mortality, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, things that we looked at individually. And you can see that all of them um, tended to lie on the, uh, on the favors lower GI side. Uh, if one looks at the diabetes, we look to see whether there was a sex difference. And as you can see here, uh, we didn't see a sex difference. But it is seen, we do see sex differences in, in other outcomes. And then we did what we thought was more interesting. We looked at the direct comparison of GI with fiber in the same cohort, the same people. And we looked at what the effects of fiber were um, and what the effects of GI were and compared them. Uh, the black is the GI, the light is the fiber. And as you can see, certainly if you get down to the bottom to the total, there really wasn't the big difference that we'd expected uh, from the Reynolds meta-analysis. And if we'd looked at whole grain, the effect is very similar. So again, it didn't matter whether you're looking at type 2 diabetes, uh, CVD, uh, diabetes-related cancer. Um, we, we looked at diabetes-related cancer um, or total mortality. One got effects that were not negative from the GI point of view by comparison with the whole grain. So I think that um, in conclusion, I believe that the GI and GL, um, I, it would be justified in the joint fiber and whole grains for chronic disease prevention and that large cohort studies I will have a role in determining the details. And recommendations for the future uh, will have to include cultural and environmental issues. Thank you. I think I've kept you for long enough. Hello. Thank you very much, David. That was wonderful. Um, and you've left us a lot of time for discussion. So um, we have some microphones for people to ask questions or make comments. 
think they just had enough. Maybe they've all had enough and want to go out for something. Yes, over there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, David, thank you so much for this really wonderful summary of not just the current evidence, but also the history. So the um, comparison um, among GI uh, whole grains and fiber, I think that's really important because those three concepts are interrelated, but they also represent different dimensions of uh, kind of carbohydrate quality. So I guess one question is whether any of those large cohorts have mutually adjust for each other when they run st uh, multivariate models because that's the only way you can see whether uh, GI is independent of fiber or uh, whole grains. Good, very good point. Um, I think the majority of the studies um, corrected GI for fiber. Interestingly, only the Harvard cohorts corrected also for whole grains, but none corrected for GI. So we don't know what the effect is if one was to take away a GI effect, which one would see with fiber and one would see with whole grains too. But I think that's a really important point. Um, David, I have a question, if I may. Um, Frank emphasizes, Frank, Professor Frank, who emphasizes low glycemic load. You, in your new unpublished analysis, are emphasizing glycemic index. And in my, some of my discussions yesterday with Frank, I said you can't have a low glycemic load diet without good glycemic index data. And there's a prevailing undercurrent that I detect that glycemic index measurements are not reliable, not reproducible. And I'm wondering where that message comes from. Who is spreading it? Um, is it the food industry? And what can we do about it? I have to say that we had more glycemic index studies than we had load. So that's true. And I think the glycemic load generally fitted with what we've been saying on glycemic index. There are some interesting things if one... We looked at the diabetes-related cancers as as a feature because we're trying to look at things which are diabetes related. There is some quite interesting data on the non-diabetes um, non related cancers with, um, with glycemic load. And uh, I think they need far more explanation. Um, it didn't relate to which was weird, uh, to total carb, which I thought it would. So it's not just a displacement by carb that may make glycemic load look not too bad by comparison with glycemic index, because that's always the worry. Uh, what is the effect of the carb? Um, if the carb has a beneficial effect, for example, if it displaces foods that are perhaps not so desirable, then one has an issue, possibly. Um, we haven't gone into that in this particular series in detail, but obviously these are areas that need to be explored in the future. But as for the reason why the glycemic index is uh, a crazy measurement, I think the reason for that is it's very simple. <laughs> it's very simple. And there, there are people who say that, that really... Uh, postprandial rises are not that important. And that really, uh, you should be looking at the hemoglobin A1c, for example, uh, not, the, not the mage. And um, all I was trying to do was build up a case for glycemic index 
saying that I think it does have mechanism um, and it's, uh, it's not as complicated as one has to go through. I think the fact that you can measure glycemic index and that people will look at the food they're eating and see whether it's rising or not um, gives it a sort of simplicity which is bound to encourage criticism. I don't think we like simple things. That's why I think that the, uh, the Reynolds paper is so wonderful because it's so complicated and so statistical. But it's not really related to the foods. So, um, David, it's Mike Lean here over on your right, I guess. A really simple question I've been dying to ask for years. We all had to get up at 8 o'clock this morning to come to this talk which means we had to have our breakfast. The question is, does glycemic index vary by time of day, the same food in the same person, if, if we have a, a lump of carbohydrate in the morning or in the evening? Does there, is there a diurnal variation? Well, yes, I think there's also, a, so a, a, there's also a, a second meal effect, so that the meal that you had influences the glycemic response to the next meal. So if you have slow-release carbohydrate in the first meal, it will still improve your glucose tolerance at that. So I think it's quite complicated, to be honest, Jenny, no, but we've not done glycemic indices throughout the day. That would be interesting. But then one would have to be controlling too um, for the rate of fasting and the rate of free fatty acid rising, et cetera, et cetera. One's got to control all these things. And I don't think I've done, I've not done it, maybe Jenny or Tom have, but um, all I know is that we've got second meal effects. Uh, Tom showed there is a second meal effect from dinner for the breakfast you eat. So even what you had for dinner is going to affect your breakfast. So yes, and that's, I think, why uh, in a very simple way, and you asked me a good question, but in a very simple way, we try and keep uh, everything standard before we do a glycemic index. So it's as standard as possible and do it in the morning in a sort of standard way and use it, use the glycemic index as the breakfast, rightly or wrongly. Dave, um, I was just wondering, um, Reynolds must have left, well, I mean, what was his criteria for including the studies? Because you showed some uh, observational studies which had good effects on with glycemic index, whereas he showed there was nothing in his. So he, did they just leave out studies? Why, why was his analysis not, not uh, showing anything? Do you think what studies did he leave out or whatever? All I can say is we looked at the data. He looks at the data. Uh, so we did the same thing looking at the data. And I can't tell why he gets these same effects. He does, actually, to give, to give him his credit, if you look at um, page 54 in, in, in the supplement, you find that he finds significant effects for, um, for stroke, significant effects for glycemic index, significant effects for breast cancer. He finds a whole load of sort of, he doesn't report it. It's not reported. So he does actually find some very interesting stuff. Uh, I think one, if, if one was just had time, I'd go through his, his data and uh, pull out all the effects and rewrite it. But please look at page 58 in the supplement. It, the supplement is 200 pages. Well done. Do you have any other? Uh, yes? Up in the front row, please. Thank you. Uh, David, again, it's a very lucid presentation, even though I know it's not the optimal uh, health condition at the moment. But as said, talking about the glycemic index, I think I'm actually much more optimistic. At the, as the data all around the world um, emerge, keep generating. Um, 
Well, I hope we're going to be doing some <laughs> generation what, cells. What one of those? So, if if I may a little bit, so I, I hear my own echoes for some reason, but um, if I may sort of recall a bit of the history for for dietary carbohydrate, twenty eight years ago when I first doing my doctoral studies reaching out to you when I review all the world's literatures on carbohydrate, looking at carbohydrate and diabetes. Essentially, at that time, what we about a dozen, a dozen more uh, prospective cohort studies have been reported in the literature that directly link carbohydrate or attempt to link dietary carbohydrate intake to the risk of diabetes. Again, mainly in, uh, in the US, including the Pima Indian, and also in Europe. Those studies, with one exception, uh, largely show no direct association that are statistically significant. What that tells me is that carbohydrate, in the, and then also many of those investigators or authors fail to appreciate the substitutional effects, meaning like you cannot, with the energy, constant, you cannot simply increase carbohydrate intake without lowering other energy contributors. So, but even so, many of those studies show no direct relationships. So that's in that context that I reach out to you and Jenny, started to, uh, and also Samaran and, and Jorge Samaran's works to build the Guy Civic Index as a extraneous parameters to help to calculate or almost weigh the carbohydrate or standardize carbohydrate intake in such a way that allow one's focus on the glycemic effects of carbohydrate. So in other words, for the first time then, since our work is that we were able to look at dietary carbohydrate, standardize, after incorporating glycemic index, which is the experimental data that generated uh, by various clinical researchers around the world that allowed to allow us to sort of like directly report a direct relationship with diabetes risk and heart disease risk. So the way I see it, however, now with the machine learning, with the computing um, infrastructure significantly improved, I actually submit that the more variable that we put in, um, in, in, in other words, the parameters, this kind of extraneous in information being introduced in the well-designed um, cohorts from diverse population will help to sort of like ultimately offer a solution. But the data is actually, in my view, it's very, very clear. What's an, what's an unclear is that it is really uh, uh, the folks in, in the field has to be vigilant about the people who do meta-analysis because meta-analysis, the way I see it mathematically, it does offer a unifying, uh, comfortable uh, framework that summarizes the world's literature in looking at the totality, consistency, and also the quality of the evidence. That's something that we've been trying to push and standardize in the field. However, ultimately we are all humans. Doing the meta-analysis is still a subjective exercise. So, so that is actually the point I wanted to make. So I don't see, however, it's a negative thing that when Jenny mentioned about this undercurrent, eventually when more data is generated, it, it, the, the story would be clear. And then I think that uh, based on my assessment, if you can do some of the cumulative meta-analysis for anyone to actually refuse the pattern that we have seen consistently for the past 20, 28 years, uh, it's, it's nearly impossible. You have to come up with a studies that uh, involve over millions of people that come up with a opposite finding to even change it, you take a Bayesian view.
first field that when you want to do a meta-analysis, it's always a good practice to find one meta-analysis that some statistician has done. And if you could, could you hold the mic closer to your mouth, please? If you can reproduce a, a meta-analysis that a statistician has done, at least you've got some control over what you're doing. You know you're getting something right. What I know is that when we've looked at GI and glycemic load and the impact on, on uh, cardiovascular disease and on type 2 diabetes, that there has been a statistician who finds the global response, that is, not just the limited area, but realizing that glycemic index is a very wide range of numbers and different persons have different wide ranges. When you put all that together, you can come up with very high uh, uh, effects of glycemic index and glycemic load. And I have repeated now for, uh, for uh, the studies are updated, one from done by a statistician many years ago now, and, but, and recently I've repeated that, and you can get that right. Um, what I know about the Reynolds work is that you couldn't possibly have followed a statistician's approach to doing this. What I think is that this was a different, there was different control or reference values for each of the individual studies, whereas if you're doing a global assessment, you would have to use a single reference point, for, which is the lowest for the, for the lowest glass, uh, for the lowest reference uh, range of uh, glycemic index. Basically, what it amounts to is that if you think that you're going to go from a place from A to B on a map, that when you get to B, you look to the next place, if you want to go to C, you start at B, you go to C. But the way that Reynolds appears to have done the work is that he's, he's always come back to point A to get to point C. In other words, he, he wouldn't follow a map of, of, of how to do this work. So I know there are very serious issues in the meta-analyses from the Reynolds paper. talk, I understand what's going on. We have to ask question each one from the first row. That's and <laughs> Hannah. So I don't have question, but I just feel, you know, obliged. Uh, you know, we all, we all kind of, many of us are part of this polysaccharide family or mafia. And then you have families. And then one family is more keen on GI, hygienic, and, and, then, and then some on whole grain and some on fiber. I mean, I, I kind of like fiber in particular one. I'm a little confused with this whole grain concept. And if you, if you look at this Lancet paper from Reynolds, he has two graphs, if I remember correctly, one showing the effect of fiber and one of the whole grain, identical, which you mean effect of whole grain because of the fiber. But then my other criticism of whole grain, and I've been talking to people in the United States that make this family called whole grain. Oats and barley are not whole grain to me. And then you have another paper because of the fiber. That's how they work. They don't work because of carbohydrate and protein and magic uh, micronutrients, whatever they call, I mean, anti-nutrients, whatever. You know, and then, you know, and then you have paper in AGCN where they are showing effect on cholesterol, many, 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 many studies. Nice effect on cholesterol. They remove oats and barley. There is no effect. So I don't like this story about whole grain because whole grain is not whole grain. You're looking for fiber. Anyway, anyway what is your comment? Now it's hard. And that we can um, maybe I can uh, carry on with this. Uh, coming from a country with uh, loads of different breads, and most of them, um, well, the whole range of whole grain breads is is rising even further these days. But most of them, even though have, we have tested only a few, 
I do have a relatively high, as I see it, in it. So maybe you can comment a little bit on, on um, how should we go on in the future and what should we be doing to um, keep people eating whole grains because there's other reasons to consume them, but to make sure that they really choose whole grains with low glycemic index. I think, thank you, I think that's important. <coughs> I think the whole grain issue, when one deals with traditional European breads, is much more complex. Um, I think if you have a pumpernickel bread, uh, we've always regarded that, for example, as being a good bread um, for a low glycemic index response because the, the grains are relatively intact and um, then you can expect to have a lower response and that seemed to be a healthy thing. Then we did some more testing of uh, pumpernickel breads in the Toronto area. I don't know whether this is happening in Scandinavia. But we found that there were some quite high glycemic index pumpernickel breads. We were surprised. We went to the manufacturer and we found what they were doing because of the slight bitterness you sometimes get with a whole grain pumpernickel type bread. Uh, they were liberally lacing it with glucose syrup. And so the glycemic index of the glucose syrup pumpernickel bread was much higher uh, than the original pumpernickel breads that they had before they added the glucose. So I really don't know what you do at this point. I think there is a liking for sweet things. And I think the more refined a thing is for starch, uh, the more likely you are to get uh, mortos, mortotriers, and the, the, the sugar components. And that may be just something people like. Uh, we're, we need to close down now. Thank you very much, David. Thank you all for your questions and discussion. And uh, let's give uh, Dr. Jenkins a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>
Yes, I think we are ready to start on the next session. My name is Anna Maria Oas. Uh, I'm from the Oslo University Hospital, and uh, with me, uh, co-chairing is Anne Rahm, University of Copenhagen, Denmark. Pleased to be here. And uh, we're both very eager to keep the time. We just say that in the first, <laughs> as the first sentence. Um, and um, to start this session on uh, carbohydrate quality metrics and defining healthy foods. Uh, an opportunity for further harmonization, uh, we have Jenny Ben Miller. And it's a pleasure to welcome Jenny to the stand, and uh, we will talk about the uh, sugars as markers of carbohydrate quality, or something in that direction. And Jenny has a long track record and is well famous, especially for the glycemic index work. So it's a pleasure to, to see you here, and, and please, uh, your floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anne. All right, so the topic of this presentation is how important are sugars as a marker of dietary quality? Lessons from the preview study. This is a big question, and we can only answer one component of that today. And hopefully, we'll have some more for you next year. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the um, preview study and the background to doing the sugar analysis. So preview, for those of you who don't know, is a large multinational study that was carried out in eight different countries. It used meal replacements um, for the initial eight weeks of weight loss, and then it compared over the next three years two diets and two exercise strategies for weight loss maintenance. So there were, it was a high protein and low GI diet combined, and there was a moderate protein, a typical protein, typical carbohydrate, um, typical GI diet as well, so two diets. And <coughs> we followed the individuals over the next three years. So the inclusion criteria were 25 to 70 years, overweight and obesity, uh, pre-diabetes by the American Diabetes Association criteria, but also exceptional willingness to undertake such an intensive um, high burden study, seven clinical investigation days um, throughout that three-year period, <coughs> and to attend throughout 17 group sessions, um, which were two hours long. And then also to collect data at regular intervals throughout the three years, including dietary records, accelerometry, and 24-hour urine sample. So it's an extremely intensive study with good data. And <coughs> what makes it special is that it's multinational. So, period, weight loss, eight weeks, um, weight loss maintenance went for 34 weeks, 8% weight was the inclusion criteria for um, follow-up into the weight loss maintenance phase, and we had very high um, retention at the eight weeks, much higher than we expected. So you can see there was fading intensity um, throughout that three years, um, but the 17 group sessions meant we were, had a good handle on how people were going. So this is the findings. These are the findings at three years out of two and a half, 2,300 eligible participants. The completion rate was 74% at 12 months. But by 36 months, as expected, it was 52%. Um, participants, um, I, actually, we, ho we hoped we would have higher retention at 36 months. But in fact, some, in, some centers had higher retention than others. Um, the participants who developed diabetes, there were only 62. That's 3% of the cohort. We expected 30, so we were victims of our own success. We did not have the nurses um, of diabetes to 
validly compare the two um, diets or the two exercise strategies. No significant differences. Um, but of course, we don't know the cases that um, were in the dropouts. But one of the most powerful messages is that the rate of diabetes, incidence of diabetes was the same in those that have very high retention rates. So we think that it's a, a result variable. But apart from diabetes prevention, what was really important to question was weight loss maintenance over that period of three years. And Preview is still, I think, one of the longest studies ever to look at weight loss maintenance so carefully. And you can see the high protein diets there, the, the red and orange ones, um, exactly the same as the moderate protein ones. <coughs> but if you look at the differences in the rates of normal glucose levels, normal glucose tolerance, normal fasting glucose, what you can see is there is a difference between the two diets. And this is not widely acknowledged, but the high protein diets were associated with poorer outcomes. The higher protein diets were not associated with as good outcomes as the moderate protein diets. And so that's an important lesson to take away from preview. Perhaps there are adverse effects of high protein diets on glycemia. But the next thing on the tree analysis of the pool data in terms of glycemic index and glycemic load. And this is similar in design to what Karen about the sugar analysis. So the in this case we had almost 1,300 participants with four-day record um, that what we've done is um, look at um, tertiles of glycemic index and tertiles of glycemic and its relationship to body weight. So a uh, body weight and HbA1c. So body weight on the left, and you can see that the highest tertile of glycemic index um, has much faster, that's in green, that's the green line, has much higher rate of weight regain compared to the lowest tertiles of glycemic index, which, are the, which is the orange line. And the same applies to glycated hemoglobin. You can see that the lowest glycemic load tertile across the whole three-year period had very little regain or re <coughs> um, rise in HbA1c. So I think these are really important results from preview that are not widely recognized. The same applied to um, glycemic load. You can see um, but it's, it's, it's really the, the highest glycemic index, the one in green is associated highest glycemic load diets are associated with greater, greater weight regain and a greater rise in HbA1c. So now I'm going to pass um, the microphone over to my postdoc, who is Dr. Karen Delacorte from Brigham Young University at, um, in Utah, who's done this analysis of sugars in the preview study. So thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, it's a, it's been a great privilege to have the opportunity to work on this excellent data set to investigate sugars. Uh, sugars, I'm sorry, if I could get access to the notes, I wanna make sure I get things down just right. Um, sugars have been a part of my research over the past few years, and I've had the opportunity to work with Jenny um, Jenny. Uh, over in, at University of Sydney, and um, my, uh, my doctorate degree was together with um, Annette Burkin at University of Padabon, where we've done multiple sugar studies as well. And it has been a privilege to work on such a, an excellent data set uh, where we explored um, the associations of dietary sugars and glycemic index with indices of glucose metabolism and body weight. So um, Jenny has already introduced the main objectives and findings 
of the, the previous study. And I'll be presenting findings from a secondary analysis based on pooled preview data, irrespective of the original randomization. So we looked at the data from an observational point of view. And in this sub-study, uh, we aimed to assess the relevance of these three sugar predictors, added free and total sugars, um, with glycemic index as a comparator. And for these outcomes, we looked at indices of body fat, including body fat percentage, BMI, and waist circumference, and indices of glucose metabolism, including fasting insulin, HbA1c, fasting glucose, and C-peptide. So as you're aware, um, sugar and health is a highly debated topic in the field of nutrition. Sugar is most often vilified, and um, sugar intake is discussed in health-related contexts. The public health recommendations to limit sugars uh, mostly derived from well-powered uh, prospective cohort studies that have shown a consistent and strong uh, association between sugar-sweetened beverages and type 2 diabetes risk, as well as other outcomes. However, this adverse effect of sugar-sweetened beverages on glycemic control is, is really only seen uh, when sugar-sweetened beverages are consumed as excess energy. Um, and findings for other sugar types beyond sugar-sweetened beverages beverages is, is uh, more sparse and, and less consistent. Fructose, as you know, is the sugar type to which harm has been attributed, owing to its unique metabolism and unregulated uptake. And so it's been singled out as a key promoter of disease, especially when consumed in isolated and, and high-dose amounts. But when you look at lower to moderate intake amounts, uh, multiple meta-analysis of controlled trials have found that when fructose replaces other carbohydrates, mostly starch, and energy matched substitutions, um, HbA1c improves. Now, looking um, at observational evidence, there was a meta-analysis of 15 cohort studies that reported no association between total sugar intake as well as fructose with type 2 diabetes incidence. And sucrose in this analysis was even linked to a decreased risk in type 2 diabetes. So um, also as background, it's important to know that there are some inherent challenges when it comes to sugar research that may lead to inconsistent findings and prolong the debate and controversy. Um, we know that sugar is consumed and assessed and reported in studies in numerous ways, and this could lead to amb ambiguities between studies. So broken down on a chemical level, um, sucrose, fructose, um, and fructose, glucose, and sucrose have unique metabolic effects. And then there are sugar use categories, including free sugar, added sugar, total sugar, and they may each be of un have unique physiological relevance and lead to differences in effects on absorption and insulin responses. And then there's sources of sugar um, that also can have a defining impact on health outcomes. Uh, sugar consumed in liquid form has a different effect on satiety and caloric compensation than does sugar consumed in solid form, for example. And we know that healthier sources of sugar, um, such as sweetened dairy, yogurt, um, sweetened whole grains, um, have a no or even a protective association with type 2 diabetes. Uh, another uh, issue or challenge is that sugars are frequently selectively underreported in epidemiological studies and for this reason, objective measures of, um, or biomarkers have been introduced, the 24-hour urinary sucrose and fructose, which allows for greater accuracy, for, uh, potentially. And so um, another question is, do sugars have unique diabetogenic and lipogenic effects, or do they simply contribute to increased energy intake and thereby mediate the diet disease relationship? Um, another question is, are sugar sweetened beverages simply a marker for an unhealthy lifestyle? Is added sugar intake simply a marker for an unhealthy lifestyle? And we also see that um, there are varying levels of intake amounts between studies that yield, of course, uh, large differences in results. There are some fructose intervention studies that administer super physiological doses, often over 100 grams per day of fructose. Um, and clearly do not represent um, habitual dietary patterns. 
So these are some of the few uh, challenges that this area of research faces. Uh, just a brief summary as well of um, my past sugar-related research, um, sugar and type 2 diabetes and inflammation. Uh, we did a meta-analysis on sugar and inflammation on, based on human intervention trials, and the overall collective findings did not support the hypothesis that dietary fructose, whether consumed alone or um, as high fructose corn syrup, is more detrimental with respect to subclinical inflammation than dietary glucose or sucrose. We also did a longitudinal analysis based on Donald study data, where um, nine years of adolescent sugar intake were assessed, and then um, adults were asked to follow up in the age of about 25 or so to assess um, their, risk for, their risk markers for type 2 diabetes. And sugar um, during adolescence was not associated with adult risk factors of type 2 diabetes, excepting fructose, uh, which actually had a beneficial effect on adult fast. It was based on urinary fructose excretion, uh, which was highly correlated to total sugar intake. So looking at all, all sugar sources, including the healthy ones. And then we did a systematic review of world trends on sugar and sugar-sweetened beverages. And we found that sugar-sweetened beverage consumption on children and adolescents increased from the 1960s sharp, sharply until the turn of the century when it peaked and then was followed by a substantial de decrease that's continued. And so these uh, trends differ starkly from uh, trends of other countries around the world where only slight uh, changes for the most part um, in sugar intake uh, was observed over the past several decades. So um, sugar ended up being not as detrimental as I, as I thought when I began this research. This actually, these findings actually went contrary to my own personal beliefs about sugar. It's funded by the sugar industry, or, so there's no reason for me to exonerate sugar. Um, but my interest in sugar continues. And so I was very excited to be able to work on the preview study to further investigate um, sugar and type 2 diabetes risk. So again, our aim was to assess uh, the, the long-term um, consumption of sugar over three years in an overweight and pre-diabetic adult population. And preview, the previous study offered an excellent um, population um, to investigate this. So participants from universities of Sydney, Helsinki, Nottingham participated in this sub-study uh, because they provided available sugars in their data uh, composition tables. And Sydney and Helsinki were pulled together in one group because they had data on added sugar, and Nottingham was assessed separately because they provided data on free sugars. And prospective associations were analyzed by performing linear mixed models with repeated measures. And the data set allowed for the adjustment of multiple confounders, um, relevant confounders for this specific uh, analog fiber saturated fat uh, intake, as well as body fat. So now looking at the results. Um, significant positive associations were observed between glycemic index and indices of glucose metabolism, uh, listed there on the left-hand side, the four indices. And this was for fasting insulin, HbA1c, and C-peptide, all showed significant um, positive associations with GI. In the Nottingham group, GI was positively associated, associated with fasting insulin. Um, now looking at added sugars, they were not associated with any of these um, risk markers, including fasting insulin, fasting glucose, HbA1c, or C-peptide in the adjusted model, whereas free sugars was inversely associated with fasting plasma glucose and HbA1c. And total sugars was also inversely associated with fasting insulin, fasting glucose, and C-peptide in the Sydney and Helsinki groups, as well as in the Nottingham group. So it had a protective association. Now looking at indices of body fat, um, these differences are less pronounced uh, when it comes to sugar versus GI. Added sugars were positively associated with body fat percentage, and GI was also um, positively associated with the waist circumference in all three intervention groups. So um, contrary to popular belief, in this three-year longitudinal analysis, 
the intake of added or free sugars were not related to uh, indices of glucose metabolism. Uh, much focus is placed on decreasing added sugar intake when it comes to strategies for weight loss. However, both dietary sugars and GI were associated with indices of body fat, even after adjustment for energy intake. And total sugar was inversely associated with type 2 diabetes risk factors. And this suggests that sugar in, um, intake can be beneficial when it comes from the right sources and can promote the intake of healthful foods. And this also could be explained by favorable micro or phytonutrients that are found within natural stores of sugar. It could also be explained by the fact that um, these food sugar sources um, tend to have a lower GI, like whole fruit and dairy and sweetened whole grains and um, even fruit juice in some cases. So besides fruit itself, we didn't investigate these sources specifically, um, but other longitudinal studies confirm this. And in the end, it was only the GI that predicted long-term changes in glucose metabolism. And a higher dietary GI, but not the intake of added or free sugars, predicted worsening markers of glucose metabolism. So these findings uh, imply that replacing sugar intake with sources of high GI starch may not be helpful. And it also provides evidence of type 2 diabetes prevention it's more effective to decrease than it is to strictly avoid sugar. And with that, I conclude this talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we will, um, we're very happy that you kept the time. So we, but we'll move on to the next speaker. Yes, and the next speaker is uh, Jeff Lewisi. Uh, Jeff has been a member for in this group for a long time now, and uh, he has um, uh, he's a nutritional biochemist uh, that has his own consulting firm. And he's always shown a very interest in uh, glycemic index and glycemic, what you're going to talk about today, glycemic index and load and causal relations. Please, Jeff. Thank you very much. Very pleased to be invited. It's a very good group to come back and encourage people to continue coming. It's been very great. <coughs> Microphone. Closer. <laughs> Do I have slides? That's not my slide. Still waiting for my slide. <clears throat> or perhaps I'm not using this correctly. That's not mine. This is, these things can happen from time to time. One of the first slides um, I was going to show was about what, how our behavior affects us when we're talking about science. Sometimes we can enter an area which is quite toxic to discuss. And one of them is the low carbohydrate. And I'm going to say something about that because I think as scientists, we need to know what does happen with low carbohydrate. And possibly, as clinicians, we need to know for the 1% of individuals that either want it, who often shout about it, and those who need it. Now, I'm going to see whether I've got the slide. Nothing's happening yet. So within this, from Harvard Health, that shows, oh, I say, the Association of Epidemiology, 
low-carbohydrate diet score, it's not exactly low-carbohydrate, not exactly low-carbohydrate, and show that for mortality, that there is enhanced uh, or less mortality uh, with a low-carbohydrate diet score. Now, there's a very important message that has to go that with a low-carbohydrate diet, and it has to be a healthful diet. And they describe what is a healthful diet, but one of those describes a healthful diet as a vegetarian diet. So for those 1% of people that you may want to use a low-carbohydrate diet with, you must emphasize that it's healthful. And when we get a slide, um, we'll find out what those, that is. We found your slide. Who found it? Wow. Right. Oh, hooray. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's all about causal. Causal. Next. Oh, the next. Is, I've got a lot of, a lot of uh, conflicts to say I'm very conflicted. In fact, I do get pulled all sorts of different directions. But don't worry about that. If you ever have experienced that, stay with the science. This is the ethos behavior. And I did say that, um, I'll skip this quickly. It's important to practice with patients is to personalize their treatment. So that 1% may will need that personalized treatment and they may need a low carbohydrate diet. Well, from our health, we have this, as I said before, a healthy low carbohydrate diet may risk of premature death among patients with type 2 diabetes. And those give the figures, one is which is a low carbohydrate diet score and the other is a so-called healthy low carbohydrate diet score. When it comes to the uh, recommendations from DNSG, which have just come out, there's some difference in, in, in opinion uh, in uh, being expressed in there and that, that concerns me um, because we actually need to stick with the, with the science. So one of the recommendations, this came across LinkedIn from Harvard, uh, that it, the various sorts of diets you might have are low carbohydrate diets, low fat diets and diets which are balanced for carbohydrate and fat. And one of the statements was, it's not, if it's not your preferred diet, change to the one that fits you. So it do involve the patient, but I would add to that by saying, but keep it healthy, always. And that's good ethos. And you can find the various uh, publications in which these, these observations are made. Now, I've had the pleasure to meet uh, Roy Taylor, who has put forward a very important uh, twin cycle uh, cause of type 2 diabetes. Now, not everyone will, will know about that, and perhaps some of it might need some revision. Um, but basically, what he says is that diabetes is caused by people eat, having too many calories whether it's fat or protein, and that causes insulin resistance. And he shows a cycle there. So it's not a bicycle uh, diet. It's a, a, it's a, it's a diet which uh, matches the, the uh, twin cycle. That is, the blood glucose is central to that. And whenever there's a high blood glucose, then you'll end up with high triglyceride production. And that will eventually uh, cause uh, insulin resistance due to um, steroids landing in, in the pancreas. And I'll show you a bit more about that later on. The various papers of his are very well worthwhile reading, Banting Lecture especially, and if you want to follow up that, then the Practical Management Guide on Pathophysiology. About the same time, he was writing his papers. I was the American Association for the Advancement of 
science uh, Ritual Eurasia together, um, although I'd had them uh, back in, I hadn't collected very much data, but I had on the relative risk of two diabetes and coronary heart disease in, on glycemic index. And I was interested to note that when I looked at the interaction between the glycemic index and the energy protein ratio, that in fact you get a very striking, uh, very striking uh, risk ratios showing that um, altogether, at least in, in type 2 diabetes, a tenfold difference in, in risk depending on that interaction. So it might just be, might just be that uh, glycemic interacts more than uh, just uh, carbohydrate intake uh, may well affect the uh, use of lipids as well. That would be the neatest piece of work that needs updating, of course. Talking about definitions, you've been given the, the definition of, of, of post-treatment um, by Mike Lean quite nicely. Um, I've not put numbers in there because they tend to change uh, by different, different groups, uh, but I think there's good suggestion that about 4.8 is, uh, is good for the normal of HbA1c. Body weight reduction, no drugs, and there's the first phase insulin response returns. But there's also, there's also a new uh, statement coming out of mitigation, and that occurs post-treatment. Again, decreased uh, ABA1C to normal, but without weight loss. So that's fairly new. You can get your ABA1C down by procedures that don't need necessarily weight loss drugs. And the last one there, inverted commas, which I think might just be a little bit political, um, have maintained a normal dietary treatment. Uh, sorry, that they will need to maintain a, a dietary treatment. Well, I don't think there's any method of remission where uh, people uh, reverse or regress in, in that. And there you have the direct study, roughly 50% remission. But after three years, um, and by that reference and ITT analysis, that it's, it's only 3%. Although um, Mike has told me, uh, whilst we've been here, that, it's, that it may just be less than 20%. So the twin cycle for David Unwin. What is, what is novel about his low-carbohydrate diet is that he has introduced glycemic index and glycemic load, so he's not having high glycemic index uh, sources of carbohydrate in there. Um, he also does reduce uh, sugar intake. Patients know about sugar, they can reduce it to reduce glycemic load. They don't know necessarily what carbohydrate is. So with patients, it's sometimes easy to talk about sugars. But the work is, is there and it's reviewed by clinicians and when looking at carbohydrate, excess carbohydrates versus excess fat, an early uh, paper did show that uh, the low carbohydrate was preferable. And the meta-analysis has shown the same thing, that it's not really told us very much about uh, cholesterol effects. So one has to be a little bit wary at this stage. If we move on and talk about David Unwin's work, his wife is, is a psychiatrist, Jen. She helps uh, decide on what sort of diet um, people ought to be eating. It was a very well uh, worked out diet, I might say. Um, his, his, in, his patients were 70 years old, roughly, and it was a single arm observational study in a primary care. The first observations were at 13 months, and it's been described by, the, by someone, by uh, Mike, in fact, in, this, uh, in the previous meeting that we had some years ago, as a very good study but not on RCT, but that's very common. What did he find? People were feeling better, more energy, they had weight loss, and the HB1C fell. They had a better hepatic function, as people would call it. Uh, waistline was down and, chain, and saved on, on, on drugs. And in this case, he must have been doing something good because the cholesterol was down. So there's some element on that which is a, a healthy low-carbohydrate diet. 
Well, I think more studies need to be done and people who want to use this, um, then they must uh, really work out what, what the diet is. Remission of 50% versus 2%, that's a 25-fold benefit. Ditto data, the same at 27 months, so it's two years, over two years. What he says to his patients is too much glucose, too much sugar in the diet causes the liver to convert some of it to fat, and the fat gets in the pancreas, which stops it working and producing out insulin. And he doesn't say much more than that. But it does get worse, of course, because when the fat gets into muscle tissue as well, it's very difficult for muscle to be clearing the glucose, and the whole thing escalates. There are other things to deal with, the hormones which are released by low GI carbohydrate foods, which do affect uh, food intake. There are more mechanisms involved, um, but they tend to, uh, on the lipotaxic route and the glucotoxic route, to develop with time. In this one, if we look at oh, what I wanted to say about the last one, if it comes up and back up, there we are. Um, about, about this one is that central to this is the glucose and the triglycerides. And the glycerides are the, the, the sting in the tail because they cause uh, all, the major, all, the, all the major problems. So that's in the pondro route down the middle there. Uh, and there are also the routes that, that enter. Now, I want to say something about GI and triglycerides. They do tend to give a, a higher triglyceride response than other carbohydrates of a similar GI. If you look at different types of, of sugars, sucrose, which is GI 67, it's itemaltulose 32, and, and dialulose, which is inverted commas because it's not digested, it's zero, um, then that, that, that GI range does affect the amount of, of triglycerides that are produced. But I would say be careful um, if you're wanting to use the allulose, it has been promoted as uh, good for decreasing body fat content uh, and diabetes, but only in rats at this stage. There's uh, an observation that uh, it, could be, it could contribute to Alzheimer's formation because of the um, hyperosmolarity that it causes as it's uh, absorbed and slowly excreted. And one interesting observation is that if you put it in with sucrose, then the, G, the GI might, of sucrose might not now be 67. It could be at 85 or more. So here again, a low glycemic load diet is associated with uh, less Alzheimer's disease. And here are all the references that there are with that. Um, but there are other things uh, which are important. So more on glycemic index and load per se. If you're looking to um, know what is causative, then Bradford Hill's criteria is really quite a good thing to follow, and it's more extensive than is used by GRADE. The first ones are included in, in GRADE. I'm just going to show one which deals with the last three things of experimental analogy and coherence, and you can read about that in the, all about that in the paper. This is uh, uh, something created by uh, Olivia Augustine that comparing uh, alpha glucosides inhibitors to ECHOs with uh, low GI and low GL, and the same pattern of effects are found with each one. So there's something to do with lowering blood glucose, which is having the same, the same effects. And not only is it diabetes, it's uh, coronary heart disease, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and other cancers, ovarian cancer, bladder cancer, not really sure about that. There's other questions going on. Type 2 diabetes, its treatment then is not all about calories. As the twin cycle might imply from the cycle, there are carbohydrate quality that affect the activity of the cycles. Fiber, I suspect. Uh, sugars, glycemic index and load each do play a, play a role. 
when it comes to asking, well, which is the most important? Uh, is, it, is it dietary fiber or glycemic index? Well, in, the, in intervention studies, at least up to three months, they're similar, very similar. Same with glycemic load. The effect is greater in those with uh, the higher fasting blood glucose. And we might wonder about that area there, what's happening? Uh, well, with more recent studies, we know that uh, they, they, they get the same general picture. So there's a suggestion that uh, the low glycemic is index is, is good for hyper, uh, preventing hyperglycemia and may even help with, with hypoglycemia at, at deeper end. Does it affect body weight? Now this is where glycemic load has been changed only by changing glycemic index. One of the interesting things about this is that some people increase, or some studies show an increase in body weight and others show a low uh, uh, body weight. But if you did that with a forest plot, you'd find nothing at all. But if you do it with a regression, meta-regression, you can see that lowering the glycemic load is associated with a lower uh, body weight. And over 10 years, if it maintained that rate, uh, over, over that range of values, uh, you, you would go into remission predictably. I don't think it would keep up necessarily for uh, all that time. But it does show that um, we have to be very careful. Probably when we're doing experiments on glycemic index, we need to check that some of the patients are not increasing their carbohydrate intake because that could uh, raise the glycemic load and then you might not see anything. Early data, and again, going back to 2008, and the current data is still saying the same things, that coronary heart disease and type 2 diabetes is a risk for uh, high glycemic load diets and high glycemic index. I don't put the slide up there. And that uh, because we know how to do the work, we can find out how it really shows up in, in women, in men, and in mixed populations, and all three of them, it does show up significantly, no matter what some people are saying. One has to wonder which is the car primary carbohydrate in, in, in diabetes prevention, whether it's dietary fiber as suggested in the, in, the, uh, in the recent guidelines, or is it something to other, than, other than that? Well, carbohydrate, available carbohydrate provides more energy into the twin cycle than does uh, more does, than does more dietary fiber. Globally, GI and GL pose the larger risk when the, when the analysis is done correctly. It's three or four times more than that of, of dietary fiber. The risk and um, interventional evidence on fiber is mostly not adjusted for GI and GL. But that's with dietary fiber. So we don't know what the real effect of fiber is for most studies that have been done in the world, but the reverse is true for GI. Uh, some consideration of the fiber intake uh, is, is taken into, con into contention. And analytically, that means the input of, of fiber, uh, we underestimate uh, the amount of, of dietary fiber that there is in the diet, and we end up with a false uh, higher effect apparent per gram of estimated material. But for low GI and GL, the outcome data is somewhat the other way around um, because it's now the output data. And due to that, um, what we're doing is we're underestimating the effects of GI and GL. So overall, I'm beginning to wonder which is most important. Um, dietary fiber is certainly um, their indicators being the most solid data, but I would argue that it, it's not as good as, as, as was suggested, and something similar to moderate would have been useful. Uh, some text on in, in the guidelines on protein is incomplete and looks somewhat biased, I would say. Uh, but there was time I'd talk about that. Look, our viral diets have been too toxic to talk about, mostly. I hope you're a little more receptive glad to see no one's been throwing uh, tomatoes and eggs at me. But what about the healthy low carbohydrate diet? Is it toxic or is it not? We don't know, only future will tell us. Well, I'm going to leave it there because I must have gone well over my time. Um, <laughs> <laughs>
Is that all? Okay. Okay. Yes. So if there are any questions, I will be still here later on. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. And we will move straight on to the next speaker, Dr. Simin Liu, who is an epidemiologist and physician scientist working with molecular genetics, nutrition, clinical medicine, and public health, and a professor at uh, university, Brown University in the US, professor in epidemiology, medicine, and surgery. And your talk will be about if we can integrate whole grains, fiber, and glycemic index and load in a single carbohydrate quality scoring system. Very exciting to hear what you say about that. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can advance. I, I get a long title, so there's no abstract. So um, the way I wanted to organize this is basically in three parts, and David just worked out. Uh, the second part first, I wanted to really honor him um, in all humanities. He really is one of the first, if not the first, who really put food as medicine, this concept, um, onto the um, medical establishment's map. Um, his um, early studies um, directly comparing diet or his portfolio diet versus uh, statin drugs show a clear uh, comparable effects of diet to a portfolio in lowering um, lipid as much as uh, statin, which really is like the paper published in the late 70s, I mean, late 80s, have really set the field for, on fire and really make uh, folks uh, pay attention to nutrition, meaning folks in, in, in medicines. Uh, however, I do wanted to point out that uh, even with um, uh, Jeffy just mentioned about everybody know the uh, so-called Bradford Hill criteria, I see myself as a you know, I have a doctorate in nutrition, has been doing nutrition for the past um, 28 years. But I also see myself as a methodologist, um, have a doctorate in it. It, it Hill criteria emerged in the sort of the age, just around the same time when the Framingham cohort study started. You know, the concept of risk factor was first coined uh, in night, literally 1948. 75 years later, uh, I would submit that we yet has not developed a unifying framework to evaluate and integrate data from multiple sources and multiple level for causal inference. There's many holes even in the Bradford Hill criteria uh, uh, structure and last year, I uh, also venture to um, submit that, that we need to really seriously put some smart people um, um, to work on this um, uh, methodological area is to how to bring all this uh, data from disparate different fields, um, as you shall see, uh, put together uh, to make some causal inference that are directly related to what we eat in terms of clinical efficacy or clinical effectiveness. Then I would argue, put forward the argument, hopefully um, you would agree with me um, again, like last year, I already put forward this arguments. It's also follow on what uh, Frank yesterday um, was alluded to in his uh, keynote talk. Um, really, the technology today have allowed us to, to really look at many of the omic biomarkers and mass A, and we can really use it, not really just as a target for disease, but really also as a improved assessment um, for the dietary exposures of our interests. In other words, then, then I would end with some uh, perspective for the future. Now, this is my way of summarizing all the latest dietary guidelines that I have read. Um, in my own way, summarize them more because I was given this uh, job to provide one single thing that uh, describe everything. Uh, this is the current dietary guideline now. It's almost come a full circle. If you remember the classical diet heart hypothesis where people heavily influenced by the fat, too high a fat intake, uh, animal product, and clog up the artery, then, then you suffer a heart attack. 
to now come full circle to say that no, everything is patent, dietary patent, okay? It's actually a very safe way of saying uh, because it's non-specific, so you would, could never be wrong. Uh, so it's a, a healthy eating routine at every stage of life. You can criticize with that. Second one is eat various food, vegetable, grain, protein, dairy, fortified soy alternative. And the third one is choose option full of nutrients. Make every bite count. This is the latest from American Heart Association. It's almost like you're not, not making any recommendations. Everybody know that. You don't have to do any study. I can make those kind of comments, right? So what's wrong with this kind of commentary, right? Because it's non-specific. Uh, I can offer a piece of the statistical evidence based on that, okay, the enhanced data where they summarize roughly about seven to eight core CVD. It is clear 80% of the U.S. population don't pay any attention to dietary guidelines. Uh, that's the sort of like the fact. The, this is survey data, if you believe they report correctly. On the right hand side is a recent day, uh, uh, publication for an other group at UW where they, again, create some sort of ratio. This is the ratio of total carbohydrate, fiber, and sugar, and then related to all these kind of risk factors. And then they show, well, they all correlated. Perfect, that's the point. So I wanted to submit, in fact, some of us have been thinking about this uh, very carefully. Um, um, this is the uh, summary from a review um, paper that we did with uh, the Ingus on behalf of the WHO committee back uh, in 2006. I believe Tom uh, was there as well. We really sort of like put forward comprehensively the arguments of a nutritional classification and measurement of carbohydrate, not only based on the traditional classical structure chemical structures like simple versus complex, but take the perspective of interaction, variation, those are fundamental logical principles into account and come up with a nutritional classification. You can see here, this is what we suggest, a good way to look at it. If you follow this, you actually reach the conclusion, at least based on our current understanding of biology, would be the single most important uh, classifier that can summarize all. The rest at the time, this is like 15 some years ago, we still do not know uh, uh, about the microbiota. Uh, even today we can argue well, with all this hot uh, of the press publications weekly almost about the microbiota effect may still be the interaction with the physiological consequence of the non glycemic carbohydrates that we ingested, which is the plant side. It's the plant cell wall. If you trace 100 original uh, fiber hypothesis, this is the original definition of dietary fiber. It's not a chemical per se, but it's the cell wall. But the cell wall in, in includes a lot of things. The cell wall, okay? So in other words, fructose inside the cell wall it would be very different from fructose in pure chemical form you drink it, like as in a can of Coke. That is the idea. In fact, um, the Angus group that they did do, do, I mean, if you measure dietary fiber, there's an Angus method. And then they also developed a method to, we can measure the so-called non-starch uh, non polysaccharide. Now, that's what we submit, then this is almost 20 years old. Uh, we submit that, in fact, we need an integrated multi-level causal framework following the principles of biological interaction and variation. Then you can allow us to look at the totality, consistency, and the quality of the evidence. This is what we literally, um, at the beginning of the century, in several review papers, have put forward this idea. Now, I would explain. Glycemic index, what it, what it is. Now, step by step, you will see the glycemic index um, with the totality of evidence that actually supported by uh, uh, some of the uh, archeological research, looking at the higher evolution of uh, human to see that in fact, glycemic low is the top 
in terms of the energy based on those historical uh, as the top contender. But now what can constitute glycemic low, you would uh, ask, then we can explain this even a bit more deeper. Carbohydrate, we know it's a chemical structure, you can analyze it. But glycemic index, um, with the genius of Tom and they are picking at a physiological response, but they still have to address it to address the individual variation, the so-called between person variation, right? So I noticed that both as smart as Mike still ask these kind of questions. That means it's a complicated concept. Be, you need to deal with the in the between person variation so that you have to do an index. Index meaning that you are relative, you cannot get the absolute, it's relative to the reference food, such as pure glucose drinking or glucose, same amount of uh, uh, carbohydrate from white bread, okay? That's how you reduce the between re person variation so that you can use glycemic index as a determinator or rep to represent the characteristics inherent physiologically in the food itself, why to the entire population. In fact, you would argue then this index can be applied to different population because this is intrinsic physiology, physiologically to the food itself. So because it's a ratio, for those of you who don't know, don't want to learn much about mathematics, you know because this ratio is unitness. So as an indicator of quality. Now this is like a bioassay. So if you, in the food production process, there's many factors affected, but then the black box approach, almost at the molecular level. So you're arguing at the end of the day, we can measure the glucose response. When we took the ratio, then we get these inherent indicators of food's ability to raise glucose level, okay? So that's, it's a bioassay, but it's, let me give you, this is, uh, this is the sort of like fact, this is, fact data, but Mike was asking the glycemic response, but it's not the glycemic index. You have to build in a reference value to reduce, again, individual variation, okay? Which is different from when you started to look at the individual variation as a relative risk of the exposure for disease development in some of the cohort study. This is what we do. Now, again, this is a little bit more concept. It's not a competing, people see glycemic index and glycemic low as if they are a competing hypothesis or competing, they are not. Now, let me explain to you why. This is the formula. GL is equal to the sum of the glycemic index of that particular food multiplied by the carbohydrate content of the food itself. So it's a weighted measure, like I said earlier, it's a standardization of carbohydrate. You cannot com compare carbohydrate from different food sources, but after you build in the glycemic index of the food itself, now for the first time, you can, con you can calculate them, you can compare them now. In fact, mathematically, this is also my doctoral work style, where we first published the paper in the AJCM, uh, to show Physiologically now, every gram of the glycemic low has meaning. That means that's the glycemic low, but because this is at the individual level. Now you can calculate this based on one single food item, or you can calculate it in the people's whole diet. And because this is a absolute amount, right? You can put a unit as gram, so you can calculate it. So that's exactly what we did. And physiologically, that's what it explained. Uh, the paper was published in AJCM in 2000. And after we build these variables, and this is some, some sort of a validation you can do using HDL, using fasting triglyceride, and even using high sensitivity C-reactive protein at the time before everybody were getting excited about information. We have done a, a small, uh, scale study to validate these concepts already. These are, those are based on two uh, cohort source population maintained at Harvard. To the left-hand side, we also identify some interaction between the people who have high 
intakes of glycemic load and also have underlying insulin resistance to begin with, and those are the folks that are much greater risk of developing heart disease. Now, I'm getting too excited uh, why now. I think what have we moved forward? If you think of disease development of anything at the day of birth, or even think harder if you incorporate the concepts of epigenetic or a course generation, you think of disease or whatever how outcome is a function of time, okay? Function of time, E means exposure. Function of time that throughout lifespan, eventually something happened. Survival. Some people like us who is privileged enough to live so long now and still stay here today. And some of my colleagues already passed away, okay? So, so the uh, time is the important component, even though we don't know how to define time. And then what we wanted to do is now for genetic, the GM9 mutation, our genome is something that our parents just so happens because we are human. Everything that goes through our bodies are actually genetically regulated, okay? So if you inherit a gene, for example, a trypan six genes that we look at, that happen to govern the magnesium metabolism transport in the body, that gene, that if the mutation you inherited is unlucky, that your body have that lifetime effect of handling magnesium in your body. Same thing with sugar. Meant the body, our body, have what we now measure 22,000 genes and then billions different mutations, in fact, hundreds, billions of mutations now as we do more uh, careful sequencing with refined uh, 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 granularities, we realize the individual variation is just tremendous. But that is not something that you can, if you build this function of time, you can use that as capturing your total lifetime exposure, let's say for magnesium, using the genotype and incorporating that measure. Same thing, epigenetic, I will show, you can do the similar thing, and so is the transcriptomics, the metabolomic and proteinomic. And those are capturing different uh, stage of like, exposures, depends on your focus of the diet. Because essentially every single one of your nutritional measure or exposure are being regulated or will leave signatures that you can pick up now. And the challenge now, uh, I think it's a challenge, but the machine learning, with the data resources, with the technologies, I'm actually very optimistic that our field is very bright. It's never been brighter, particularly for the young people, because those resources is out there. Except you have to be very careful. I'm just very quickly to show that our group has been you know, one of the first to try some new things. This is one of the new things that we do based on the, the, some of the modelings. The modeling is actually very simple. Um, for all this uh, theoretical, mathematical, uh, uh, foundational work that's been done, what we use here is the Women's Health Initiative of 165,000 women. They all reported uh, diet. We because we believe the computational power is such now, allow us to even foot frequency questionnaire. This is what I, uh, uh, Frank may not agree. I would argue it is time to expand more than foot frequency questionnaire. We ask as many food items as possible, okay, to feed the data. And just like we ask, as many genes, as many mutations as possible to fit in the computer algorithm to look at what popped up. Well, just like you do the genetic risk score to add them up, the, uh, uh, those um, mathematical things are there. I just very quickly show you this is uh, uh, Dr. Huang Brown. Basically, she lists all this. Uh, Hello? One second. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> So uh, to show you the pasta, whatever, basically to show you is after so many data are significant, they are all interacting with one another.
another. On the right-hand side is GL, uh, carbohydrate, total fiber, total sugar effect. So the arguments is that now we come to this point. It is this no doubt diet is a way of life. If we want to study way of life, it's very complicated. But how we study them, we need more high quality data. There's no ourselves. The, techno the technology is there now. What is more high quality data to fit into it? And that's exactly what I meant by high quality data. It's no longer the I mean, we have a lot of high quality data in the United States, like the NHANS, like the, like the Nurses Health Study, like the Women's Health Initiative. What we need is data from all over the world. And, and that's my group has been trying to, and this is the study uh, we, we established in China, an occupational cohort. In fact, we went deeper, deeper than just the um, nutrient. There's many, many other things that we look at all the way down to 118 elements of the periodic table. Now the technology can allow us that in our human body, we can capture most of them, okay? Dr. Liu, please. This is the study the in Brazil. <laughs> this is the study in Ghana that we set up. And all of this, then I would end it with two formula very quickly so they can ask questions. I know if they don't understand it, but it's very simple. Uh, it's the, con the, the confident map is there. In fact, we can share data in such a way that what I, what I mentioned about totality of evidence, this is totality, this is meta-analysis. We should treat each single publication as an individual report. And we look at the distribution of those single reports because every single paper got rigorous supposedly rigorous peer review process, they publish it. If we share data like this, then we can do models like I'm, Okay. So anyway, uh, this I would end here with this uh, very confident mathematical framework for you to think about. Um, it is, in fact, whatever you want to do, it's, it's out there. And you just need to, in fact, we don't need, we argue about sharing data. We don't need to share data. Yeah. Okay, I think we need I'm to done. thank Dr. Yu very much for thank an you. inspiring talk. <laughs> and then it's my pleasure to introduce the last speaker at this session, Alessandro Azzeni from Spain. There you are. He's going to talk about the association between carbohydrate quality and gut microbiota in a Mediterranean, Mediterranean population at high cardiovascular risk. Please. Oof. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> I prepared a presentation, but it needs to be in Spanish. <laughs> Thank you. So this presentation is based uh, in, um, in a work in, uh, that we did in collaboration with uh, Dr. Nishi, uh, Professor Sala Salvador, and uh, other, um, other uh, collaborators. Um, is currently in the process of, uh, of submission, and so it's not uh, already published. And this, uh, this study is titled Carbohydrate Quality, Fecal Microbiota, and cardiometabolic health in older adults, a cohort study. Uh, so what is uh, carbohydrate quality index? I'm afraid it's based on no frequent, frequent questions. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a score um, that is uh, composed by different items. Uh, these items are a ratio uh, between solid uh, carbohydrates to total carbohydrates. The dietary fiber intake, uh, glycemic index, and ratio uh, between whole grains uh, to total grains. So the longitudinal association between carbohydrate quality index and uh, cardiovascular risk factors has been um, has been explored in the PREDIMED Plus uh, uh, cohort uh, in uh, 2020. 
and actually the results are quite promising because uh, uh, here we can see uh, that the score was um, stratified in three different categories, categories uh, based on our quintile. And we can actually see that uh, the um, uh, category that is related to the higher uh, carbohydrate quality index uh, was associated with um, better cardiometabolic outcomes uh, after six months and after 12 months uh, of uh, so accordingly, we thought that may uh, be a good idea to explore the cross-sectional longitudinal association between the uh, carbohydrate quality index, uh, the fecal microbiota, and cardiometabolic uh, risk factors uh, within the frame of the PEDIMED Plus uh, clinical trial. So this is the design. Uh, we at first explored cross-sectionally the association between baseline carbohydrate quality index and um, and uh, fecal microbiota. So we can see here uh, the stratification created three categories and the third tile three uh, includes the participants uh, with higher carbohydrate quality index. And then we explored longitudinally the association between one year change in uh, carbohydrate quality index and uh, uh, changes in uh, fecal microbiota after one year and uh, the participants included in uh, Tertile 3 were those with uh, uh, an improvement in uh, carbohydrate quality index after one year. This is the methodology. Um, so um, baseline and one year data from uh, these participants uh, was uh, collected in terms of clinical information, anthropometric measurements, and blood biochemical parameters. Then uh, information uh, from food frequency questionnaires was used to calculate the carbohydrate quality index. And then stool samples were processed and 16S uh, sequencing conducted uh, at the Wageningen University. And uh, 16S data uh, was analyzed. Here uh, you can see the characteristics of the study population according to third tiles of baseline by the quality index. Uh, you can see, uh, I repeat, in the third child three were included those participants with higher carbohydrate quality index. Uh, we can see some differences in the distribution of um, uh, females. Uh, also in um, distribution of participants from different uh, recruiting, uh, pretty much plus recruiting centers. So we. Uh, controlled for these uh, discoveries. Also, we can see that participants with higher carbohydrate quality index were those uh, with lower waist circumference and also um, were those with higher Mediterranean diet uh, adherence score. In this table, you can see the characteristics of the study population according to third tiles of uh, carbohydrate quality index one year change. Here you can see that in tertile three were included those participants that had an improvement in carbohydrate quality index after one year. And um, also you can see that participants included in, um, in uh, the tertile three were those uh, uh, which uh, had like an, um, weight loss, uh, decrease in um, waist circumference, a decrease in body mass index, and um, an increase in Mediterranean diet adherence score after, uh, after one year. So here uh, you can see that uh, the association uh, between alpha diversity um, indi indices uh, calculated, which were Chow Wan, Shannon, and Simpson, indicators of richness and diversity of the fecal microbiota, and uh, the Agastar tile of carbon that uh, um, participants included in tertile three were those with higher Chow one index and uh, higher um, Shannon index. Also here you can see some results from the differential abundance analysis that we conducted uh, in the um, 
cross-sectional study and then longitudinal study. You can see fecal microbiota gene is associated be, with baseline uh, carbohydrate quality index. And we have uh, four uh, genera negatively associated and two genera positively associated with the uh, Agaster tile. And also fecal microbiota genera associated with the Agaster tile of uh, one year change in carbohydrate quality index. And we can uh, also see some genera that were negatively or positively associated uh, with uh, the third type tree. Here, uh, you can see the results uh, of the association of the study of association between uh, um, the baseline carbohydrate quality index related genera and cardiovascular risk factor and the association between one year change carbohydrate quality index related genera and uh, cardiovascular risk factors. And you can see that uh, um, focusing in those genera that were positively associated with the Igas tartile, we can see that Fecalibacterium uh, was negatively associated with body mass index and Christensen and Lat Lassie was uh, negatively associated with uh, body mass index and triglycerides. Um, on the other uh, longitudinal study, uh, if we focus on those uh, uh, genera that were positively associated with the uh, third child tree of uh, one year change in carbohydrate quality index, we can see that butyrivibrio was uh, changes uh, in uh, uh, with increase in uh, insulin after one year of, uh, of follow-up. Uh, so um, final highlights from these results is that at baseline, individuals with higher carbohydrate quality index show um, lower risk in preference and higher Mediterranean uh, adherence. Um, at baseline, individuals with higher carbohydrate quality index show higher fecal microbiota richness and diversity and higher abundance of uh, beneficial bens in Alaska, which has been previously associated with reduced body mass index in uh, literature. And Fecalibacterium, that is, uh, that is a well-known uh, genera uh, known as a beauty rate reducer. So Christensen, Alessia and uh, Fecalibacterium were also negatively associated with uh, body mass index. Individuals who showed an increase in carbohydrate quality index after uh, one year show also an higher reduction of body weight, waist circumference, body mass index, triglyceride, and an increase in Mediterranean diet adherence after one year of follow-up. And individuals who showed an increase in carbohydrate quality index after one year show also an increase in the abundance of butyrate producing bacteria such as butyrivibrio after one year. So increased abundance of butyrivibrio was also negatively associated with a decrease in insulin after one year. So final uh, consideration, uh, the observed beneficial association between carbohydrate quality index and uh, cardiometabolic risk factors aligned with previously, uh, previous evidence showing the cons that the, the consumption of carbohydrate based on in, the, in particular higher intakes of total dietary carbon was an impact on population health outcomes. And this mechanism uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, also been done by uh, these findings and the uh, modification of the micrograminus. Is it fine? My time is almost over. <laughs> and um, the results of the present study um, shown that uh, higher carbohydrate quality index was related to better cardiac metabolic health based on association with assessed clinical risk factor as a fecal microbiota. And also our finding opened the possibility uh, of explore possible mechanism, mechanistic pathways implicated in mediation that gut microbiota have in the association observed and to support the use of carbohydrate dietary recommendation with microbiota-oriented therapeutic strategy to modulate cardiometabolic uh, disease risk and improve health. Uh, here to summarize the limitation and strengths of this study, uh, observational studies cannot make possible to infer causality and exclude uh, residual confounding. Also, the results cannot be extrapolated to the population. 
and also a uh, limitation related to carbohydrate quality index, which was obtained from co frequency questionnaires, may, that which may be subjected to some degree of measurement errors. Also, 16 as sequencing limitations. But the strengths are that individuals at higher carbo uh, carbon metabolic risk represent an important portion of the population. Also, the homogeneity among participants reduced bias and potential confronting and increases the internal frequency questionnaires are considered an appropriate approach to assess uh, 16 sequences as limitation, but is also a good tool for analyzing large no sample numbers, and uh, there are a well-curated database for this. Uh, analysis were adjusted for major potential confounders, reducing for re uh, residual confounding. National uh, carbohydrate quality index, carbohydrate quality index, and risk factors. Thank you so much for your fantastic. Um, <laughs> we would like to see the speakers of this session uh, up here. If you could please stand up here with your face to the audience, all of you. So, uh, Jenny, Karen, uh, Stephen, uh, Alessandro. Did I forget someone? Jeff, please, if you're here. And then we uh, open up for uh, questions, and please try to make them brief and try to make the answers brief so we can get a lot of good questions and answers for these uh, 10 minutes that we have. So who would like to start? Yes, uh, over there, thank you, please. Yeah, really a fantastic session. I have a quick for Simin. First, and then when one question for Karen. For some, uh, you explained the biological uh, uh, mechanism for GI and GGL very, very well. In fact, your 1998 AGCM paper is the first paper that used GI, GL to calculate the GL and predict CHD. So I think that's a really a, a landmark study. Um, in regarding the piece that it's so highly correlated with the total carbohydrate. And so to eat a low GL, GL diet is to eat a low carbohydrate diet. So what's the meaning of uh, GL given that it's almost 90% or 95% determined by total carbohydrate? Thank you. Frank, those are super, super good and insightful questions. Um, I've been giving this a lot of thought. I mean, like actually Frank and I have a long discussion when I was doing my um, thesis. In fact, um, um, and, and, and Frank, it really is the mainstay whenever I come into data issues uh, at the time uh, at, at Harvard School of Public Health where uh, we were both uh, in training. Um, see, it, yeah, uh, Frank, those are very good questions and I've been struggling to, to turn to that. The co correlation is extremely high, uh, but after you move energy, the correlation is uh, the lower correlation coefficient. If you really look at it from purely from a view, it is that's the case. However, they are fundamentally different variables. So there's even though, so if in other words, even though the correlation is up to point, let's say point nine, that high. Uh, and if your population is, is big enough, just like some of the genetics, uh, a lot of folks are not aware of that our genome, they keep saying that our genome is 99% identical. But, but it's that 1% that determine the cumulative, uh, that 1% is actually extremely important when it comes to the magnitude of the association. And this is confirmed by many of the uh, 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 rare disease study that, that folks have been um, doing in the genetic field. So I happen to re wear my genetic hat when I do some of the genetic work. So fundamentally, the glycemic low variable, it's uh, after incorporating the uh, glycemic index into it, um, it's fundamentally a different variable. That's my point. So if you have a large cohort big enough and perhaps uh, that's what when we were able to detect it and subsequently when, when data are not as high quality or measurement are not as good, you can see the dilution of the effect. 
But usually, it's that individual variation one still can can catch. But it's a super question. And then that so, so Frank, you had another question? Yeah, I have a quick question for Karen. Uh, really nice analysis on um, different type of sugars. I, I think one important issue is uh, liquid sugar. So sugars in uh, liquids, uh, in sugar sweetened beverages, in things, fruit juices. So I think liquid sugars have very different physiological properties compared to sugars in solid food in terms of satiety, in terms of pro-inflammatory effects, in terms of uh, conversion to uh, triglycerides and free fatty acids. So I think that's something uh, you may want to specifically look at, separating liquid sugars from sugars from solid foods. Yes, I agree. Um, there's, there's already an abundance of literature on, on sugar-sweetened beverages, and that's why we're kind of zoning in on other sugar types. Um, and the effect that sugar has is really uh, mainly influenced by two main factors. Uh, there's the uh, energy control, so whether it's controlled for energy and the source of the sugar. And so liquid sugars are easily overconsumed, and they tend to be additive to the diet. So providing excess energy and, and uh, many of the studies that show those adverse um, associations with sugar sweet beverages often compare the highest quintile with the lowest. So you're just seeing this extreme comparison. Um, but uh, one study, a uh, made analysis by Chu et al. Um, in 2018 found that when sugar sweetened beverages replace other carbohydrates and um, energy matched substitutions, there's no negative effect found. So it's really mediated, mediated, I believe, by energy intake mainly. And these other sources of sugar are co-consumed with possible benef beneficial um, micronutrients, phytonutrients, and so you see varying effects based on sugar source. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Back. Thank you. I have a question for Alessandro. Hi. <coughs> Excuse me. I appreciated pres your presentation. It was very interesting. I was slightly confused about the cohort, the one-year follow-up. Um, I know it was an intervention study showed that some people increased their carb quality score or index. Um, and, and is that just a natural increase? What are maybe some of the um, reasons that people were increasing uh, their quality score? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so uh, it's important to mention that this um, clinical trial uh, is based in uh, two different uh, interventions. There is a control group which is exposed to a uh, libitum Mediterranean diet, and there is an intervention group which is exposed to an energy-restricted Mediterranean diet, uh, physical activity, and behavioral support. Obviously, having these two different um, uh, study groups, we had to uh, um, uh, um, our analysis and our uh, statistical role for these uh, potential confounding uh, to do not uh, say that, for example, this increase in uh, uh, um, in the abundance or alpha diversity was related actually to the intervention. That's why our uh, statistical analysis are adjusted and controlled for uh, for this covariate and the reason that there are two different uh, study groups. So essentially, you're, it's a cohort nested within a trial, your study. Say again, sorry, I didn't hear. Essentially, your study is a cohort nested within a, a clinical trial. Yes. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Jenny, you would like to ask a question? Um, yes, I just want, it's a comment more than a question. Uh, I really love your carbohydrate quality index. I love its simplicity. And I would really like to see other countries adopt um, and, and explore its correlations with their outcome data, clinical outcome data as well. And, and the thing that I would also like to encourage is, is what, Frank mentioned yesterday about this connection between microbial flora and the brain. 
I, I think Alzheimer's disease and dementia and mild cognitive impairment and we will become irrelevant as our population ages and these become more and more important issues for everyone. And carbohydrate quality is probably connected very much to these yeah, we questions. We actually have like a big collection of data uh, related to cognition and uh, there are other colleagues that are also studying that part of the of the data that we have, some more studies also related to behavior and uh, stuff are uh, hopefully coming soon. Yes, and, and mood, anxiety, depression, yeah. all those things. Yeah, you, we yeah. are controlling for uh, um, impulsivity and compulsivity as well. We have data regarding to that, and we are also conducting studies in relation to that. Great comment. Uh, John, do you have a question or a comment? Terrific. Yeah, no, I just wanted to congratulate the speakers uh, on a wonderful set of presentations and I've been really enjoying the question and answer. Um, my question's for Karen and Jenny. Um, what keeps coming up uh, and is clear here is the importance of the comparator and substitution. And I think it's uh, got a public health implication because a lot of companies are reformulating to get achieve lower sugars by adding maltodextrins and refined starches. So your sugar is lower, but the calories don't change, and you have a higher glycemic index product. You can take cornflakes versus, um, you know, all brand buds with psyllium as an example I like to show. Um, so have you looked at substitutions? Do you have the ability to do that? I mean, that this is an analysis uh, approach. Certainly the Harvard group started. Uh, we saw a bit yesterday in Jordy's presentation looking at um, nuts being substituted for different foods, and then you start to see signals. Um, have you started to look at that to really get at that public health question? Substitutions. Yeah. Unfortunately, we, we did not. I think that becomes critical more and more in this area. I, I think this time next year we'll have some data for you. Hi, hey, John. Yeah. And subst from an Australian perspective is between soft drink and alcohol. Because... We, are, we have actually published data from our national dietary surveys. The people that avoid sugar-sweetened beverages, avoid them, are the people that drink alcohol. And they drink twice as many calories from those alcoholic beverages than from the people who consume the highest amount of soft drink. So that substitution issue, I agree, is really important. Now... Uh, we are getting very close to more for Michael Lean. Have a question? Um, somebody, you or you can shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> no, it's a very quick question. You used a ratio of um, solid to liquid carbohydrate, which is an interesting concept. But just as a principle, biology doesn't use ratios, and I wondered why you used a ratio. studies uh, were based uh, basically on, on previous studies when uh, th that I showed the results and um, we saw encouraging results uh, regarding the better metabolicums related so this, this to is these. A, a math mathematical construct and I'm, I'm, I'm just a bit like using you know, ratios like waist hip ratio and uh, um, these curious things which actually don't have biological meaning, they're mathematical constructs. And I just leave it with you as something to consider because we need our coffee. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I think we should thank all the speakers again very much. Uh, unless there's one. <laughs> so you want to say something now? Or, oh, I thought it was before the lunch. So it's before the coffee. Ah, okay. Dario, please. But thank you anyway so much. Thank you very much. I would like also to express my gratitude to all speakers and also to chairpersons and for chairing a beautiful session. And before coffee break, I, I just have one small announcement. Uh, so uh, I would kindly uh, inform you uh, that uh, I'm one of the guest editors in, in uh, a special issue uh, entitled to Nutrition and Lifestyle Intervention in Type 1 Diabetes. Uh, I know that uh, Hannah has a beautiful talk about type 1 diabetes and nutrition, so I would like to invite you and also other colleagues who, who have 
uh, who can contribute in that, that special issue about the um, uh, nutrition and lifestyle intervention in type 1 diabetes. As, as, you can say, uh, as you can see, the deadline is December 20th, so it's still a few, a few months in front of us and also summer is here, so instead of vacation, maybe you can uh, perform something. You know that impact factor is 6.7, so it's reasonable uh, impact factor. So I would kindly invite you to, uh, to do that. And also uh, you can uh, apply for a Nutrients Travel Award and also for Best uh, PhD Thesis Award. So you can find all information on uh, their website. So thank you very much uh, for giving me opportunity. And also I would like to, uh, to invite you to, to contribute in that special issue. And I, I wish you a nice coffee break and also poster session. Sorry? And right now, during, uh, during the uh, coffee break, we will have poster presentations. So uh, please, uh, all people who already have a poster presentation, be on, uh, on your place. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Morning. Please, please take your seats. Uh, we're going to start the session now. So session seven, low calorie sweeteners in people with or at risk for diabetes, reconciling the clinical public health and safety assessments. Um, a lot of it is since the, the publication of the uh, WHO guidelines around uh, non-sugar sweeteners, there's been a fair amount of controversy, uh, a fair amount of con conversations, discussions. And here we are trying to, uh, during this session, we hope to untangle some of this evidence and come to some sort of uh, consensus. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, my, my, my colleague here, Per. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and uh, I'm very forward, forward to this very exciting session here. My name is Per Bendix Jeppesen from Aarhus University in Denmark. Um, and uh, we look forward to have a very interesting presentation here, right? Thank you. And I'm Dan Ramdas. I am based in Canada. And it's a great pleasure for me to, to introduce the, the, our first speaker, Dr. Tusev Khan. He's, he works, uh, he's a senior research associate working with John Stephen Piper's group at St. Michael's Hospital, University of Toronto. And he's here to talk to us about the WHO draft guidelines the, and, and talking about the main takeaways from this. Tusev? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, two important disclosures that I have are, I wrote a response to WHO um, recent guideline on the non-sugar sweeteners and was accepted at uh, EGCN. And I am uh, personally an avid consumer of low-calorie sweetened beverages. So this is the uh, a press release that WHO did on 15th of May 2023, saying that WHO advises not to use non-sugar sweet guideline. And what they said was that non-sugar sweeteners not confer any long-term benefit in reducing body fat in adults or children and potential undesired effects from long-term use of NSS as an increase, uh, increased risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and mortality. So they say that these are undesirable risks that uh, increase them. And uh, Francesco Branca, who's a WHO director, uh, is quoted to have said that replacing sugars with NSS does not help with weight control in the long term. And people consider other ways to reduce free sugar, such as fruit, uh, fruit, unsweetened food, and beverages. And finally, people should reduce the sweetness of diet altogether uh, to improve health. Uh, so how do we get here? Um, and uh, this was commissioned by the uh, WHO Nutrition Guidance Expert Advisory Group, which is the NUGAG group. And uh, my presentation is about the journey, but I will also present some concerns and, uh, regarding uh, the recommendation. So in 2015, WHO came up with uh, a sugar reduction strategy and the guidelines uh, stated um, recommended reduction in sugar intake uh, to less than 10% of total energy. Uh, and after that, a uh, question arose regarding the role of non-sugar sweeteners and should not sugar sweeteners be used to replace or reduce free sugar intake and should uh, non-sugar sweetener beverages also be taxed. So these questions were arising, were being asked. And DHO, after doing a, 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 a so they set up to do uh, to look at that evidence uh, and uh, do um, uh, do do another uh, prepare another guidance on non-sugar sweeteners. So the initial review was done in uh, uh, 2017 to 2019. Actually, that's uh, it was published in 2019. Uh, it was done by Jorg Mirpool, uh, and um, the first author is Ingrid uh, uh, Toes, and it was published in BMJ. So they actually said that no evidence was seen for health benefits for non-sugar sweeteners and potential harms uh, could not be excluded. Um, however, there were some patients of this uh, first meta-analysis, uh, which was uh, uh, given in uh, some editorials, and we also wrote about later. Uh, that it is based on limited data. It excludes studies which did not specify the type of uh, non nutritive sweetener and uh, high quality trials and calorie comparators uh, and, and long term cohort studies, repeated measures were not used. So they actually did uh, this uh, 
systematic review. And uh, the scope of the new review, which was published in uh, 2022, uh, is what are the health effects of non-sugar sweeteners and what are the health effects of placing free sugars with it. So uh, they studied all non-caloric sweeteners as non-sugar sweeteners. They did not include sugar alcohols or low-calorie sweeteners. And they did not look at safety or toxicology at all. So they assumed that all studies, uh, human studies on this topic, uh, the assumption is that they are under ADI. And also they excluded studies with uh, people with uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, and uh, a majority of studies uh, assessed beverage intake. Uh, so the overall uh, results are based on 50 randomized controlized 91-97 cohort studies. I won't go into case control studies, 47 related to cancer and they didn't find any cancer risk for non-sugar sweeteners. So I'll summarize the results of the randomized control trial with mostly show benefit. Body weight, so this is the overall analysis uh, uh, comparing non-sugar sweetener, sweeteners versus any other intervention. Uh, and it reduced body weight. However, really you should be looking at what is the comparator, what is the replacement? So is it either nothing, sugar, or water? It should be sugar because that's the question we're looking at. So actually, the results are uh, the, the if the comparator is sugar, and uh, you can see a reduction in weight. Similarly, when you look at BMI, you see a similar reduction in BMI. Uh, and when you look at explicit replacement of sugars, uh, there is some signal of reduction for body weight, but because of, I think it's the number amount of data it's a power issue so uh, it doesn't reach the significance uh, and bmi there was no change um, and also uh, energy intake and sugar intake to sugar comparator so but uh, it gives a very different picture so in cohort studies uh, there was no effect of of uh, uh, non-sugar sweetener take with uh, body weight, but it increased BMI and incident obesity, uh, or it was associated with, so uh, the wrong word, it's not causal, but it's associated with increase. And uh, type 2 diabetes, there was a uh, associated increase, and also for cardiovascular, uh, um, heart disease, stroke, uh, no, cardiovascular events, stroke and hypertension, and also total mortality. And they used cohorts which use prevalent analysis and did not use uh, those that used change or replacement or display. However, they actually looked at one study, which is, which is a replacement study. There was a, um, so Harvard cohort uh, did a replacement. They looked at the replacement of SSB beverages containing uh, and uh, non-sugar sweetened beverages, and they saw a 12% reduction in the risk of coronary events. How it was not included, or not a similar studies were included, uh, cite, citing that they did not allow independent assessment of, of uh, sweetened beverages, which is very strange. I don't know what that means. However, so in April 2022, the uh, meta-analysis came out, then there was a drive guideline, there was a, uh, some time where people gave their feedback, and then the, the guideline actually came out last month. And grade was used to assess certainty and give the final recommendation. So what is the final recommendation? So WHO says, so this is the, the, the actual guideline, WHO suggests non-sugar sweeteners not to be used as a means of achieving weight control or reduce of non-communicable disease. Conditional recommendation. Conditional means that they are uncertain that the desirable consequences. Uh, there's some debate about the data, about the evidence, and uh, the anticipated net effects are small, but it's still a recommendation um, of not using non-sugar sweeteners. Uh, they explicitly say that this is not applicable to people with diabetes, and it is relevant to all non-sugar sweeteners. And then what they cite is that the uh, 
The effects on body weight and BMI of RCTs are observed only when non-sugar sweeteners is compared to intake of free sugar, uh, and not when you compare it to other comparators. But I think that's the that's what we should be looking at. And they also cite the long-term non-sugar risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and mortality in prospective cohort studies. And evidence recommendation uh, has a low certainty overall. So this is what they used to come up with their recommendations. So I'll go into SNAL that they presented or why uh, they went with this guide. Um, this time. So according to the guideline report, and these are uh, so these these are Italy Italy side actually their own words. Uh, in the guideline. Uh, uh, so they state that RCTs are short terms, that the uh, NSS use uh, resulted in reduced sugar than energy intake, uh, lower body weight, lower BMI in short term RCTs, the majority of which lasted three months or less. Uh, this is what we will explore in a bit. And also they said that weight loss should be sustained over a long term to have a meaningful health impact. The evidence of minor weight loss and reduced BMI of several months as observed in RCTs does not represent a health benefit. This is, the, this is a very um, a strange statement. So RCTs have a benefit, but they say it does not evidence of long-term impact at all. How actually quite, uh, they, 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 they go from three months to six months, and there are trials which are over one year long. And uh, the results are similar. The only thing is the six months and above trials do not reach significance, but the effect estimates are almost similar. It's a power issue, just, uh, just fewer trials there. And there is no effect modification by, by, by length of the study. So it's a short term, uh, short uh, term trials is, is slightly concerning. Now, according to WHO, the Cohorts represent long-term intake. So what they say that discordant results between, so this is the second paragraph I'm reading. The discordies and prospective cohort studies suggest that a small amount of weight loss, this use in short-term experimental setting may not be, which is the trials, which may, may not be relevant to the effects of long-term NSS use in general population, which are cohorts. So, in other words, cohorts actually reflect intake and actually actually reflect the true uh, results uh, or risk. And they say that they are actually real world uh, intakes that um, cohorts are actually getting, not the trials. And finally, this is a very important statement that they made. Uh, and um, this is their conclusion, actually, on which the recommendation based. And I'll read it out, all out. Uh, they concluded that the lack of evidence to suggest that NSS use is beneficial for body weight or other measure of body fatness over a long term. So in, the, in cohorts, they didn't see any benefit. Say there's a lack of evidence. Together with possible long-term undesirable effects in form of increased risk of NCDs and death outweighed any potential short-term health effects resulting from small reduction body weight and BMI observed in RCTs. So what they are saying is, uh, ideally, uh, trials uh, have higher uh, certainty, and they should be weighed higher in hierarchical evidence. However, what they are doing is, they are saying that cohort actually trumps, cohort studies actually, even though the cohort study um, uh, the certain evidence is very low to low, and trials is actually low to moderate. Um, and uh, in the hierarchical evidence, as you go up from cohorts to trials, your risk of bias, uh, your certain evidence uh, uh, increases, and also uh, causality can be established with trials, but not with cohorts. It's very difficult to establish causality. So the issue, the major issue is the observational studies have been given more weight in the recommendation. They ignored the established hierarchy and disregarded uh, trial evidence, uh, including long-term. Uh, the overall certainty of evidence for the recommendation was based upon the prospective studies, and they actually say this. The overall certainty of evidence was considered low and based upon the undesirable effects of NSS on health outcomes observed in prospective 
cohort study. So totally ignoring the trials in the final uh, uh, evidence synthesis. And so the, this is a methodology flawed approach and goes against our conventional understanding of nutritional and best practices in evidence synthesis. So when you have a disconnect between RCTs and cohorts, you try to explain why the RCT cohorts are different from RCTs rather than explaining a way that RCTs must be wrong and cohorts actually represent the right result. Um, and no sound biological reasoning has given for how the adiposity benefits in trials would develop into long-term harm in studies. Uh, there is typical, uh, uh, there's a whole paragraph of what they say, potential mechanisms. Uh, taste perception, uh, eating behavior, hedonic, respo hedonic responses, sweet uncoupling, altered gut microbiome, but these are all not established yet in human studies. These are all animal in vitro studies. So still this is, uh, uh, these cannot be presented as evidence that, okay, this is the biological mechanism. And secondly, they relied on cohort studies which are prone to bias. So what does that mean? So they rely on prospective cohort studies which use prevalent analysis. So what is that? So that is when you look at uh, uh, <coughs> exposure, uh, exposure measurement at one point in time and at the disease outcome like 5, 10, 15 years later. And these kind of analysis, especially in non-sugar uh, uh, su sweeteners, are at high risk of bias due to behavioral clustering, compounding, and reverse causality. And how that is happening is uh, being at high risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, or CVD leads to increased intake of uh, non-sugar as a risk reduction strategy. And this is what people switch. So uh, people have... Uh, so they have a high risk, maybe because of, of uh, unhealthy diet or uh, in, uh, intake of sugar, uh, added sugars in the in their li over life, and then they switch. And when you measure them, you're actually measuring the lifetime risk, not the risk that is associated with the local sweetener. And this has been well established. There's, uh, there's several papers and guidelines express consensus that that non-sugar sweetener research, uh, especially if coming from cohort studies with prevalent analysis, is suffering from this problem. So there's reverse causality, and uh, that should be something that uh, uh, should be taken into account. And actually, they actually admit in their meta-analysis, which says that further research is needed to see if this, these results are genuine or because of reverse causation or residual compounding. Guideline, what they say is actually it's not really that issue. We cannot dismiss the co-observation causality or residual compounding. And that other type of robust analysis, replacement analysis in cohort studies, because they cited one study, but they did not uh, do any analysis on that. Uh, however, uh, when they looked at saturated and trans fat, they looked at replacements of fats with other macronutrients. And then they said it is it has uh, given us more detail than any previous work on this topic. So they had the ability to do it, but they didn't look at it. Uh, to be fair, uh, in the research gap and future initiate action, they actually say that more robust measures are needed for cohort studies, and we need to further address reverse causation. And uh, finally, uh, because of the sugar reduction strategies in 2015 and all other guidelines that have come up, in, there has been an increase, and the guidelines actually acknowledge there has been an increase in intake of uh, non-sugar sweetened beverages, and uh, and and and, non um, and that is part of a strategy in many countries. However, they said now because we are we are saying that we should not use them, how do how we can reduce uh, sugar without an excess. And they said it can be achieved, but by, by taking fruit or unsweetened foods and beverages. No analysis has been presented for this, these statements. So, so if you are saying, okay, do not use this, what is the other strategy? So no other strategy has been presented in the guideline. And also, uh, 
there are people who have switched uh, and, and used non-sugar sweets and they acknowledged it. And they said, okay, these, the, uh, because of the risk of associated, uh, the, the risk, they will now switch to water and would not switch to free sugar. Their statement is without any merit. Um, so it's very interesting what they say. Yeah, last slide. Uh, how, they also said that they will update the guidelines if there are more data. So hopefully in, uh, uh, um, on this. And uh, I'm sure more work will be done. A lot of people will be interested because this guideline is, is, uh, is, is, is different from uh, other guidelines. And, and, and some of the results are, are, are strange and, and, and concerning how they, they actually evaluated the data. So in conclusion, so the guidelines suggest that uh, non-sugar sweeteners can, should not be used as means of achieving weight control or reducing non-communicable diseases. The, the results of, from meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials support the use of uh, non-sugar sweeteners for sugar reduction, caloric intake reduction, and achieving uh, uh, weight loss. Prospective cohort studies using prevalent analysis have methodological limitations. And WHO guideline recommendation against the use of non-sugar solely relies on evidence from prospective cohort studies and assessment while ignoring the beneficial trial results. So I think uh, more research needs is needed in this uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Um, now, now that you've uh, identified the issues around the guidelines, uh, it's a pleasure to ask uh, Professor John Stephen Piper to talk about the about dis disentangling the sources of, sources of disagreement. John needs no introduction to this uh, this group here. Um, however, as you know, he's a professor at the sciences. He is a lead. He's a staff physician at the uh, Saint Michael's Hospital Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism and lead of the the, uh, the 3D, the Toronto 3D Knowledge Synthesis Unit. John? Thank you for the kind introduction, um, and, and thank you for allowing this session. I think it's an important session, and, and Tosif, uh, I think, set it up beautifully with uh, his review of the, um, the WHO guideline and, and his critique. Um, and this much will be a continuation, actually, of Tosif's critique and his work, because he led a lot of the method development for, for what we're going to show. Um, and it's also very much a DNSG um, project uh, in that I'm going to be using as a frame our DNSG commission systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which Stroll was part of, Hanna was part of, Care was part of, Dario and Morty, um, um, that to address some of these methodological issues. So those are my conflicts. I've been trained by David, so David's got more, but I've, I've put as many as I put everything down. Intellectual, familial, financial. Um, uh, that's relevant. I put in red those that are most relevant where we've done guidelines related to this and, and uh, where there's an interest in sweeteners um, among some of those um, entities. So really to start, you know, to kind of frame it and to really sort of start, I mean, there is, and Dave showed that with the with the WHO, but it's, it goes beyond the WHO. Like there really are, it's universal recommendation if you look across, and I put on the left, uh, major dietary guidelines, so that's WHO, that's um, USDA, and, um, but also diabetes uh, and obesity guidelines um, that there's ASCII and, and recommendations for a reduction in sugars. And most of, the, uh, most of the guidelines have come out around 5 to 10% of energy from free or added sugars. So that's a universal. So what about the guidelines in terms of clinical practice guidelines for obesity and diabetes as it relates to low and no calorie sweeteners? We're here, again, the Diabetes Association is um, consistent in that they all recommend them, but insofar as they're replacing sugars, displacing sugar calories from sugars, which I think is important because if we look at the recommendation for the WHO, it doesn't actually talk about the comparator or the reference. It just talks about low-calorie sweeteners for weight loss, not in the context of sugars reduction. So these guidelines that have been issued do relate to sugars reduction. We have a, a new, just came out in April the 17th, our DNSG uh, EST guidelines, and I'll show that. I put pending, but it, it's now out, and um, the IDF does not yet have guidance. Um, where the disconnect begins to occur, or, or has, and we, we've seen that with the WHO, is the public health dietary guidelines. So uh, the uh, dietary guidelines for Americans, the 2015 
uh, to 20 guideline um, showing the, um, the report, the scientific report of the DGAC um, recommended certainly an, uh, a reduction of added sugars but that they not be replaced with low calorie sweeteners, but rather with healthy options such as water um, in place of sugar sweetened beverages, water, coffee, tea, uh, so non-caloric um, healthy beverage options. Um, and that was really, when you read deeper in the, in, in the document, really insufficient evidence, which was changed in the 2020 to 25, where the committee recommends these food ingredients, low calorie sweeteners can now be considered so that there's now sufficient uh, evidence um, that they can now be uh, recommended. In particular, beverages, low and no calorie sweetened beverages, may be a useful aid in weight management in adults. So the USDA changed their position as new data um, came to light between these two iterations of the Dietary Guidelines for American Committee reports. Um, and now we have the WHO, which, which Tosi presented. Um, and again, just to note, it's not in the context of sugars reduction or calorie reduction. It simply states that non-sugar sweeteners not be used as a means of achieving weight control. So it's very specific and, and doesn't really relate um, to sort of the real world setting where consumers will be making choices, this for that. It doesn't, it doesn't put it in that context. So with that um, as, our, as our sort of initial background, what does the evidence show for uh, low no calorie sweeten um, um, reduction as it relates to low no calorie sweeteners? And what I wanna do is use as the frame for that, our new um, European guidelines, the ESD clinical practice guidelines, we had a series of commissions, systematic reviews and meta-analyses to uh, prospective cohorts and randomized trials uh, to specifically address a number of the issues that um, were raised uh, by Tosif and his critique and have been raised by many others. And this was part of, and you'll find the recommendation, um, we have, it's sort of, it's broken into sections. Um, and so it would be in the third section relates to carbohydrate intake and diabetes management where we have a recommendation. I'll, I'll finish with, with the recommendation. So, and, and Tosif showed this, but this really comes, this, this approach that we took really uh, is to address um, really what's been echoed in Lettery's expert consensus statements. So uh, Tosif showed the editorial by our uh, good friend and colleague, Vasanti Malik, who, who trained actually with, with Frank and is now on faculty with us at U of T. Uh, in response as an editorial to uh, that first commission WHO review indicating the importance of the care, the comparator, the nature of the comparator, caloric versus non-caloric comparators, and really the grouping of those leading to dilution or estimation of effects, because really um, sweeteners aren't magic. They're working to displace calories and sugars. So if you don't get that in the comparator's water, placebo, or weight loss matched control, you're not getting weight dis uh, energy displacements. You wouldn't reasonably expect to see um, a weight change. Um, so this, this importance of really addressing the nature of the comparator and the reverse causality question, and that's been echoed and we've written letters and, uh, and, and been involved with um, editorials and, and uh, consensus statements that have uh, brought other content experts really um, in, this, in the area of low calorie sweeteners um, that have called for this. So we commissioned, uh, or the DNSG commissioned these uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses they were led, Tosif did uh, most of the method development and led it, but we had two really incredible students, named McGlynn, who was an, an MF with us that uh, did uh, the work on the RCTs, and then Jennifer Lee, who's actually a PhD candidate with, uh, during her MPH, as an MPH project, um, it's real credit to her project, but uh, really stuck with it. Um, so what does the evidence show? So we set this up uh, in terms of the questions, we wanted to set it up in terms of three pre-specified comparisons of clinical and public health importance. So really to frame these substitutions and really take into account the nature of the comparator. So it will be low and no, so these would be, in, in, particularly for a diabetes guideline, these would be very clinically relevant in terms of the conversation you're gonna have with your patients. So low and no calorie sweetened beverages for sugar sweetened beverages, we called that the intended substitution. They're meant to be perspective identical to the sugar sweet beverages they're producing, you're gonna select the diet over um, the, the, uh, the sugary um, beverage um, um, and you'll select the diet of your choice. And there is necessarily energy displacement. Then you have water for sugar sweetened beverages where among the guidelines that really is a universal as a standard of care substitution. So we're gonna call that the standard of care substitution. Was again with energy displacement. And then we would look at um, the comparison of low no calories versus, versus water to really get at the reference substitution. So no energy displacement, understand do we see any differences um, there? 
And to increase the information, because you saw that there were some power issues that Tosif showed you, we do have uh, a number of RCTs, but if we use general pairwise comparisons, um, we're limited. In particular, as you see there, for water versus sugar sweetened beverages. So if the common comparator, not, which is the low no calorie sweetened beverages, versus water or sugar sweetened beverages, you can get the relative response, those indirect comparisons to increase information size. So we decided to use network meta-analyses for this approach. And so here are the data we published last year um, in um, March um, or April, I guess it came out, in JAMA Network Open. So if we look at it, the intended substitution, this is low no calorie sweetened beverages for sugar sweetened beverages, again, with caloric displacement. So here, these were the pre-specified um, intermediate outcomes, um, pre-specified for the guidelines development uh, for the commission systematic reviews and analyses that were done uh, by the group on different questions. Um, and what you can see here, two should 17 RCTs, over 1,700 individuals. The follow-up is three weeks out to 52 weeks, so out to a year. You do see the anticipated or expected reductions of body weight, body fat, and um, in, uh, intrapatocellular lipids, so liver fat. Um, none of the others were significant, some were close. Generally, everything is going in the right direction. So no signals for harm, and we're seeing uh, the benefit. And this was confirmed uh, by the WHO uh, systematic review that came later. And I should say, uh, they actually reached out to Jason Montez, who did that, um, to actually uh, get, get our review beforehand uh, because, so that they could uh, help inform what they were doing. If we look at the standard of care substitution, this is water for sugar sweetened beverages. Um, so this is where, this actually, when we originally went to BMJ, the editors were, were surprised by the, that we didn't find anything. We were too, but this is really a power issue. There's not a lot of pairwise comparisons. We're relying on the indirect comparisons. You can see the number of trial comparisons or the direct estimates, it's like one to three. There's not a lot of trials, and so probably things going in the right direction, and water still remains the, the standard of care. Um, so what's important now, I guess, is do those estimates really differ from those of, of the low in beverages in terms of what we see when we compare the two? So this is the head-to-head -head comparison. And what we can see here is, um, in general, no real differences. There's a couple of things that favor low and no calorie sweetened beverages. So that's for body weight and systolic pr blood pressure and uh, outcomes that favor water, which is the HbA1c. But just to put this in perspective, both interventions are showing a direction of effect that uh, show in the direction of benefit, it's just it's a little bit more for low and no calorie sweetened beverages for body weight and systolic blood pressure and a little bit more for water in the case of C. It's not that we're seeing adverse signals, it's just there are bigger effects um, for the, the uh, its counterpart. So what is the evidence from perspective of cohorts? So this is the um, of uh, perspective cohorts. And again, and, and to get to really drill down on what Tosif was saying, to get at residual confounding and looking at some of the methodological work um, that even the Harvard cohorts have done as it relates to, you know, like change, lag change, um, substitution, um, uh, different approaches so, uh, versus prevalent baseline, um, change and, and substitution are going to give you the most robust, biologically plausible reproduce. Um, and when we, so we wanted to apply that and we also wanted to ensure that as part of the entry criteria, the study is adjusted for adiposity at a minimum. Um, so we could at least take care of some of that um, that sort of background risk that might be influencing uh, and be part of the reverse causality. So we looked at the three pre-specified substitutions again. So there, there they are. And then we looked at change. We didn't do, um, this is just based on pairwise um, meta-analyses. So if we do substitution analyses, uh, well then you actually see agreement. Now we have coherence to invoke Bradford Hill criteria, which uh, Jeff showed between the RCTs and the prospective cohorts. So unlike the, uh, what we saw when you look at prevalent exposure, or increased body weight or increased incident obesity, uh, not body weight, but incident HD, CHD mortality, CV mortality, uh, diabetes, we don't see any adverse signals and we actually see protective signals, body weight, obesity incidence, CHD incidence, and really big ones, CVD mortality, total mortality. So showing that we're getting agree agreement, more agreement with what we see with the intermediate risk factors in the randomized trials. If we look at the standard of care substitution, water is performing, I think as we would hope, uh, slightly different outcomes just by, based on the, the literature that's available, but you see uh, associated reductions in body weight, waist circumference, percent body fat, obesity incidence, 
Um, uh, so also showing those reductions. And when we look at the head to head, which is the low and no calorie for water, we don't see, I mean, there's some imprecision in some of these estimates that we might like to see more studies, but in general, we're not seeing any differences. But as you can see, there's not a lot of cohorts that have done that. So I think we, we certainly could use more, maybe it's like David's concept of mega cohorts we need to really, I think, uh, increase the certainty of, of evidence here. But the signals so far, uh, and um, are, we're not seeing any adverse signals. And this is an approach consistent with what WHO has done, again, for saturated fat and trans fat um, to really improve um, the resolution there with, with their findings in terms of um, using that as an exposure. Change analyses, not nearly as much data, but here you can see some of that reverse causality some of the behavior costs and those issues that Tosi indicated to still have coherence. So we're seeing no increased risk and we see an associated reduction in body weight, associated reduction in waist circumference from the available data. So um, overall, this gives us good coherence. So what if we put them together, um, did this for his European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. I mean, Tosi really should have been presenting this. He led this work, but um, my pleasure to come and, and, and present for you, Tosi. Um, so this is what uh, Tosif showed you, basically, in terms of how we got here. You see uh, general RCTs, it's green arrows going down, and the cohorts based on prevalent exposures, everything's going up. Um, if we, uh, what Tosif did was put all these together in our, our commentary uh, in EJCN, we put together prevalent exposure versus change versus substitution, so you can actually see how the estimates change, and you can see the reversal and the flipping uh, um, for the same um, and um, the same outcomes with those different analytical approaches in terms of how one models the exposure. But we're seeing this uh, was increased by prevalent, is decreased, or we're not seeing any an adverse signal when we look at change or substitution analyses. So how do we reconcile the biological mechanisms in just the last few minutes? As this gets a lot of traction, and you saw that the WHO uh, guideline group did uh, indicate a number of biological mechanisms. I just wanted to go after a couple that I think have got have particularly gotten some resonance. And particularly, one is the uncoupling hypothesis. This idea of uncoupling of taste from calories may lead to metabolic endocrine responses that affect food intake regulation in glucose. And so really being able to test that. There's also the coupling hypothesis. It's actually when you put the low no calorie signal, low no calorie signals together with uh, a, cal a calorie source, like a carbohydrate source, you may actually um, see some adverse signals. We were able to do this um, in a, uh, this was actually work that went through competitive grant mechanism through IFINS to do a, um, a systematic review meta-analysis to uh, look at these different, we put them all together um, in this publication to look at these different hypotheses, looking at the acute RCTs. Um, and so I'm gonna look at for uncoupling, delayed coupling, so it's like when it's given 10 to 15 minutes before, and then when it's given together, which is the coupling, just to kind of put it in context. We use network meta-analysis here to increase information size again, um, and so let's look at uncoupling. So I'm gonna show you a number, this is, this is the, I, the, we did data in diabetes too, but th to show everything it's too much, so I'm just gonna show that the, those in the uh, normal glucose tolerance, but the data is all the same, um, and this is complicated, this is a league table, so it's quite an involved network meta-analysis. We've done is we basically put all the sweeteners on the left, the blends, which most occur naturally in terms of, of the real world, and we'll hear that a bit in terms of our stop sugars trial, um, in terms of water and then caloric comparators. And then the color code works, if it's white, there's, there is, um, no, it, there's no difference or it's a trivial. Um, when you go to lighter blue, it's a small important, darker blue, moderate, large, very large, based on minimally important differences. Um, and we came up with pre-specified criteria. So what you can see here is right away, no difference across the sweeteners, no difference with water. Uh, and here we can look at individual sweeteners. You only see differences with caloric sweeteners, which makes sense. They're gonna increase glucose. Glucose increases glucose, sucrose increases glucose, fructose somewhat. But we're not seeing any differences. Um, and if we look here, uh, this is for, that was for uh, insulin. Um, you see that that's even more magnified, larger effect sizes now versus the caloric, but no differences across the low calorie sweeteners. So they're not stimulating responses um, in and of themselves, it, certainly nothing that would compare to the caloric sweeteners where you're getting large responses. So that was glucose and insulin. This is GLP-1. Again, nothing with the sweeteners. We did this for GIP, nothing. You, you do see it for the caloric, which is sucrose. Uh, and that we're getting less here because there's just less comparisons. 
this is for ghrelin, we're not seeing anything, and this is for glucagon, we're not seeing anything. So that's uh, uncoupling. If we look at delayed coupling, uh, the same story across all these, so I can move more quickly. Uh, we don't see anything with delayed coupling. This is, again, when it's given like 10 to 15 minutes before a meal. That was glucose, this is insulin, this is GIP, and so on, nothing. And then for coupling, this is when it's actually given together with the meal, and there's some suggestion that that be a uh, part of the story. Uh, much less data, but um, we don't see anything as it relates to, um, uh, this is glucose, this is insulin, and that's all we have. So, and we see the same thing for diabetes. So we're not seeing any signals there, um, you know, in terms of really proving a biolog that might explain this discordance when, when we use prevalent um, exposures. The other one is microbiome. So the Suez paper in 2014 in Nature really kicked off a, a huge sort of um, area of research. I, I could say like these sorts of Nature papers, they change research priorities. We got a re new research priority in Canada to address that, and that's why we have our stop sugars data, that which we'll share. It was part of that uh, RFP process because they there was because this microbiome uh, change was was really concerning and, and especially as it relates to inducing glucose intolerance. Um, this trial, uh, this study though, was really um, a pilot within the Suez paper. Uh, it only assessed acrin, even though it was extrapolated to all sweeteners. There was no control group; it was just a before versus after, and they gave seven oral glucose tolerance tests. So it may have also just been the actual way they tested glucose tolerance may have actually induced the change. Um, they did post uh, hoc separation of responders, non-responders. Um, so, the, you know, when you get profiles, there's a lot of variability. They just took the people at the top, and there's people at the bottom, called the non-responders. Stuff you probably couldn't do in most journals, but it, it, this was quite exploratory. At the ADI, so maximum intake that you would expect, and it didn't look at the intended institution. Um, so it kicked off a lot of research. This was one in Canada, I think they got funded to test this. So this, they did 75 gram OGTTs, microbiome, but these placebo-controlled RCTs. So unlike the last one I showed you, no change in glucose tolerance, and this relates to aspartame, so not saccharin, at a much more reasonable ADI, uh, sorry, percentage of the ADI, um, and sucralose. Didn't see anything. Um, this was one looking at um, just sucralose, no changes in glucose tolerance, no changes in microbiome, and this was actually looking at saccharin so really testing the question that was raised by that, no changes in glucose tolerance, no changes in microbiome. So we need to really replicate that finding, but I think it sort of gives us pause before we invoke logical mechanisms to want to explain away the RCT evidence. So balancing the totality of the evidence, I can take you to our recommendation, which just was published. We, and again, we frame it in the context of replacement for sugars, so non nitrous sweeteners may be used to replace sugars in beverages and foods. Um, and we gave that a moderate certainty of it in our current published recommendations. Um, so conclusions, um, although there are concerns that low and no calorie sweeteners may not have the intended benefits, I think the network meta-analysis we presented of RCTs uh, that increases the information size shows that low and no calorie sweetened beverages, again, in replacement of sugar sweetened beverages, that intended replacement or substitution, do lead to weight loss and related cardiometabolic risk factors, and it's similar to water. Um, findings were supported by the network meta-analysis of RC, uh, acute RCTs, so this is getting the biological question in terms of looking at those acute metabolic endocrine responses, not seeing anything, and the microbiome work that's, that's been done to date, and maybe we'll have to meta-analyze this. Improvements do translate to prospective cohorts, so now we have coherence, which I think is important, associated weight loss, associated uh, reductions in incident obesity, CHD, total mortality, and CV uh, mortality, I didn't add that there, similar to water, so again, with greater coherence, and that's when it's substituted for sugar-sweetened beverages. The certainty of evidence is generally moderate for the RCTs um, for the prospective cohorts, but when you take it together with good coherent message in terms of we can be, I think, reasonably confident um, in what we're seeing. Teas we're gonna hear about as an abstract, uh, the Stop Sugars Now trial from a uh, number of other RCTs that are they're ongoing, I think they will help inform at least some of the microbiome glucose tolerance questions and give us some more information when we want to update. And just want to thank my amazing lab group and students, many of whom are here and, and collaborators. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and the DNSG. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. And uh, we'll go on uh, with the next presenter, which I am pleased to present, Anna Raben, 
from our Copenhagen University, uh, which are in charge of this very well-known suite project with the title Long-Term Public Health Safety and Sustainability Implication in Switching to Non-Sugar Sweeteners. Please go on, Anna. Thank you very much, Pierre. Oh, my God. Um, so, um, yes, I will present the update from the suite project. And um, I will do this on behalf of a, a large consortium of Swede colleagues and partners, um, which I will come back to. So the Swede project is about sweetness and sweetness enhancers. That's what we call it in this project and their impact on health, obesity, safety and sustainability. So the Swede project is a Horizon 2020 project, an EU project. And the overall objective is to look at barriers and facilitators to the use of sweetness and sweetness enhancers, SNSEs, and the likely risks and benefits of using them to replace sugar in the diet in the context of health, obesity, safety, and sustainability. And some of our primary outcomes in the clinical trial is, uh, well, the main outcomes are body weight and uh, microbiota changes after one year. But we also look at a number of other things. Also. We have been running this project for almost five years now, but due to COVID-19, we have asked for an extension for half a year in order to complete all our studies and publications and deliverables, et cetera, et cetera. It's coordinated by Jason Halford and Joe Harold from the University of Liverpool in the UK, and a little bit by myself. And we are 29 partners from EU. They are listed here with a nice pictogram. And uh, it's universities, industry, non-governmental organizations, and patient organizations. So a nice group of, of uh, sweet people. OK. We have in the sweet project six work packages with scientific content. And the first one is about, um, well, it's the industry work package really where they innovate and produce the fine new sweeteners and uh, produce new products with sweeteners, such as cakes and bis biscuits. Work package two is the short-term human intervention studies. I'll come back to. Work package three is the long-term clinical trial. I'll also come back to that. Which four uh, concerns the population-based studies. And I will not come back to that, but I can say overall it shows what we have seen already in the previous excellent presentations for such uh, studies. Then we have uh, this work package five on sustainability, which is perhaps not that common to have in, a, in, a, in such a, a, a group of uh, well work packages, but it's uh, very exciting, we think, ourselves. <laughs> And then we have consumer, uh, well, stakeholder engagement and consumer perception. And a cross-cutting theme on uh, safety as well. Okay, short-term intervention studies. I will show you uh, the first uh, results that are published from the phase one, um, well, phase one part of uh, work package two. It's about drinks. We also have a phase two that is uh, concerning the food products, but there are no uh, results out yet. So this one intervention study is a typical acute postprandial crossover study. And we have included uh, three beverages and one control with sucrose. And the blends that we included were stevia rep M and mocoside B, stevia rep A and thomatin, and sucralose and ACE-K. So blends uh, that are relatively new, but um, all matched for sweetness and, uh, well, they all look the same and they were all uh, added some lemon to make them taste similar. We have uh, three centers, Spain, Denmark, UK, uh, with a total of 60 participants fairly evenly distributed with a BMI of 29, age of 33 on average, almost the same number of men and women. And uh, the beverages were 300 of these different blends or sucrose, and you can see the difference in energy content, no, no kilojoule in the sweetener blends. And they were all matched, as I said. And then we had looked at different outcomes, appetite, glycemic, insulinemic response, uh, other lipids, uh, feeding behavior, uh, and consumer aspects or perceptions. Okay, 
just to show very briefly the design, you know these kinds of studies, it's maybe not so interesting, but what is interesting is that we gave the, the drink and immediately after we gave the breakfast, a standard breakfast. You could say it's the preload, but, but really it's almost together. Had then all the sampling for three hours and the, the different breakfasts in the three different countries. So we used breakfasts that were typical for each country, uh, not to impose a strange breakfast to a Dane, for instance, that uh, would not be eaten. So these are the results on appetite. So we have hunger, fullness, desire to eat, and prospective intake. And overall, I think it's fair to say that there are no differences. Statistically, there were some differences, but you can see the uh, small effect sizes, so not really anything to, to cry out about. And also, none of these sensations uh, translated into differences in energy intake. We had an interview uh, when they got home the next day, and there were no differences. So what about uh, glycemic and insulinemic responses? So here we do see differences, and not so surprisingly maybe, we see a higher level with the sucrose, after the sucrose uh, condition than with the sweeteners. It's statistically significant with repeated measurements for, for insulin, not for glucose, but when we look at the incremental areas under the curvy, it's uh, significant for both glucose and insulin with the expected uh, higher level of sucrose. Okay, we also wanted to look at something uh, that wasn't really described from the beginning. We wanted to look at the hormone FGF21. So why do we want to do that? Uh, we have seen from literature that sucrose increases the level of FGM, FGF21 sorry, in both people with normal weight or overweight or cardiomyopathy metabolic diseases. It's also been shown in rodents that when you administer FGF21, their preference for sweet uh, stuff uh, decreases. So um, our hypothesis was, in fact, that because it's related to sweet tastes and sweetness in the, in the diet, that FGF21 would increase similarly after sucrose and sweetness. And to our knowledge, this has not studied before in, in human subjects or human participants. So uh, as you have seen already, this is the same design. It's a sub-study from the study I just presented. Now it's in the Danish participants, where we have 19 participants. And what we see is that the uh, FGF21 is increased with sucrose, as has been seen before, but nothing happens after the sweeteners. And this is statistically significant. Um, it, we still are digesting these results, but this is, uh, this is we have seen, so, so really uh, nothing to work further on with, with Danish. And we will also look at this in our long. Uh, so to conclude from this, it doesn't seem that FGF21 is stimulated by sweet taste per se, but it also needs to have the benefit from the sucrose. It's also stimulated by alcohol, by the way, but that was not part. Um, now, it has been claimed <laughs> that non- and low-calorie sweeteners are detrimental to energy homeostasis. We heard about that in the previous presentations of, as well. And there have been many reviews on appetite and energy intake, energy inputs, that do not confirm this. Uh, Peter Rogers and, and co-workers have done excellent reviews in this uh, area uh, previously. But what about the other side of the energy balance, so the energy output? energy expenditure, substrate oxidation, what happens? Also here there have been suggestions that the sweetness could have some detrimental effects uh, with some uh, more or less uh, validated hypothesis uh, explaining it. So we wanted to look at it, make a system on, on uh, sweetness in relation to fasting and postprandial substrate oxidation, energy expenditure, and catecholamines which are involved uh, in uh, energy homeostasis. Uh, we wanted to compare both with energy-containing uh, sweetness, so sucrose, for instance, or with water. And this is a typical flowchart of this that are quite uh, lengthy and time-consuming, I'm sure you, most of you are aware, are aware of. So 
So more than 6,000 studies were screened against title and abstract, and finally we included 20. So uh, <laughs> a lot of work to get to the bottom of this. And um, what we had then were these 20 studies, 16 on substrate oxidation and or energy expenditure, and four only on catecholamines. So just to uh, spare you a lot of text, jump to the conclusion. So with drinks or meals with sweeteners, we see um, higher fat and lower carbohydrate oxidation, caloric sweeteners. So that may not be so surprising, the higher carbohydrate oxidation and lower fat oxidation when you give drinks fat oxidation is higher and carbohydrate oxidation is lower. So we just stated that fact, actually, with this review. We could make no other conclusions, unfortunately. So for instance, uh, comparing with water, because there were too little or insufficient data. So definitely further studies in this research field. So fortunately, anyway, in our randomized uh, control trial um, in Work Package 3, which is, a, well, it was originally a two-year trial, uh, one-year intervention, one-year follow-up, but due to COVID-19, we had to skip follow-up. Recruitment took so long, and uh, intervention took so long because we couldn't have so many participants at the time as we had planned originally. So one-year trial with the eight weeks weight loss phase where participants should lose 5% of their initial, initial body weight, so very much like the, the preview and other intervention studies, weight maintenance phase up to one year. And we have the clinical investigation days after, before, after two months, six months, and 12 months. So we had two intervention arms, uh, both healthy diets. That's important to stress. So it's not extreme diets with a lot of sugar or a lot of sweetness. Healthy diets uh, fulfilling the criteria of less than 10 energy percent added sugar uh, and otherwise uh, following the uh, guidelines from the different countries that were involved. Uh, one arm was allowed, well, well, we encouraged to place all sugar should just continue eating uh, sugar, but below 10 energy percent lists, and to help the participants, I'll show some examples, and about 40 children. We wanted much, many more children, but it was important to recruit more. There was uh, COVID-19 going on. Families were already very um, stressed with everything that was changing, school, schools closing, etc. And also some fear, I think, anxiety about sweetness in some countries that made the families stay away from our trial. But at least we got the adults that we needed. And we have four clinical trial samples, Copenhagen, Tokyo, Athens, Maastricht, and Spain. So our primary endpoints are uh, two. It's for efficacy and for safety. So we have change in body for one year in adults. And we have change in microbiota or microbial beta diversity and composition in adults again after one year. So they are they are safe with the number of adults that we are recruit that we recruited. And then all the different secondary endpoints. We uh, use these exchange lists, uh, properages. These are just examples. Um, and for each country, they had to make an exchange list so it matched the products in the market in that country. So these are examples from the Danish uh, um, foods and drinks. And just an example of cakes and biscuits. So with sugar and with sweetener, what could you choose if you were in the sweetener group and you would have liked to have uh, a Prince roll uh, chocolate biscuit, for instance? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the main results. We are working on the data aiming and we will be able to present it hopefully at FENS in November this year in Beograd, Serbia. But we do have the sub-study on energy metabolism and we find that, um, no, we don't find, we have tested the acute and long-term effect of ASK versus water in this case because we would have sort of predicted the outcome if we had used 
sucrose, so now we wanted to use water as a control. It's a small group, 26 participants, from the one-year trial. And we have uh, used, um, well, tested before, after weight loss, and after weight loss maintenance, to see if there were any difference in response at these different time points. So we had postprandial measurements with the ventilated hood system. We, we also took blood samples and appetite sensations. We gave a standardized right breakfast each time, measured for 120 minutes. Then we either sweetener or water and measured for another 120 minutes. This is shown here. So we can see the effect of the breakfast, which was standardized after uh, weight maintenance, but especially after four months on the intervention diet. And then we gave a test drink, so we could see the effect of the sweetener versus water, also at these time points. Effects of breakfast, effects of test drink, yeah. So I'll just show you one result. Don't take a picture if you wanted to. Um, oxidation acutely after two months weight loss and after four months weight on the intervention diet. We have absolutely no differences in fat oxidation, which was the primary outcome. Also no differences in carbohydrate oxidation or energy expenditure or glucose or insulin. Um, so these were on the different time points with the different conditions, either after a standard breakfast or after a test drink with uh, sweetener or water. We are still looking at the appetite data, so I can't show those. Uh, the final thing I want to show is the uh, life cycle assessment with package three data. So here we wanted to understand the ramifications of replacing with uh, SNFEs or the sweeteners. This is the beautiful work from um, or the life cycle uh, sustainability assessment done by our colleagues and so it's very time consuming and I'll just show you two slides so you don't get the idea of that but to get all the data from the producers, from the manufacturers, from the, well, the factories, wherever. Um, so it's done in the, both in the, in the context of environment, social and economic terms, this analysis or these analyses. And it includes all the steps, raw material extraction somewhere in the jungle maybe through to waste disposal in the, in the households. Very, very comprehensive. And we looked at five sweeteners, stevia glycoside, formatin, sucralose, aspartame, neotame, and one sweetness enhancer, formatin. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, the thing with formatin is that it can replace 20% of the sugar uh, to maintain the sweetness. So not a true non-caloric sweetener in that sense. And what did we see? We saw that, to date, all sweeteners uh, reduce environmental impact when they replace uh, su sucrose with the same sweet taste. So, um, not by gram to gram, because that would show a completely different picture, but sweetness to sweetness unit. Um, and this has been done for drinks and the work on uh, Solid formulas are ongoing, but that takes a much more time because you have to take a lot of other things into consideration. But here we see the results for uh, global warming, biodiversity matter formation, marine eutrophication, land use and water consumption, and they're all much lower than sugar, except for the thormatin, which has this sugar component in it. So, so maybe not so relevant to look at here. Uh, and they are published for stevia and and the other ones are under review at the moment. Concludes. From the acute intervention study in the uh, work package two, there was a neutral or beneficial impact on glycemic control of the plant-based sweeteners that we used and in, compar in comparison with sucrose. And this has the potential to improve glycemic response to a meal without negative effect on appetite or metabolism. And the uh, sub-study showed that FGF21 did not increase by, by the sweeteners, but only by sucrose, as we already did. The long-term intervention study 
we still uh, look forward to the main results, but uh, in our subsidy, we saw that postprandial energy homeostasis was not influenced by sweeteners acutely after weight loss or after weight maintenance. Weight maintenance, not age. Weight loss maintenance. <laughs> um, yeah. And the sustainability analysis showed that sweeteners have a much lower global warming potential. So it's more sustainable than sugar per sweetness unit. And this has been shown in beverages so far. I'd like to thank all my sweet colleagues at Copenhagen and a number of collaborators. And I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you, Anna, for being on time and for a very nice presentation. Uh, we're looking forward to get some more data from the Sweets project in the future. So, and hopefully there will also be some questions in the panel afterwards here. So the next presenter uh, is uh, Dr. Hans uh, Verhagen from the Netherlands, uh, who's been part of the EF EFSA. And uh, the title is Safety on Non-Sugar Sweeteners, Regulating Public Health on Safety Assessment. Please go ahead. Okay, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I have my slides, please? Uh, indeed, my uh, present, uh, presentation today is on safety of non-sugar sweeteners, uh, and the subtitle is Reconciling Public Health and Safety Assessments. And this will be a short introduction into the area of toxicology. The content of my presentation is devoted into three different entities. I will give you the short course in toxicology, hazard and risk, explaining uh, those concepts. Then I will zoom in on non-sugar sweeteners, and also identify new paradigms that we could perhaps uh, use in this uh, area. First, hazard and risk. I'm a toxicologist by training, and I learned a long time ago uh, from the godfather of toxicology, Paracelsus, that the dose, dose makes the poison. You have heard it. All substances are poison, and there is none which is not a poison. The right dose differentiates a poison from a remedy. And here the magic word dose already shows up for the first time. And this is a couple of centuries ago. In layman lang language, it would say that everything is hazardous to your health. Yes, it's a hazard, it's, but is it also a risk? That can be the question. Because if we identify what is the difference between a hazard and a risk, and there's a definition. A hazard is an in, something intrinsic. A hazard is a substance or an activity which has the potential to cause adverse effects to living organisms or environment. So it's a potential. A risk is the possibility that this will happen or not. So a risk is the function of the probability of an adverse health severity of that effect, consen consequential to a hazard. These definitions are not from me, they are from uh, the public domain, EFSA, and uh, the European Commission. And as such, what I learned as a toxicologist is the risk assessment paradigm. It's very simple. You identify the hazard, what is the hazard, then you characterize the hazard, what happens across those levels. Then you, like, then you compare the hazard characterization with exposure in order to catch the risk. Then the work of a toxicologist is done, and you inform the outcome to risk managers, which then turns the risk assessment paradigm into a risk analysis paradigm. The risk assessment paradigm, which I presented in the previous uh, slide, is done by toxicologists, by scientists, etc. It's a scientific endeavor, nothing more. The risk manager takes a decision, a risk management decision, on the basis of the information coming from the risk assessment uh, part. And both entities are also in involved in risk communication, which is a separate uh, um, aspect, the third aspect within the risk analysis paradigm. This is not new. It was developed already by the World Health Organization in the previous uh, century. I already alluded to the concept of dose. Dose is related to response. What happens across those levels? And this is a basic drawing from toxicology. 
as you, or when you have a new compound, for, for instance, a low-calorie sweetener, uh, but also other uh, compounds, environmental compounds, medicines, foods, uh, uh, et cetera, you identify typically in animal studies, rat studies, mice studies, uh, at what happens across those levels. At some point in time, everything is stuck, I already alert, uh, alluded uh, to, and you identify in a rat study what is the so-called no observed adverse effect level. That's the dose level, typically in milligrams per kilogram body weight, that is not showing any effect. And you assume that the no observed adverse effect level as identified in animal species is also the no effect level in humans because we look like rats or rats look like us, etc. But in order to be a bit more confident on the outcome of exposure, we apply so-called interspecies variation, uh, safety factors for interspecies variation and interest variation. A man is not similar to a rat or the other way around and men are not all the same. So overall safety factors are applied to cover up for inter and intraspecies. You have a no observed effect level identified in rat studies at maybe 100 milligrams per kilogram body weight. The final safe, do that is already the dose without an effect in animal studies. The dose that is certainly without uh, an, any effect in humans is divided by the safety factor, for instance, 100 which then leads to the concept, I think that's relevant, because we'll come back, of acceptable daily intake. This slide is pivotal in my presentation because the acceptable daily intake is, let's say, a factor of 100 below the dose level that is without effects already in animal, st in animal studies. So this certainly must be without any presumed effect in humans. The acceptable daily intake, it's an invention of the World Health Organization, because they identified the acceptable daily intake as the daily chemical, which during an entire lifetime, day after day after day, appears to be without appreciable risk on the basis of all known facts at that time. And that was already identified in 1962. So this is the acceptable daily intake. So you had a crash course on toxicology. And now we're going to apply it to the area of non-sugar sweeteners. And I took a list of what non-sugar sweeteners we have in, uh, in the world, in the European Union. Here there's a list of what we have in the European Union, E numbers, E step for European, and we have uh, many of them that were already uh, appearing in the previous presentations, etc. so you know these uh, stuff. And they have uh, nice chemical structures, as you can see to the right, and they look like white powder, uh, which to some people may suggest that they must be dangerous because they're white powder, etc. But I cannot mention. Okay, there's a series of non-nutritive sweeteners in the European Union, which have been approved on the basis of the concept that I just presented. Animal studies identifying no observed effect, adverse effect levels, applying safety factors, and calculating the actual daily intake. Here are some examples of uh, low calorie sweeteners with acceptable daily intakes. For instance, the start same, the E951, etc. I will not read the table in all the details, has an acceptable daily intake of 40 milligrams per kilogram body weight. So uh, if you consume 40 milligrams per kilogram body weight, multiply it by a body weight of 70 kilograms on average, even though I'm speaking for an obesity conference, okay? But, uh, this is the acceptable daily intake for aspartame. HK, it's nine, cyclamide is seven, and so on, and so on. These all have been established. And let's then translate these values of acceptable daily intakes. How much do I need to consume on a daily basis in order to achieve this acceptable daily intake? For instance, aspartame from the previous slides, and I'll take it back, an acceptable daily body weight translates into, for an adult, liters of beverage a day. Of course, it needs to take into account also the sweetening purposes, etc. You need to drink at least four liters a day during your entire lifetime in order to achieve a dose that is 100 below the no effect level. 
So if you would achieve no effect level, you ha would have to drink uh, by reverse engineering, reverse calculation, why it's not done by toxicologists, but you would have to drink 400 liters a day in order to achieve a dose that is without, e without effect. So the four liters or the one, whatever you take, is certainly without any effects. And also, for, uh, likewise, for the, other for the other sweeteners. Let's zoom in on two low-calorie sweeteners. I have aspartame and steviol, just as an example. This is aspartame, has a nice chemical structure. We know it, it's two amino acids linked together in an unusual way, and methanol. So we know aspartame. The information on aspartame I derived from the EFSA website, which published its latest opinion in 2013, that's uh, 10 years uh, ago. Uh, you find a wealth of information on the safety of aspartame on that uh, website, and I'll give you an extra. EFSA has published a, a frequently asked questions uh, page on aspartame. Say, what is aspartame? It's a low calorie sweetener, uh, 200 times sweetener, sucrose, okay, that's what you know. Did EFSA ever use safety? Oh, yes. Already in uh, 1984, then it was a scientific committee on food, the predecessor of uh, EFSA. And again in 2006 and 2009 and 2011 and 2013, etc. So EFSA has done many, many of these uh, scientific evaluations. It is, was also questioned 10 years ago. Um, so if aspartame is safe, why reevaluating? Now, that's a con ongoing continuum. Let's say every uh, couple of years there's a law that uh, food additives, including aspartame, should be. Now, that the latest one has happened uh, in 2013, the additive that was, uh, let's say, put first in the row. There have been questions about aspartame. If you look on at the end, you can say, oh, aspartame is, uh, is certainly carcinogenic, and it is this and this and bad, etc. No, it's not true, but okay. You, you can readily find a lot of information on the internet. I didn't put that in my presentation because I don't like it. There have been questions uh, raised because the safety has sparked interest and controversy. Scientific evidence, however, is sufficient to confirm that aspartame is safe. 2013 latest evaluation, and uh, EFSA is constantly guaranteeing uh, the scientific advice uh, by independent scientists, etc. So it, they do a good job. Okay, let's look at another uh, low calorie sweetener, stevia. Steviol glyc glycosides, they come from a plant in the uh, uh, South America. Uh, it also has a chemical structure, which uh, you can see uh, here. This has uh, progressed over time a little bit uh, different. In 1999, Scientific Committee on Food, it's the predecessor of EFSA, uh, said this substance is not acceptable as a sweetener on the presently available data. So there were just not enough data. So the uh, the, there was a new application a couple of years uh, later, um, uh, not in Asia, same, at the same time, uh, the information at that time was still in condition. It was tried again in 2010 by a stronger dossier with more information, more safety studies, etc. On the basis of that new dossier, updated dossier, EFSA concluded positively, said yes, it's safe under the proposed conditions of use, which then lets the European Commission uh, authorize stevia, stevial glycosides as food additives in 2011. The data and uh, that follows the same paradigm that I had uh, with, the, uh, with the figure uh, a couple of slides ago. Said EFSA concluded that there is an acceptable daily intake for stevial glycosides expressed as stevial equivalents. Okay, that's a bit uh, chemistry uh, behind this. Based on an application fact, an uh, application of an uncertainty factor of 100. Okay, we had 10 times 10 for intra and interspecies uh, variation. In a two-year carcinogenicity study of rats at 2.5% of steviol in the diet, leading not to any adverse effects, leading not to carcinogenicity, etc. And that 2.5% uh, two, two of steviosides in the diet was comparable to almost 400 milligrams of steviol equivalents in the diet, safety factor of 400 
divided by 100 leads to four milligrams per kilogram body weight a day. So simple dump. That's it. Okay, this is a bit of basic toxicology applied to low calorie sweeteners, and I'm looking out now to some new paradigm because that's what I was invited uh, to. Here, I was happy to hear already the words in the previous presentation. Thank you, Anna. Uh, risk benefit. Uh, which is the topic of my professorship, uh, I have to say. I'm involved in risk-benefit already for two dec decades. It is gaining momentum in science now, to not only looking at uh, risks, not only looking at benefits, but combined. Uh, there's a lot of projects in this area. I will not spell them out uh, to you in detail, but actually it started more or less in 2004 with a publication by the International Life Sciences uh, Europe, uh, risk-benefit. E many, many EU projects, and so on, and so on. Now there's a whole uh, wealth of uh, scientists uh, working in the area of risk-benefit. Benefit as such, and that's outside of the uh, area of uh, low-calorie sweetness, but I'll, I'll zoom back uh, in due course, has more than 100 applications published today, of which uh, three quarters are in the area of uh, fish. Fish and uh, mental performance, uh, mental development, uh, etc but also in many other areas. And here you can see that risk-benefit is really of interest. But also in the area of uh, low, cal low or no calorie sweetness versus sugar. And here I would like to present the paper that I published uh, a bit more than a decade ago, where we made uh, a pr project Bravo, a comparison of sugar or no calorie sweetness putting both on the balance. In short, what we did, what are the potential benefits of low calorie sweeteners? And let's say uh, the, all the information that was presented this morning can feed into an update of this uh, regulation. I'm now reflecting on what we did more than a decade ago. There were a lot of potential benefits, reduced energy intake, body weight, carriers, uh, etc. Okay. The, the level of evidence uh, that can be revisited. The risks, uh, as we identified, were none. There's, the risk is in the public perception. It's certainly carcinogenic, etc. It's not, but in the public perception, there is a risk. Acceptable daily intakes have been established. And there were, in those, those days, a long series of well-established non-effects on cardiovascular cancer, diabetes, gout, etc. Et so what we did, in the risk-benefit uh, project Bravo, we said, okay, when we're looking at risk-benefits, we kick out the, the, those effects that are not there. We also kick out the risks because there's no risk there. So in this simple equation of risk-benefit assessment only, that it's worthwhile to look at the potential benefits. Okay, that was 2012. Now look, what could these days? I heard the word uh, uncertainty a lot uh, this morning, low evidence, uh, uncertainty, etc. What we could do to revisit uh, risk benefit of low calorie sweeteners is look at what, I, what is the real comparator. And the real comparator could be sucrose or sugar. Uh, and um, here I took an overview of what EFSA published uh, with the, about a year ago. What are the public health effects of sugar consumption? And here I have to say, there is not much there. There's many effects in this um, uh, scheme identified, and it says the real adverse effects of sugar intake are confined to beverages. That's for sure. In, for carriers and other weight management, etc. All the other health, benefit, uh, health risks of uh, sugar, nil level of scientific evidence. Which then to what can we do when revisiting the safety of low calorie sweeteners? Uh, the comparator, which is uh, sugar, and uh, wi for which there is only high certainty for sugar sweetened beverages. A risk benefit study looking at public health consequences, disability just uh, would comprise, could comprise uh, low or no calorie sweeteners versus please do not start a fight against sugar because the real culprit, sugar, is not such a culprit. The evidence is not there. So 
don't try to, let's say, provide benefit for low-calorie sweeteners. As there's, there's little uh, evidence for sugar as such. Fo so focus or restrict your risk-benefit endeavor, a new one, uh, towards uh, sh uh, <coughs> sugar-sweetened beverages, not other foods. Okay, this brings me to my last, uh, except for thank you, slide. I'm a toxicologist and a nutritionist, and we have learned to argue in a different way. As a toxicologist, I have been learned, let's argue away from high dose levels where we see effects, where we see adverse effects, and calculate towards effects that are without any effect, like acceptable daily intakes, etc. as I explained. But as a nutritionist, we need to look the other way around. We want things to happen. So uh, arguing away from too low dose levels where nothing happens until we achieve dose levels where something happens. And this is underlying the science of risk-benefit assessment. At this stage, I would say thank you for your attention, and I hand back to, uh, to the chair of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Right on time. Thank you. So continuing along with the displacement of sugar-sweetened beverages and non-nutritive uh, sweeteners, um, so, um, the next presenter is going to talk about a pro protocol analysis of strategies to oppose sugars with non-nutritive sweeteners or water. Sabrina? Thank you, Ayub Dr. Charet, uh, PhD candidate with uh, Johns uh, University of Toronto. Welcome. Thank you. I'm uh, standing on the shoulders of giants and they've set up my presentation very nicely. So I'm gonna breeze through the introduction a little bit. <laughs> a lot of the topics are the same. Here are my conflicts of interest. So we all have heard that sweetened beverages are the leading contributors of the type 2 diabetes and obesity epidemic. It has about 42 grams of sugar, which contributes to about 8% of energy for your 2,000 calorie diet. And because of this, uh, the various health organizations make recommendations to reduce uh, added sugars to less than 10% of energy and to replace sugar sweetened beverages with water. But if you ask a regular sugar sweetened beverage consumer if they prefer to switch their sugary drink for uh, flavorless water, uh, they probably would prefer to keep drinking the sugary drink. Um, and that's where non-nutritive sweetened beverages come into play. So these are sweetened by the non-nutritive sweeteners or low no-calorie sweeteners. There's various names that are used throughout the, uh, the field. Uh, and they contribute 0% of energy because uh, they have no sugar in them. Uh, various the same health organizations have very contradicting recommendations on the use of non-nutritive sweeteners to replace sugars, as we've seen with uh, Dr. Khan and Dr. Siegenpiper. Um, I've made a mistake on this slide, but the dietikins uh, do recommend uh, replacing sugars with, uh, uh, with non-nutritive sweeteners. So a lot of controversy on this field. Um, there's also a lot of uh, diversity in the non-nutritive sweeteners themselves. They all have very different pharmacokinetic uh, dynamics in the body. Uh, they're all metabolized and absorbed differently um, and move throughout the bodies in different ways, and they have different ADI values as well. But they've all been deemed to say, as uh, the last speaker has outlined for us. There's a, been substantial... Um, discussion on maybe mechanisms on the effect of non-nutritive sweeteners on health outcomes um, and for the risk of diabetes specifically for my project. Um, one of the major mechanisms that is in, uh, in the public eye is the gut microbiome. And this uh, comes from the 2014 Suez Nature Study, uh, which showed negatives of negative effects after saccharin exposures uh, over seven days in uh, healthy participants in a before and after study. Um, since then, though, there's been more studies that come out that uh, do not replicate these original results, but then there's been other studies that came out more recently in 2022 that do replicate these results. So overall, right now in the state of the field, we have three studies uh, showing an effect on the gut microbiome and three studies showing no effect on the gut microbiome or glucose tolerance. So very controversial. Um, but these studies all have a limitation, and this is where I'll, the Stop Sugars Now trial will address these limitations. So they're using very, very high doses of non-nutritive sweeteners. Um, 
in most studies. There are some more recent studies that are using more moderate doses to kind of offset those uh, uh, considerations. Uh, they're also studying non nutritive sweeteners in isolations where we know that the uh, market uh, in Canada and in Europe and in the US as well, um, the largest source of non nutritive sweeteners are non nutritive sweetened beverages. And most non nutritive sweetened beverages are sweetened by a blend of non nutritive sweeteners to offset some of the characteristics of a single individual um, non nutritive sweetener. And they're also looking at non nutritive sweeteners um, either in a packet form or dissolved in water, uh, which is not looking at real food sources that contain non nutritive sweeteners. Um, a, a person is not is consuming non nutritive sweeteners in the form of a, a food, a non nutritive sweetened beverage, usually. And they're not answering the question of the effect of non nutritive sweeteners in the intended uh, replacement for sugars and sugary beverages. So this is where the Stop Sugars Now uh, trial comes in. We are interested in the effect of non nutritive sweetened beverages when replacing sugars from sugar-sweetened beverages on glucose tolerance and the gut microbiome uh, in longer interventions and in a pragmatic uh, way. So um, we are assessing the effect of replacing sugar-sweetened beverages with non nutritive sweetened beverages or water on our two primary outcomes of plasma glucose incremental area under the curve uh, and changes in gut microbiome beta diversity, and our five secondary outcomes, which uh, support the, the primary outcomes over five participants. Uh, this is a CI to oppose sugars with non nutritive sweeten sweeteners or water trial. It's a randomized triple crossover trial with a four week intervention phase and four week washout phases between the interventions. Um, and as I said, we're uh, um, assessing the effect of replacing sugar spin beverages with the intended replacement or the standard of care. So we recruited 80 overweight or obese regular sugar sweetened beverage consumers um, after these and uh, eligibility assessment. Um, they were enrolled for their first visit where we collected beverage logs, uh, whole fecal samples, 24 hour urine samples, um, diet, three day diet records, uh, weighed three day diet records. Um, then the participant was randomized to one of three interventions. Um, it is a crossover study, so each participant did all three interventions, but the sequence was randomized between the interventions. And the three interventions were either the participant continues on their usual sugar sweetened beverage intake. So if somebody drinks Coke, they would continue to drink Coca Cola during the sugar sweetened beverage phase. Uh, the non nutritive sweetened beverage was brand matched and dose matched to uh, baseline intake. So a person drinking one can of Coke would get one can of Diet Coke or Coke Zero. Uh, and then the water was as well a uh, dose match. So we had the, them drinking these mini bottles of, of water. This allows us to um, assess the three uh, comparisons of public health importance, uh, the intended substitution with energy displacement, the standard of care substitution with energy displacement, and the reference substitution without energy displacement. Um, these are the exact same uh, comparisons that were included in the network meta-analysis by uh, Dr. or sorry, by Nema McGlynn, uh, who graduated with us a few years back, and John was showing her results earlier. So as I said, we have two primary outcomes, and we are powered both primary outcomes. Uh, changes in plasma glucose, uh, as assessed by a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test, and the weighed unifract distance for microbiome beta diversity. We have five secondary outcomes as well. Uh, I, this is the power calculation, uh, and as I said, we are powered for both outcomes. Um, today, I'm very excited to show our um, per protocol analysis, and I have as well some dietary uh, intake data for you. Uh, well, our primary analysis was done with repeated measures, linear mixed models. Uh, we controlled for pairwise comparisons, or sorry, we conducted the pairwise con comparisons with the two Kramer adjustment. Uh, and um, this trial completion during COVID. Uh, the microbiome analysis is still ongoing, but it will be done with CHIME 2, and we have some subgroup insensitivity analyses uh, planned as well. So to define our per protocol sample, we decided to go with, uh, they had to be completers of the trials. They had to be 60% adherent to all th uh, three intervention phases. And um, we defined a treatment crossover 
uh, variable. So they could not have uh, contamination over their um, water and non nutritive sweetened beverage intervention on more than 20% of the days of their one month intervention. So that's about six days. On to the results. So we started the trial in 2018. The last participant completed in 2020. We had uh, 80 participants randomized. There were 66 participants that completed the trial and there was 45 participants that met our per protocol definition. Here are the baseline characteristics of, our, of the full uh, sample. Um, about 42 years old, mean age, uh, equals males and females, uh, and overweight or obese BMI as per our eligibility criteria. Um, here are the waist circumference and fasting plasma glucose. And um, out of the people that were taking medication, there was 19 people taking medications, most of them uh, or had multiple medications use. Uh, most participants at baseline drink Coca-Cola, uh, ginger ale, and Pepsi, and that means during the non-nutritive sweetened beverage phases, they would drink these equivalent non-nutritive sweetened beverages. The average intake was about two cans per day, that's 355 milliliters, so uh, seven, 10 milliliters uh, per day. But there was a, quite a range from one to five. So um, as I mentioned, most non-nutritive sweetened beverages uh, across the world are sweetened by a blend of aspartame and acesulfame potassium. Uh, so in our trial, we have a representative sample of what, it's, what is available on the Canadian market, in the global market. Um, at baseline, participants consumed about 50% carbs, 35% fat, and 15% protein as percentage. Uh, here is from the 66 completers of the trial, their adherence. There was about 100% um, mean or median and mean adherence uh, in all three of the intervention phases. And on to the outcome. So for our per protocol analysis done on the 45 uh, per protocol uh, participants, we saw no changes in incremental uh, area under the curve for plasma glucose. Microbiome beta diversity is still ongoing. I'm excited to share that with you soon. For our secondary outcomes, there was no changes in waist circumference, no changes in body weight. Uh, we did see a decrease in fasting plasma glucose in the per protocol sample when sugar sweetened beverages were replaced by either non nutritive sweetened beverages or with water, with no changes in the reference substitution. Uh, no changes in two-hour fasting plasma glucose, and no changes in the Matsuda insulin sensitivity index. For the dietary intake, um, during non nutritive beverages and the water phases, we saw decreases in energy. Uh, we also saw decreases in carbohydrates and sugar intake. And we saw increases, or sorry, between the ba baseline and the sugar-sweetened beverage group, we saw no changes. And we saw increases in fat and protein intake during the non sweet beverage or water intake, which suggests possible compensation in energy. Uh, when looking at sugars from uh, liquid versus uh, solid form, we only saw decreases in sugars from beverages during the non sweet sweetened beverages and the water phase, which uh, to me indicates that the participants were doing what they were advised to do. So we had several strengths and limitation. For the sake of time, I will move on, but I'm happy to go to it in more details later. And on to the conclusions. So under pragmatic conditions, our non-nutritive sweetened beverages reduce fasting plasma glucose when replacing sugar sweetened beverages. And both water and non-nutritive sweetened beverages may provide helpful strategies in sugar reduction strategies. Uh, and our results are supportive of current guidelines, uh, which recommend to replace sugar sweetened beverages with water. Thank you so much for your attention, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for sharing those results, and uh, good luck with the rest of the analysis. Um, Jenny Brand Miller has generously given up her time for the next presentation in favor of us finishing in time for lunch, but also we have 15 minutes for questions and discussion. I think we like the presenter to come up here in front. Sorry, we did, that's not what we've been told. <laughs> Sorry, come up. Um, 
and we'll see if this, um, I was called on Monday um, that I should be giving a presentation now. Okay, yay, that seems to be working. Um, yes, My in the program, in some of the programs, it says that I'm working at the Charité, which is not true. I'm working at Paramount University. And I'll just briefly try to give you a short talk because I know you're all waiting for lunch. So this is dealing with glycemic response to meals with a high glycemic index that are either in the morning or in the evening. And um, <clears throat> these are my conflicts of interest. And uh, in terms of the background, just very quickly, there's two different issues. One was already raised this morning from uh, my clean that um, we do, of course, see a deonorrhythmic glucose homeostasis. In the evening, glucose tolerance is higher than it is in the morning, and it has been shown in a few studies that if you consume an energetical meal in the morning and in the evening, that consuming the meal in the evening have a, a will affect postprandial glucose response more adversely than consuming it in the morning. And the second background refers to your inner clock. And I'd like to just show you this little graph here, which illustrates the chronotype, which is measured as a mid uh, midpoint of sleep. So if you have little children, you will know that they do come to you really early in the morning. When, and once you have adolescents, you notice that they go to bed after you. And this peaks at age 21. So the midpoint of sleep is latest at age 21 in men. And uh, what it means here is it's, it's 5.30 in the morning is the midpoint of sleep. So if a person sleeps for eight hours, it would go to bed at 1.30, get, uh, get up at 9.30. And this is already adjusted for um, <clears throat> making up sleep deficits during the week. So this is sort of the natural, um, uh, how, it, uh, how it changes naturally during your life. So as we get older, um, we are starting to become earlier chronotypes again. But based on that, it means if it peaks in early adulthood, then people at um, this age are at risk for the discrepancies between their inner clock and what social schedules such as schools and institutions and university are opposing. And this may extend also to the consumption. We've shown that in a few a previous study that young adults are vulnerable to consume against their biological, consume their meals against their biologically later chronotype. So, uh, and it has been shown in very elegant experiment by the group of uh, Professor Shear that um, this could also entail some circadian misalignment. And the proposal is that having a breakfast too early, if you are a later chronotype, that could be at risk. So, this was the background for this study and the objectives are um, <clears throat> to compare the, um, the primary outcome was two hour postprandial glycemic response um, and the other diurnal glycemic responses were secondary outcomes to uh, consuming a high GI meal either early in the morning at 7 a.m. or late in the evening at 8 p.m. which for some late early chronotypes is late. And to answer that, we are we trying to find two distinct samples, students with an early chronotype and students with a late chronotype. And in order to do that, we screened um, over 300 students um, just before the COVID pandemic and um, did a lot of different questions. And this also included a questionnaire on their chronotype. And from that, um, we then selected the ones with the earliest and the latest chronotype, invited them to participate in a crossover design. And you can see that um, the arms are either having the high GI meal first in the morning and then in the evening or the other way around. Um, and in both of these arms, we had half early chronotypes and half late chronotypes. Um, we were able to... Um, analyze the day five participants who um, participated all the way to the end in this trial. The high GI meal um, was uh, consisted of, um, we wanted it to be really high, so it just have a meal GI um, that is uh, 72 and it contained cornflakes with milk and soft pretzels, which is one of four breads from Germany that we had tested in Jenny's lab. Unfortunately, though we do have a lot of uh, different breads and rolls, we have we do not have the dry of these wonderful 
German um, breads, but most of them have a high GI, and the soft breads are particularly high GI. Um, all other meals um, at prescribed times that had to be consumed, uh, meals had a meal, uh, a medium GI, uh, me meal GI between 48 and 58. Um, participants wore a monitor system and we um, had um, chronotype assessed by the questionnaire accelerometers. So these are the characteristics. Um, you can see that they were fairly healthy because they're young students and uh, they have a mean BMI of 22 and their age is 22 as well. You could see that we were able to find quite separate um, samples. So the early chronotype people, they have a midpoint of sleep at around 3.30 and the later chronotype a midpoint of sleep at around 6. Um, so it is what you see that uh, we cast um, two and a half hours of difference. And we had a chance to also measure those who, uh, when they came to have their blood withdrawn um, at the uh, <coughs> time when they were, had uh, the um, CG and status of intervention. And uh, this was always around 8 a.m. And you can see that the earlier chronotypes already had lower melatonin levels when they came to see their types. So in times of falling asleep, this means early chronotypes go to bed around shortly before 11 and um, a little later on three days and later chronotypes do go to bed uh, roughly two and a half hours later. Wake up time is quite different too, uh, both on wake days and on three days. Please keep in mind that this was um, during uh, lectures being had online mostly, so the people did have the possibilities to sleep longer um, at that time. So um, for all of the um, glycemic response variables, we checked whether there was an interaction um, of the intervention with uh, chronotype. That was the case for several outcomes, so I'm presenting stratified analysis. Um, so this is the main outcomes that we have, and the study was powered for this. Um, and here you can see um, that what you know from the literature, that the two-hour um, area under the curve uh, is higher in when you consume the high than when you consume it, consume it in the morning. Keep in mind that we try to have the second meal effect by having all other meals with a medium GI. So this is in confirming the what you know from the literature, whereas in the later chronotypes, basically did not see a difference. Um, <clears throat> so morning and evening response to the same meal was comparable in later chronotypes. And this was not only seen for the main outcome, but also for mean glucose and lowest glucose values. You can see that um, taking from, uh, and the p values are taken from mixed linear regression models, and you can see that um, there was a difference for these variables, or at least the trend in early chronotype in line with um, what you know from the literature whereas that was not really seen for later chronotypes. So for them, it was fairly identical. Um, we also had a chance to look at whether melatonin may have something to do with this. So um, you can see to our postprandial area under the curve does have an so the higher the melatonin level at 8 a.m. is, the higher the postprandial. And um, when we also wanted to see whether this extends to the 24-hour period, and here we see a similar picture, all by, by trends only, that uh, for earlier chronotypes, this still tends to um, <coughs> desire um, highest glucose value, lowest glucose value, and uh, also, um, let me see, I mean glucose. Um, for earlier chronotypes, but nothing for later. Just one um, remark aside, that was not any, uh, any major um, uh, aspect of this study, but we think it's really interesting here in this study, uh, slide, you can see uh, the blue lines is when they received the high GI meal 
uh, in the evening, and um, in comparison, the evening meal with the medium GI is, is the orange line. And you can see that in both earlier and chronotypes, postprandial glycemia after high GI meal remains elevated for approximately five hours when compared to the medium GI. So here are my conclusions. Um, we do see uh, what we know from the literature only for earlier chronotypes um, that may be explained by what's known from the literature, but in addition, some of them might already have experienced some circadian myths a lot meal was too late, um, whereas we did not see something for that, like that, for, and we believe that uh, the early morning meal uh, indicates circadian misalignment, and our melatonin levels do support that assumption. And in terms of the public health, um, if this is to be replicated, we really have to say that social breakfast for persons with later chronotypes, and because at the moment um, they either skip their breakfast or consume it too early. And of course, for both later and earlier chronotypes, having a high GI meal late at night is not a good idea. Any question later on, please keep in mind that I do wear hearing aids and I'm also going to have problems out on the hall. Yes, other people in the room do too. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. I'm sorry for the, the, the bit of the stone and standing here. But I think uh, if the presenter will come up in front here, you'd have the opportunity to ask some questions. I think there must be a lot of questions. Uh, with this very nice presentation you've just been through here. Yeah. I, I could start, uh, Khan, Mr. Mr. Khan. Um, weren't you a little bit surprised when you saw the, the recommendation from, from the WHO, especially also when you presented that they, in fact they could see some uh, weight loss uh, in many of the meta-analyses they were doing and presenting? And also the conclusion they did at the end, they also say that there is a, 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 a evident, evidence for, for weight loss. So what, what were your personal opinion when you saw this new recommendation coming out for the WHO? <clears throat> yeah, so I, I, the issue is that uh, there is enough data in the trials to show that it, it supports weight loss. Uh, um, on its own, it was also especially when you replace sugars and uh, there's caloric reduction and, and sugar reduction. Um, the cohort studies have always been shown to have an issue of reverse causality and that's well, well established and I think many, this is a consensus in the community, and especially non-sugar research, that uh, more robust methods are needed. So WHO actually took uh, put more weight to uh, and gave more weight to um, to these cohort studies, which are prevalent, which which actually show uh, which, which which are prone to these uh, prone to causality. The the surprising part is that to to give a recommendation of not to use something which is being used around the world, you need to have enough credible evidence that it has a very some substantial risk of harm. But it's, it's based on a very, I, I would say, very flimsy evidence uh, and, and giving more um, weight to cohort studies also is very questionable. So I was very surprised when it came out. When, when the, it was well done, I was, I was happy. And I was expecting the, the, the guidelines to actually show that, okay, there are some questions, but of course, uh, uh, they have a role in replace, uh, in reducing uh, sh uh, excess sugar intake, but then it, it uh, the the guideline was okay. Do not use it. So that was very surprising. We have to remember it's also assist as uh, uh, this recommendation. So it's it's con it's a condensedly a way they have been performed this one here. So it's not what you can say the final one because they have they already know that this population they're looking into could be a problem in that regard. So uh, I think uh, the, the recommendation here is a condition being made. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, my name is Sabita Sudama Mutu from the Netherlands. Question actually related to what was asked by the chairman to Tosif and John. Um, isn't there uh, not a time when WHO invites us to respond and then say whether they have critis criticism about you know what uh, they have come up with? Because now I damage with these conflicting me messages uh, that uh, news. Uh, article 15 of May tells us not to use it, and we all actually agree. If I look at all your presentation, it shouldn't have been like that. So, what are you about that? Well, short answer: uh, Tosif did submit a comment detailing these, and now we're going to publish it. But they, they didn't act on the comments; they just punted it down the road for the next iteration. I think looks like. But there was a public hearing. I remember I saw the comments. Yeah, they weren't in there. You can see the comments. Yeah. You can access the comments online, but they didn't um, address the. Yeah. Uh, the for the presentation, uh, just want to echo what you said earlier. I was also surprised by the WHO recommendations and read the meta analysis very carefully. I think um, if you know that this from kind of uh, cautionary principle point of view, there is evidence of harm, then that should be uh, in terms of public health recommendations. So that's the only justification I can think of in terms of their recommendations because the cautionary principle is most important principle in public health recommendation. But I think this is somewhat different situation because um, the recommendation for um, artificial sweeteners has not been universally uh, recommended to the general public for reducing weight. It has always been recommended for people who are regular uh, SSB consumers as a replacement. So that's why I think the present this cautionary is not applicable to the WHO recommendation. But I, I think that's the only justification I can think of. Um, in terms of the meta-analysis, immediately we noticed, I mean, multiple problems. As John mentioned earlier, I mean, we did very careful analysis looking at changes in uh, uh, SBs and the changes in body weight with three large cohorts, more than this, we found that people who increased their um, age actually had moderate uh, reduction in terms of weight gain, because we're not talking about weight loss, we're talking about weight gain, everyone gaining weight. And what we found is that increased the diet soda intake every four years, there is moderate reduction in, in, in weight gain, which is positive outcome. And uh, the problem is that uh, this, I mean, paper published in New England Journal of Medicine was not included in the, in the meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the major um, omission of most important evidence in this area from uh, a large mm -hmm. prospective studies. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Mike was the next uh, person. I'm, I'm sort of a bit of a nihilist here, but we've, having been coming to these meetings for 40 years, we've had the same discussion at pretty much every one, concluding that the evidence is not... If there is an effect on body weight, it's tiny. It's, it's less than one kilogram, I think, from everything you showed us. Uh, the second recommendation to reduce sugar intake or to keep it below 10% was based on dental caries, not on evidence on body weight. And I think we probably might have got the whole thing out of perspective and, and sort of missing the elephant in the room again and again. This is not the big issue when we're trying to get on top of the feast. And, and within this, and as you mentioned already, the WHO recommend does not refer to people with type 2 diabetes or risk of diabetes. So I just wonder how much of an, an issue this whole thing is. But I have a question, which I don't know who can answer this. But coming from a background where sweetness was taken on Sundays occasionally, you know, in terms of a sweetie after lunch, one sweetie, not a bar, or, and 
you know, sweetened drinks were not part of my upbringing. It, it, they didn't happen um, beyond the age of about 11 or 12. And an observation, I don't know if it's a true observation, is that most people, as they go through something like puberty or become teenagers, develop a taste for non-sweet things. Young children, breast milk is very sweet, and we understand why physiologically young children, babies, seek sweetness. Teenagers, as boys become men, look for beer, which is bitter, sour, and prefer it to sweet drinks, or wine, in the case of some of our speakers, um, and which is not sweet. So I, I don't know what, what has driven this, this um, unless it's the sugar industry, and we have to you know, be careful about this, but why this necessity to have sweetness everywhere, even to the extent now you get off an airplane in Newark Airport, and the whole, whole airport tastes sweet because you've got people making donuts or something. The whole place is sweet. Put your finger on it, it tastes sweet. And this is, this is a new phenomenon, and I just think we're pursuing something which is unphysiological and unnatural. And I'm happy to keep to the 10%. Does anybody know about physiological exception? Is it, is it a real phenomenon? Have we corrupted it by putting this in everything? Thank you very much, Mike. Anna, did you have comments? I, I think you're right, Mike. Uh, it, we, we, usually you have this decline in sweet preference. This is not really my expertise uh, area, but, but that's what we know from literature. So what has happened, but uh, I guess the WHO want to, to go back the, the time and actually do what you suggest or what you think maybe we should do. Uh, reduce everything but sweet because it's not something we need. But how is that? Well, I mean, if you change, and, and our patients can do this, if you stop taking or sweetness in everything, your food tastes bad for one week, it tastes completely normal again because your palate changes. And I, I think it's, it's, it's just a normal physiology, but we're trying to beat it with, with products that obviously are sold for another purpose. Okay, I'm running out of steam, and I'm going to get shot by somebody very soon if I don't sit down. Actually, my, my question goes in that same direction because uh, now we're talking about on your tool level, but uh, if we uh, put this on a more public and seeing at least in the EU is um, that there are a lot of products now sugar is re reduced uh, or part of the sugar has been replaced for a non sweetness. So uh, this is even more so, so it's even more prevalent. Should we be taking, um, what should we be doing? What kind of evidence do we need to, uh, is this what we want or is it not what we want? <laughs> so the, I think the guideline actually, so the so, so one uh, coming back to Mike, uh, so they actually said it does not apply to people with pre-existing type 2 diabetes, but people at risk of diabetes, it applies to them. So secondly, the issue now is that uh, WHO, uh, anyway, they, they actually, in the, recommendation, in the guideline, they actually say that the sugar reduction strategy has been quite successfully going on uh, since 2015. However, uh, the, 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 the issue is a lot of people in a lot of countries have switched, uh, and many people have switched, it's population in many countries have switched to locally sweetened beverages or locally sweeteners. Uh, suddenly WHO comes and says, no, we reduce sweetness for you from sugars, now you can't have this also. And there's no way out. So that was a strategy which was taken away. And I know, for example, in Middle East, uh, I was recently there, they have a huge type 2 diabetes and obesity problem. And they like this sweet thing. You can't just change the whole population, okay, don't take sweetness, uh, sweet things. So um, uh, they were looking at a strategy, sugar uh, through reformulation of food. And, and the only way to do that, uh, to reduce the sugar content, is to replace with uh, non-sugar sweeteners. But now non-sugar sweeteners are, WHO says don't use it. Now, now what do we do? What do they do now? So that's the that's the problem. The strategy itself has been taken away, and uh, I think they want to beat it with a stick as well, rather than than, than trying to. Uh, and the behavior change. Uh, and WHO in that report actually said that people, uh, but because there are risks associated with non sugar sweeteners uh, regarding malady and CBD, those risks actually would, would 
push the employer to change their behavior. It's a very strange statement to say. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that and add to Mike's comment too. If you look at what Jim Hill and Rena Wing have done with the weight control registries, people that are successful with major weight loss, uh, and when they've done surveys, the majority do identify low calorie sweeteners as a way of decreasing calories and think that they, they've held, not all of them obviously, but there is a subset that certainly I think would benefit from that. And when you survey the population on why they consume them, it is energy. And so I think that that is, you know, for some, that's part of their values and preferences. But I think of them as transition foods, like we think about some of the plant-based alternatives as you try to transition them to a more whole food plant-based diet, in this case, maybe a less sweet um, diet um, for those people that need it. <clears throat> That's what I mean by missing the elephant in the room. There was a subset, but the weight control registry, the ones who were successful were those who walked 15,000 steps every day and who had a very high carbohydrate intake, 70%, up to 70%. So I think you're missing the, the elephant in the room by tilting at the sugar sweetened beverages and sugar thing. I think the biggish hem, and these are pretty unusual individuals, who can do 15,000, people with, with obesity or former obesity who can walk 15,000 steps every day uh, and who can go up to 70% of carbohydrate. So, you know, these were radicals. I think the sugar issue was very big. Again, I don't know, uh, as you can see also in the WHO uh, report, also that the, it seems like it's all non-sugar sweeteners. I don't know, and if you have a comments to about that, also, stevia is mentioned that one. Even there is no comment on any adverse effect with stevia compared to cardiovascular diseases or diabetes. But do you have a comment to that also? Because uh, that was also a little bit of a surprise for me to see that. No, but it is. Uh, you cannot consider all sweeteners uh, alike, of course. They have very different origin and very different biochemical composition. And if there is any uh, de well, detrimental effect, it cannot just be said it's for all of them. They did do, in some cases, the, the evidence was not very impressive, so. Okay, any more questions? Yes. I have one question, uh, and it concerns yes, su yes, sucralose. Okay, yeah, sorry, uh, yes, please, question. sorry. You can change, please. It concerns sucralose, for which there's a report with it causes DNA damage. I'm wondering whether, um, the EU, for example, authorities are, Please are, put aware, the microphone of closer to are, are aware of that. The sucrose causing DNA, DNA damage are aware of that. And what sort of system they would, they would deal with, with them should, should be thought a concern. For example, if we thought that it really was, would we have suspended it until we really know more about it, or would we just let it keep it going? What, what's, that, what's the picture? I can tell you the answer. I was not involved at all in the uh, EFSA sugar opinion. Uh, it has been published about a year ago. And what this, I think, is uh, relevant as a takeout is that uh, the evidence for adverse effects of uh, sugar intake is meager, if at all, except for in uh, beverages, uh, that, that, that's, that stands. All the rest is uh, absent or nil, etc. The mechanism, not so relevant. Moreover, if there is no effect, uh, even a mechanism, it doesn't count either. So uh, I think uh, that's why I presented in one of my slides that uh, uh, with respect to low-calorie sweeteners, you should be careful what to compare with, because uh, sugar is not that bad as we may think, uh, the, the, the cutoff level is around 10 energy percent and, that, and that's it, if there is an effect at all. Moreover, if I may turn it into uh, low calorie sweeteners, uh, this is a section on low calorie sweetener, yes, I know, but there is maybe 20 different chemicals. Uh, you cannot combine the information on the one low calorie sweetener with the other, it's, it's such a completely different uh, chemical, we may eat uh, 10,000 uh, different chemicals when we go over lunch in due course. So uh, why piling them up uh, together? Is it, let's say scientifically or toxicologically, that, that would be a very strange phenomenon. I'm sorry, um, perhaps I can get the question clearly. Not sucrose, but sucralose, oh, sucralose. which is, which is uh, chlorinated carbohydrate. Okay. 
and has been found to have caused severe DNA damage. Now, of course, that's probably not taken up in the toxicology of years ago, but now we have the methodology to deal with that, deal with that. It's something that, since the, the information has become available, that we could check it, and we could decide whether uh, we suspend the use of sucralose until more is known about it, yeah, or I not. There are some real, real issues. Real issues there. Okay. Yeah. I don't know the toxicology of sucralose. Sorry about the uh, misinterpretation of the, the word, but it's quite hard. It has been um, so It has been uh, gone through, uh, let's say, meticulous uh, risk of the information that uh, that you have. And anyway, it will be revisited. The food additive, including sucralose, will be revisited uh, every now and then in, in order to light in, in yeah, new data arising. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for presenting, for very presentations. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for the audience, and uh, then it's lunch time. Testing, testing. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch. And we are now ready for the session number eight of this uh, 40th uh, meeting of the symposium on uh, diabetes and nutrition. I'm glad to see a few faces here, and I hope that uh, many more join uh, after the, the meeting. The title of today's session is as the time come to recommend plant-based diets to all our patients with diabetes. So by the end of the sessions, I hope that we have a clear answer to this question. So <clears throat> uh, joining with me uh, as the chair, we have David Jenkins, and he's going to introduce the first speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me introduce the first speaker who is Neil Barnard. Uh, Neil is the uh, President of the Decisions Committee for Responsible Medicine in Washington, and he's one of our great um, thinkers in the plant-based area, and one of those who has looked 
for the implications of uh, a plant-based diet in, uh, in <coughs> therapy. He's been a champion in this area. He's attracted many people, people here uh, to work with him in Washington uh, at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So he is an expert, probably one of the world's experts in plant-based diets, in diabetes. So it's great pleasure for us to welcome uh, a good friend, Neil Barnard, uh, to talk to us about diabetes and plant-based diets. Thank you very much, David. Uh, th thank you to all of allowing me the opportunity to speak uh, with you today. I, I hope that uh, the technology gods are smiling and that you can hear me all right. Let me share my screen, if I may. Please show the screen. Excellent. Now we can see you. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, I hope you could see me and hear me all right. Yes. Everybody can see you. Thank you. Now, let me ask one more thing from you. Um, the host has disabled participant screen sharing. And if you're able to enable the screen sharing, I'll be able to show you my, uh, show you my presentation. We cannot see on the ones on the podium. Can you put that on the screen here, please? Here we go. All right. Hopefully that's uh, showing up now. Uh, we cannot see here on the front screens. Are you able to see the presentation? Are you able to um, see my screen, I'm hoping? Okay, things are ready now. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, okay, and can we, can we make that wide so that you could see it, uh, see it all right? Yeah, everything is clear. Please go ahead. Okay. Very good, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, thank you, David, for that very kind uh, introduction. I'd like to talk today about plant-based diets. These are my disclosures. I'm on the faculty at the George Washington University. I serve without compensation at the Physicians Committee and at our medical center, and I write books and give lectures. Um, I'd like to first address insulin resistance because this is really the core of type 2 diabetes. And if we can tackle insulin resistance, we can really tackle type 2 diabetes. Um, and let me first present what we're talking about. I would like to, to discuss our model. Then I would like to back up and provide some evidence for that model, and then talk about uh, changing things and how we implement this in the clinical setting. Okay, first, just what is the general idea? This big purple oval is a muscle cell. And muscle cells, as you know, are powered by glucose. But glucose cannot enter a muscle cell. It cannot penetrate the membrane. It's repelled until I have a key. And the key is insulin, which attaches to the surface of that cell and signals the opening of little channels that allow glucose to come in. And with that glucose key, if everything works well, my blood sugar goes down and the glucose can enter the cell. But the problem is that is my dinner and that's my lunch and that's my breakfast and I'm eating fatty foods. And these foods have quite a lot of fat in them. And fat that we eat 
ends up depositing in microscopic particles inside muscle cells. Now, doctors hate words like fat because it has only one syllable, so I'll refer to it as intramyocellular lipid, but it's fat inside muscle cells, and the same thing happens in the liver with hepatocellular lipid buildup. That fat interferes with insulin signaling. So the insulin uh, molecule still attaches to the cell, but the cell is no longer responsive. That's insulin resistance, and it's caused by the buildup of fat inside the cell. What can I do? Well, what if I decide I'm not going to eat any more animal fat? What if I'm going to eat no animal products at all? And in fact, what if I go a step further and limit vegetable oil so I'm not eating much of any kind of fat? The fat starts to dissipate from the cell, and as it goes away, insulin sensitivity is restored. And the insulin signaling works again, and the little channels will welcome the glucose to come in the cell, and everybody is happy. Diabetes has improved dramatically. Now let me back up. Let's go back, oh, about three decades. At Yale University, a small group of uh, volunteers came in and were given a lipid infusion intravenously. And insulin sensitivity degraded, not within weeks or months, but within hours. Insulin sensitivity decreased to the extent that lipid was flushed into the cell, in, into the system. Now, this doesn't have to be a lipid infusion. It can be a meal. It can be one single. And let me salute Michael Rodin and his work, uh, bringing in individuals and giving them one meal that was rich in palm oil. And the palm oil rapidly reduced insulin sensitivity in just a matter of hours. Now, palm oil is high in saturated fat. What if I choose canola oil, which is higher in monounsaturated fat? Well, maybe not to the same degree, but we see the same phenomenon. Fat in the diet interferes with insulin sensitivity. So if we go back to Yale and look at, not at individuals who have diabetes, but healthy people who may have had a diabetic relative, 26 volunteers were brought in and they did glucose tolerance testing and some were insulin sensitive and some were insulin resistant. Now look at their ages. These are young people and they're thin people, 60 kilograms or 64 kilograms. And if you look at their A1C, they don't have diabetes. Now let's go down to the basement and let's put everyone in our MR scanners. And with MR spectroscopy, we can measure the fat inside their muscle cells. Every dot here is a person. And on the left, you see the intramyocellular lipid of the insulin sensitive individuals. And now you see the intramyocellular lipid, the fat in the muscle cells of the insulin resistant individuals. Clearly, they've got fat buildup inside their cells, even though they're young, healthy, and nobody talked about having diabetes. But it gets worse. With the fat buildup, their mitochondrial activity is impaired. This is the mitochondrial activity for the insulin sensitive individuals and now for the insulin resistant individuals. Here is my point. With individuals who are young and healthy, they may be 15 or 16 years old, but because of the foods that they're eating that contain the fat from cheese, pizza, and burgers, and fried chicken, and salmon, and other things that are high in fat, the fat enters their cells, the fat build is built up and you can detect it uh, if you have the right scanner. It's interfering with their mitochondria. It's interfering with their insulin signaling. It's leading them toward a diabetes diagnosis. Okay. Now, can this be changed? I want to salute the work of Dr. Hanna Kaliova, who did a very difficult study, but a, a very eye-opening one. She brought in 244 overweight adults. They didn't have diabetes at this point. <clears throat> they were randomly assigned to a low-fat vegan diet or to no diet changes. And it was a 16-week intervention. And what you could see is that in this very short period of time, in the intervention group, which is the tan line, liver fat dramatically re uh, diminished and intramyocellular lipid diminished as well. So the point is diet can make things worse, but diet can rapidly make things better. Now this helps explain something. At the Adventist Health Study too, not only are people who follow meaty diets heavier with a body end mass index about five points higher than that of people who don't eat animal products. 
but we see the same gradient with diabetes. In this very health conscious Adventist population, uh, this is uh, Serena Tonstad's work, um, you could see that diabetes was relatively common in non-vegetarians, but the more people got the animal products out of their diet, diabetes became more and more rare, reaching a nadir in vegans with at 2.9%. Okay, so it's, now it's time to put this model to work and see if in fact this can help. 20 years ago, the National Institutes of Health gave our team a grant to put this to the test. We tested really what was kind of the state of the art at that time, a portion controlled diet that limited calories kept carbohydrates steady, and limited bad fats, saturated fat, trans fats. And the experimental diet was a plant-based diet, no animal products. It was a vegan diet, but we also minimized oils, even what you would think of as healthy oils, and the foods were low glycemic index, not low carbohydrate, but low glycemic index, beans, fruits, that sort of thing. And what we found was that the A1C did diminish in the portion controlled group, about 0.4%, uh, that's good. But in the plant-based group, it dropped more than three times better, an absolute drop of 1.2 A1C uh, percentage of A1C points. And it really rapidly became the, what I'm gonna call it is really the state of the art in dietetic treatment of di diabetes. Let me present the case of one of the individuals in this study, 35 years old, diabetes for four years, he was on metformin, he had every other problem, weight problems, dyslipidemia. He had erectile dysfunction. He had a family history that included uh, type 2 diabetes in both his maternal grandparents. And when he came in, he weighed 276 kilograms with an A1C of 9.5%. <clears throat> his cholesterol and LDL cholesterol were elevated, and his erectile dysfunction was symptomatic. The intervention was what I described, no animal products, minimize oils, low glycemic index, but there was no limit on carbohydrate, no limit on calories, and there was no exercise. At three months, he had lost, uh, what's this, 11 kilograms? And his A1C had already dropped to 7.1%. His erectile dysfunction went into remission, which he thought was a good change. Um, and we tracked him for another 14 months. And what we found is that at 14 months, he was down to 99 kilograms um, and his A1C was 5.3%. His lipids had improved, his erectile dysfunction remained in remission. Now, the number that is worth really noting here is a man who had come in with an A1C of 9.5% was now at 5.3% on no medication whatsoever. And this was, for me personally, a real eye-opener because it suggested that everything I had learned in medical school about the irreversibility of diabetes and its progressive nature was apparently wrong. Here was a man who could go into any clinic in the world and he would not be diagnosed as having had diabetes. Shortly thereafter, other teams began testing the same diet. This is a meta-analysis that was done now about nine years ago and we showed that, that there was a very predictable effect on A1C. Uh, we then wanted to see if we could replicate this result, not in a research lab, but in everyday life. We worked with a large auto insurance company in the United States called GEICO, the Government Employees Insurance Company. And we offered them simply a class on how to treat diabetes with a vegetarian diet how, or vegan diet, how to adopt a low-fat, healthy vegan diet. And we offered vegan foods in the cafeteria. Now, for the cafeteria manager, this was a bit of a new idea, and he had to learn that maybe a vegan burger should not have bacon and cheese on it. People make mistakes. They need to learn from them. And we implemented this same study in 10 different cities across the United States where diets varied quite substantially. But what we found is that very consistently, when people began this diet change, they lost weight, and their A1Cs improved quite significantly as well despite the fact that there was no exercise, no limit on carbohydrates, no hunger, no limit on calories whatsoever. Now, we then wanted to see, well, what happens if a person has had diabetes for a prolonged period? We brought in people who not only had diabetes for a long period, but they had symptomatic painful neuropathy. And so we brought in 34 men and women and gave them the very same dietary intervention. We then asked them, how do you feel 
um, is your pain any different? And what we discovered is that in the vegan group, by about 18 weeks, the people felt moderately better, whereas in the control group, not really so much. But then the question is, what objective criteria can I uh, look to to see if you are better? And what we were able to do is to assess the galvanic skin response, which is under neurological control. And what we found is that it continued to get worse in the control group, but started to improve in the vegan group. All right, so the next question is, how do I approach this in a clinical setting? We have been doing this at, in our clinical setting for quite a number of years. And a healthful diet, as we would describe it to patients, is fruits and grains and legumes and vegetables, plus supplemental vitamin B12. And it's important to have B12 for healthy blood and healthy nerves, and this is not optional, it's essential, and it's important for people to include it in their routine. However, one thing we've discovered is that many practitioners have the idea that a vegan diet is hard to adhere to. Um, doctors will say, you couldn't stick to a vegan diet. And plus, I don't really have time to talk with you about it. And we see many of them saying things like, well, maybe a Mediterranean diet is much easier. Why don't you try that? And what they really mean is they're not sure what a Mediterranean diet is. They just imagine it must be nice to drive along the coast of Tuscany anticipating your dinner. So what we have actually done, killjoys that we are, is put this to the test to see if it really is easier. And we brought in 62 participants and randomized them to either a Mediterranean diet or a vegan diet in a crossover design that after 16 weeks allowed all participants to test the opposite diet. Each participant was his or her own control. And what we discovered is that although the, uh, let me show you the weight changes that occurred. The Mediterranean diet felt quite indulgent to the participants, but when they looked at their weight change, they were quite discouraged because it doesn't really change it. We saw this in Predimed, we saw this in the Lyon trial. The Mediterranean diet causes little or no weight loss. The people on the, Medi on the vegan diet were relieved to know that a vegan diet did not mean they had to acquire a taste for folk music or wear tie-dyed clothes. It just meant having tomato sauce in your spaghetti instead of meat sauce. They lost weight very quickly. Then we asked everyone to take four weeks as a break and then switch to the opposite diet. And the Mediterranean group that now began the vegan diet started to see the weight loss very rapidly. The vegan group that now was asked to go Mediterranean became quite discouraged because they had uh, not only lost their taste for fish and oils, and they were being asked to bring these foods back in, which they did not want, but they saw that their weight started to creep back up. Our conclusion is that a Mediterranean diet really does not lead to weight loss, whereas the vegan diet does very, very simply. Now, the question of acceptability comes up, and you'll hear medical experts say that, that maybe uh, not everyone is ready to follow a plant-based diet. It's important not to let just our own prejudices guide what we do in the clinic. There is a science of acceptability, and we have assessed the acceptability of plant-based diets in patients with heart disease, in young women with dysmenorrhea but were otherwise healthy, in postmenopausal overweight women, in individuals with type 2 diabetes. And you can ask patients on any sort of diet, Mediterranean, low-carb, uh, low-calorie, vegan, whatever it is, how do you like the diet? Rate it from 1 to 10. How much work is it? What do you expect to do in the future? We have done this. We've published on all of these things. And we have found that although any diet change does require a little effort and some learning, and you'll make some mistakes, there is no more difficulty in adopting a plant-based diet compared to the forms of diet. And that makes sense because you don't have to count anything. You don't have to limit calories so you're not hungry. On a typical portion controlled diet, where people are asked to eat 500 calories less, every day they're ready to eat the sofa by about Wednesday. There's no limit uh, on carbohydrate, so that allows more choices. I can have rice, I can have a bowl of cereal if I want to. I can have beans, I can have fruits without worrying. But perhaps most importantly, your goal as a clinician is to help the patient to get a clinical reward rapidly. That rewards the change they make. And if they get improvements, not just in weight, but in glucose and in lipids and in blood pressure, and if their indigestion goes away, they feel much better. It also often fits in with other people's values, their cultures or their environmental motivations or whatever the case may be. 
To implement the diet, we always work a team. The physician's job is to describe and validate the diet. That takes three minutes. Describe what intramyocellular lipid is. Then a dietitian will do one on, uh, a one-time menu planning session with the patient and their spouse or partner. Then we refer the patients to classes, which can be done in person or online. If you don't have a dietitian, you simply contract with one who understands this kind of diet and who practice it, or practices it personally. If you don't have classes, you simply refer patients to others, such as ours. They're free, and they allow patients to address questions that they may have. So the process of starting the diet broken into steps. We ask the patient to take one week for step one. Check out the possibilities. That means taking a piece of paper and writing down things that you would eat if you were going to actually follow this diet. And patients need some ideas. So you can walk through breakfasts of porridge or pancakes or bran flakes with uh, oat or almond milk. And for lunch, a pizza without cheese, a vegetable chili, a bean burrito. And when they go out to eat, what would I have at an Italian restaurant? What would I have at a Latin American restaurant? What could I perhaps have if I go to a Chinese restaurant and have rice and vegetables and tofu? Or if I go Japanese and I have the cucumber roll instead of the fish roll? Or if I go to the fast food chain, what can I have there? After a week, the patient comes back and they've got a, a, a list of a lot of foods that work fine for them. Very good. Now they're ready. The next step is to take a three-week test drive. We're going to ask the patient to eliminate animal products completely for the next three weeks. Keep oils low. They're going to now say, not so hard, because I already know what I like. I've got my list. And frankly, I can do anything for three weeks. At the end of that time, they will be physically healthier. They'll have lost some weight. Their blood sugar is coming down. They're feeling better. But also, their tastes are changing. They haven't had chicken wings in three weeks. And they discover they don't miss it. And then the next step is to arrange some sort of weekly follow-up. It can be as a group on Zoom. It can be to refer them to some other class, such as the ones we have. But this is important because people will have questions and they'll have problems. They'll get invited to an event out of town. They won't know what to eat. They're not serious problems, but they need their questions answered. So if we do these things together, what we find is that we're putting the very best evidence to work. Our patients benefit they, in turn, talk to their friends about it. They talk to their children about it. And this is really important to remember. When we prescribe metformin for a patient, they are hopefully not going to be sharing it with anyone. But when you prescribe a good, powerful diet and some ways of implementing it, they share it with everyone they know. They share it with their children. So the diabetes that goes from grandparent to parent to the next generation, we can stop that lineage and we can conquer this epidemic. Thank you for allowing me to share this time with you. Well, thank you, Dr. Neil Barna, for um, your presentation. And I hope that uh, you can stay uh, until the end because it's going to be a questions and answers session. So now is my privilege to introduce the second speaker of this session, um, Hannah Kaliova. Uh, she is the uh, Director for Clinical Research at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. It's not new to this uh, forum, so everybody knows her, but I just want to say that uh, I met her a few years ago when she came from uh, Czechoslovakia to Loma Linda, and I was impressed by her uh, love for the topic, her work for work, and uh, and I'm happy that now is further developing uh, and expanding her skills uh, in Washington, D.C. Time is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Joan. It was 8 p.m. on a March evening. My son and I were completely exhausted after a full day of hiking in rural Japan. And I mean, we were out in the boonies. Like, nobody spoke any English, all signs were in Japanese, which I found really unhelpful. And it seemed to be impossible to get to Kyoto, where we needed to get to. 
Now, finally, we arrived at the local railway, railway station and we had two options. Either we could take a local slow train that would get us to Kyoto just before midnight. We could hop a bullet train that, was, that would get us there in 30 minutes. What would you do in that situation? Who would take the slow train? Raise your hand. Okay, who would take the bullet train? Of course, it was a no-brainer. Of course we took the bullet train. And I'm here to tell you that plant-based nutrition is like the train for people with type 1 diabetes. It can, get, it can get them faster to their final destination they ever dreamed of. A nutri bullet, if you will. So in my talk, uh, we will start reviewing the nutrition goals for people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, then we'll review the role of macronutrients in glycemic care, the findings from a randomized clinical trials that we conducted with type 1 diabetes. So let's start with the nutrition goals. Goals are well beyond glycemic control. They need to address all the, all the cardiometabolic outcomes, such as body weight, pressure, and blood lipids. They also need to ensure good quality of life and delay uh, the uh, development of diabetic complications. Now, um, mortality in people with type 1 diabetes is higher compared with people without diabetes and increases with the duration of diabetes, mainly due to increased cardiovascular mortality. During 30 years of follow-up in the DCCT EDIC study, a higher dose of insulin was associated with higher body mass index in people with type 1 diabetes, higher pulse rate, and impaired blood lipids. Each increase of, one, uh, of 0.1 uh, units of insulin per kilogram per day was associated with a 6% increased risk of any disease. Now, um, increased dose of insulin uh, is also associated with higher economic costs, right? But of course, that's the, not the driver. But I mean, uh, we see in people with type 1 diabetes that sometimes um, the, the insulin doses just get higher and higher as the disease progresses. The dietary recommendations for type 1 diabetes emphasize portion control, carbohydrate counting and restriction, and limited consumption of processed beverages and foods. The dose of is then estimated based on carbohydrate content of the meals. But it's not created equal, and they're usually consumed with protein and fat, uh, which may in blood sugar control after a meal. During my endocrinology training, basically taught that carbohydrates are the wild beast to be tamed by protein and fat. Basically, uh, you need to eat, you need to add protein and fat to a meal so that you slow down the absorption of carbohydrates and you know make the, the glycemic control better for people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, the experiential um, data from my patients and also the scientific evidence on this hypothesis. Uh, let's just review uh, a few examples. Uh, this is a, the red line represents uh, glycemic control in someone with type 1 diabetes with uh, really good glycemic control. After they ate pizza at 6 p.m. and they, their insulin based on, on the carbohydrate uh, content of the meal, however, they, ha they had delayed hyperglycemia, uh, you know, a few hours after they ate. Similarly, uh, another patient with type 1 diabetes ate fried chicken 
and uh, dosed uh, their insulin based on the carbohydrate uh, content of the meal. But the glycemic control was just like completely out of control. Uh, am I the only one who has patients with type 1 diabetes who have this delayed hyperglycemia after some meals? Can any one of you relate to that? Do you have any patients who come to you and they're like, I completely cannot eat this, this meal. Like the insulin dosing just doesn't work for, for that particular meal. Um, well, uh, what's the role of macronutrients? What's the role of fat and protein uh, in this mix? Let's start. There's a strong evidence that dietary fat impairs insulin sensitivity with type 1 diabetes. A crossover study compared glycemic insulin requirements in people with type 1 diabetes after high fat and compared with a low fat dinner. Each dinner had the same carbohydrate and protein uh, content, but different fat content. 60 grams versus 10 grams of fat. Now, the high-fat dinner required 29% the low-fat dinner. And despite the additional, it cost 51% more hyperglycemia. Um, and uh, the carbohydrate to insulin ratio, which is a marker of insulin sensitivity, was 50 44% lower high fat dinner. In another random meal, people with type 1 diabetes consumed meals containing 45 carbohydrate with 0, 20, 40, 60 grams of fat. As you can see, the addition of fat resulted in a significant late postprandial hyper, hyper, hyperglycemia two, two to five hours after the meal. Please note that this was a late postprandial hyperglycemia. So if you do a two hour uh, OGTT, you will not catch that. And interestingly, the type of fat made no significant difference. Uh, this is consistent with previous findings that free induce insulin resistance uh, by inhibition of glucose transport. Um, let's look at protein. Tom already told you yesterday that protein actually increases glycemia in people with type 1 diabetes. And I completely agree. Let me just add a few more studies that illustrate that. One study conducted in Germany took uh, 117 people with newly diagnosed diabetes. Uh, they filled out uh, a standardized food frequency questionnaire. And based on their protein intake, they compared a group with normal protein intake of 0.74 grams per kilogram per day on average with a high, group, high protein group who consumed 1.8 87 grams per kilogram, and they followed them for a year. Simulated C peptide was 40% higher in the protein group compared with the high protein group. Uh, and there are clear uh, negative correlation uh, between protein intake and the C peptide levels. Glucose production in the liver was 17% higher in the normal protein group. And insulin sensitivity, a euglycemic clamp, was 15% lower uh, in the high protein group. And one more study with pancakes. Who'd like to consume pancakes for a study? I would. <laughs> So in this part, of the people with type 1 diabetes were given pancakes, 30 grams of carbohydrates, either low fat or high fat, either low protein or high protein. So uh, with different combinations, so, so that makes four test meals. 
you know, low fat, um, low protein, low fat, high protein, high fat, low protein, you, you get it. And uh, the addition of fat clearly resulted in delayed hyperglycemia again. Uh, and we see the same pattern. If you do just a two hour test, you will not catch that. Um, but actually, uh, the best scenario was the low-fat, low-protein meal. If you add only protein or only fat, glycemia went higher, and the worst combination was the high-fat, high-protein meal. So this suggests that the, the, the effects of protein and fat are additive. So what would happen if we put people with type 1 diabetes on a high carbohydrate, plant-based diet. Uh, Dr. Barnard just reviewed the use of plant-based nutrition for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, 2 diabetes um, has insulin resistance as the, as the central um, mechanism, plus um, a varying degree of beta cell dysfunction. Type 1 diabetes has the beta cell dysfunction as the primary um, driving factor and a varying degree of insulin resistance. Now, it's been shown that plant-based nutrition can actually uh, affect both of these key mechanisms. It can increase insulin sensitivity and it can also improve beta cell function. Um, but it hasn't been tested in people with type 1 diabetes. So that's why we decided to compare a low-fat vegan diet with a portion control diet. Meet people with type 1 diabetes and assign them randomly to follow either a low-fat vegan diet that consisted of and legumes or a portion control diet with uh, counting and uh, watching for 12 weeks. Now, the portion control group was um, instructed to watch their portions, to restrict the carbohydrates, and also keep the cholesterol traded fat low. The low fat vegan group was asked to only eat uh, plant foods, that means fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes, keep the co fat content of the diet low, up to 30 grams per day and favor the low glycemic index foods. The participants were using Dexcom continual glucose monitoring system to ensure their safety and also to learn from um, the glycemic excursions which meals work best for them on, on that particular diet. They were tracking all their meals using chronometer mobile application. And at the end, we analyzed three-day diet records from baseline and 12 weeks, two weekdays, and, two, and one weekend day at each time point. Insulin sensitivity was calculated as the carbo total carbohydrates uh, divided total insulin injected per day. Uh, the participants went to a lab core laboratory for, for their own. The primary outcomes were the total daily insulin, insulin sensitivity and A1C. The secondary outcomes were body weight, blood lipids, and the kidney function, measured as blood urea nitrogen and bunto creatinine ratio. We used ANOVA for repeated measures for statistical analysis. Instructed not to change their exercise habits and physical activity questionnaire. And indeed, physical activity did in either group. Uh, energy intake did not change in either group either. The carbohydrate intake uh, increased significantly in the vegan group, about 50%, from roughly 200 to roughly 300 grams per day. The fat intake decreased significantly uh, from about 60 grams to about 20 per day. 
on average. In the portion controlled group, um, there was a clear trend toward uh, a decreased consumption of carbohydrate and fat, but these changes were not significant for the whole group. Total daily insulin dose decreased on the diet by 12 units of insulin per day on average. Uh, that's roughly by 28%. Insulin sensitivity went up by 120 in the vegan group with no significant change in the portion control um, group. A1C uh, went down significantly in both groups with no difference between the groups. Body weight did not change significantly on the portion control diet and it decreased by 5.2 kilograms on the vegan diet. Total cholesterol dropped more on the vegan diet. LDL cholesterol dropped only on the vegan diet. Um, kidney function improved, blood, urea, nitrogen, and bun to creatinine ratio decreased on the vegan diet significantly. So in summary, the portion control diet improved the levels of C and total cholesterol. These were the only changes observed in 12 weeks. While the low-fat vegan diet uh, reduced the need for insulin by roughly 28% or 12 units of insulin per day on average, it increased the insulin sensitivity um, by more than 100%. And it also improved all the tracks, including the kidney function. So I can read your mind now. You're probably thinking, well, that was because these people just lost weight, right? Because to start with, the participants were slightly overweight, uh, just above the 25 kilogram per, um, per M M2. Uh, so um, is there any benefit beyond weight loss on a vegan diet? Uh, I decided to adjust the insulin dose per kilogram so that you know the, the weight uh, change would be out of picture. And even when we adjusted the insulin dose per kilogram, there was a clear reduction by 24% or a reduction of 0.15 units per kilogram per day on the vegan diet. Uh, what does it mean? Well, a reduction of 0.15 units per kilogram per day of insulin would correspond to a reduction in cardiovascular disease risk by 9%, and the addition to the reduction of A1C by 0.8%, which would correspond to a decrease in cardiovascular risk by 12%, plus a decrease in LDL cholesterol by 20%, which would decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease by 20%. So um, I'm wrapping up. The low-fat vegan diet showed clear um, benefits for people with type 1 diabetes in terms of uh, decreased insulin requirements, increased insulin sensitivity, and improved cardiometabolic outcomes. And uh, uh, I don't have type 1 diabetes, but I know what it feels like to be in a foreign country, to be lost in the dark, in the cold, and that's how many of our patients feel. And that's why we're here. You are the ones who care the most. And you can help your patients get on the plan-based bullet train. <laughs> Let's roll. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure now to introduce um, Andrea Glenn. Um, an old friend of mine who did her PhD in our center uh, with John, John Cummings, and uh, did it, as always, with the scholarship. So uh, that's always a pleasure. And it's a great pleasure, too, that she's now continuing her work um, 
as uh, an MRC, uh, sorry, CHR um, <coughs> postdoctoral fellow uh, with Frank Franco and myself at Harvard and Toronto. So we, we've got her split in two places because she's too valuable to let her go in one, one place and lose her. So uh, she's an expert uh, now in, uh, in plant-based diets. She's been looking at the dietary portfolio and uh, looking at metabolomic signatures and uh, looking at dietary patterns so that we can actually determine uh, quite well uh, how these things are doing in terms of uh, both diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So it's a great pleasure to me introduce Andrea. Great, uh, thank you so much, David, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me today. Um, I don't have the slides on the side, but I can use the side. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about different dietary patterns in um, observational research specifically. So it's going to be primary prevention of diabetes and cardiovascular disease rather than management. So here are my disclosures from the last 24 months. So we've seen uh, different variations of this data at the symposium already. Um, but this just shows some of the data around diabetes around the world. There's currently over 500 million uh, people worldwide that have diabetes, and this is expected to grow um, over time with uh, estimates, global estimates, 46% increase by 2045. Uh, cardiovascular disease also continues to be the leading cause of global mortality, and that includes um, in people living with diabetes. And we also know that the four events are attributed to modifiable risk factors. And this, uh, of course, includes diet. And as uh, Hannah and Neil uh, nicely showed, uh, plant-based diets are thought to be particularly beneficial for diabetes. So a lot of the knowledge of plant-based diets has actually been shaped um, by cohort studies on vegetarians, specifically um, cohorts like the Adventist Health Study and some of the cohorts in Oxford, UK. Um, so two of the large ongoing studies are shown here um, from this table. So that's the Epic Oxford, the Adventist Health Study 2. Um, and this table just highlights um, some of the diseases that are shown to be lower in vegetarians compared to vegetarians. And um, Neil had showed this data before, but um, in the Adventist Health Study 2, they did see that semi-vegetarians, lacto-ovo-vegetarians, and vegans had lower rates of diet to non-vegetarians. So vegetarian diets have also been associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular outcomes. So this is actually a meta-analysis I led uh, several years ago with uh, Dr. Stephen Piper with um, eight prospective cohorts for, and the Adventist Health Study 2 as well. And overall, we found that it's were um, associated with a 20% lower risk of coronary heart disease mortality, as well as 28% lower risk of coronary heart disease incidence compared to non-vegetarian diets. Associations with CVD mortality and stroke mortality were not significant. Um, so we've learned a lot about um, plant-based diets from these um, limitations um, using these specific cohorts. Um, one, quality was not considered in these analyses, which we know is important. There's also a small number of cohorts with a large amount of vegetarians, so it makes it difficult to um, confirm and expand these findings. Words. So building on um, the second limitation I mentioned, uh, most people in the world are omnivores, so that can make it hard to um, uh, really look at vegan and vegetarians in different cohorts. So this is um, a survey from 2018 of 28 countries. Only 5% of the population are vegetarians and 3% are vegan. Um, this may have changed a bit over time as it's a bit older, um, but generally the amount of people who consider themselves uh, vegetarians and vegans hasn't increased a lot although the um, flexitarian group may be increasing quite a bit. Um, but overall, this just highlights that dietary patterns and cohort studies, a lot of times some animal products need studied. 
So one dietary pattern indice I want to show is the plant-based dietary pattern indices that was uh, led by Dr. Frank Hu and his group. Um, and the motivation behind creating these indices was that sometimes some plant foods healthy, so they kind of wanted to sort out looking at healthy versus less healthy plant foods. And there's three different indices, so there's the healthful, unhealthful, and then just the overall plant-based diet indice, and the foods are broken down into healthy plant foods, less healthy plant foods, and animal foods. There is, um, the, the participants are broken into quintiles, and they're given scores based on quintiles. So just for an example, for the healthy plant-based diet index, you would get positive scores for healthy foods, but then reverse scores for less healthy plant foods and animal foods. So some of the early uh, earlier work on these plant-based diet indices are from the Harvard cohort. So those are the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2 and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study, specifically looking at coronary heart disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, so I'll start with coronary heart disease, and overall it was found that um, the unhealthy plant-based diet index is actually associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease, whereas both the overall and health-based diet index are associated with lower risk of coronary heart disease, and the uh, association was stronger for the, for the healthy index. And similarly, for type 2 diabetes, we see an increased risk with the unhealthy plant-based diet indice and um, a decreased risk with both the plant-based and healthy plant-based. And again, the inverse association is stronger with the healthy plant-based diet. So uh, this work just really highlights how important um, the quality of the plant-based diet. So there are several um, dietary patterns that, are, that emphasize plant foods and that exist in the literature, but I thought I would focus uh, today's talk on the ones that are recommended by the the new DNSG ESDA ESAD guidelines that was uh, just published April of this year. So there are five different dietary patterns that are recommended. Um, so there's the traditional diets, which includes the Mediterranean, the Nordic, and the vegetarian, which I just spoke about. And then there's two therapeutic diets, which are the dietary approaches to stop hypertension and the portfolio diet. So we'll start with the Mediterranean diet. So I think everyone's quite familiar with what the Mediterranean diet is, um, but it is a dietary pattern that focuses on fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, um, olive oil, as well as um, some wine in moderation, particularly with meals. And there are a number of Mediterranean dietary patterns that exist in the literature. So I'll just highlight um, one of the ones that's more common where they use population medians. So you get one point if you're above the median and one point if you're below based on specific foods. And foods that are generally scored positively are whole grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts and fish, as well as the monounsaturated to saturated fat ratio. Red meat, processed meat and dairy are scored negatively. And then moderate um, alcohol intake is also scored uh, positively. So there have been several systematic reviews and meta-analyses on dietary pattern indices. Um, so this one um, is looking at incident type 2 diabetes that was published uh, last year. It included 16 prospective cohort studies and overall found that uh, higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet was associated with a 17% lower risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, several meta-analyses exist with cardiovascular outcomes as well. So this is a meta-analysis. Um, John and Jordy that uh, looked at 38 prospective cohort studies and found that higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet was associated with um, several lower cardiovascular events, um, so ranging from 13 to 27 percent lower risk of these outcomes. So next, next let's uh, focus on the Nordic diet. So the Nordic diet is um, a diet from the non, um, like root vegetables, berries, uh, whole grains, like there's some fish and low-fat dairy and, uh, and canola oil. And similar to the Mediterranean diet, there are several indices that also exist in the literature, uh, but some of the more common ones use um, population medians or tertiles, and they score specific foods positively, specifically fish and shellfish. Cruciferous vegetables, oats and rye, apples, pears, 
fruits and vegetables, berries, and low-fat dairy. So our group with uh, John recently conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of um, cardiometabolic outcomes with the Nordic diet. So this includes 15 prospective studies and overall found that the Nordic diet was associated with a 7% lower risk of CVD incidence, 19% uh, lower risk of um, CD mortality, as well as a 12% lower risk of stroke mortality, although the uh, associations weren't significant for CHD and type 2 diabetes when looking at the extreme uh, quantile analysis. So next, let's uh, switch to the therapeutic diet. So first, the um, DASH diet. So the DASH diet was originally developed to lower blood pressure, um, and it focuses on foods like vegetables, fruits, whole grains, low-fat dairy, fish, um, poultry, beans, nuts and seeds, and vegetable oils, and mixed foods like fatty meats, uh, full-fat dairy, and sugary foods. And so, again, similar to the Mediterranean and Nordic diets, there are still indices that exist. Um, one of the more common ones, um, which was also um, led by Frank Hu's group, is the one that I have shown here, which is based on population quintiles where um, fruits, vegetables, nuts and legumes, whole grains, and low-fat dairy are scored positively, and then sodium, bread and processed meats, and sweetened beverages are scored um, negatively or, or in reverse. So this meta-analysis here was by Laura Cavaroli and John's group as well. So this looked at um, several cardiometabolic outcomes, including 15 prospective cohort studies, and similar to the other dietary patterns, we see um, reductions in these events. So 20 vascular disease, 21% lower risk of coronary heart disease, 19% uh, for stroke, and then we see 18% lower risk for type 2 diabetes. So the last um, therapeutic diet that's recommended and that I'll focus on today is the portfolio diet. So the portfolio diet was originally uh, developed or all. It was created by uh, Dr. David Jenkins and Cyril Kendall, and it emphasizes foods um, such as nuts and seeds, plant protein, protein viscous fiber sources, uh, plant sterols, as well as heart-healthy oils um, that are monounsaturated fatty acids. And as far as I'm aware, there's only one uh, population-based uh, portfolio diet score that exists. And this is the uh, score that I led the development of during HD with John Stephen Piper. And it um, is also based on population quintiles. So um, for, for the portfolio diet, plant protein, viscous fiber, nuts, plant sterols are scored um, positively. And then foods high in saturated fat and cholesterol are scored um, negatively. So we had the opportunity to collaborate with Dr. Simon Liu and assess this diet women's health initiative. So this is a large uh, cohort of postmenopausal women in the U.S. And overall, we found that uh, higher adherence to the portfolio diet was associated with a third of um, type 2 diabetes. And within this paper, we also looked at the DASH and Mediterranean diets and saw similar associations, so uh, 22 to 12 percent lower risk type 2 diabetes. We also examined uh, cardiovascular events in the Women's Health Initiative. The diet index was associated with 11% lower risk of cardiovascular disease, 14% lower risk of coronary heart disease, as well as 17% uh, lower risk of heart failure. But we didn't see any significant associations with stroke and atrial fibrillation. So I've uh, started continuing this work and applied the score to another cohort. So the um, so three cohorts actually, the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2 and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. So this is currently not uh, published and I'm actually presenting this data in the next oral abstract session. So I will uh, save most of the findings for that. But just briefly, we did see that higher adherence to the portfolio diet was associated with a 14% lower risk of cardiovascular disease coronary heart disease, as well as uh, stroke in these three cohorts. So, so far I've really just focused on the extreme uh, quantile analysis, but many of these studies also looked at dose response relationships of these dietary patterns with type 2 diabetes incidence. So you can kind of see 
Um, and I'll just uh, briefly show some of these uh, findings. So this one here is from a meta-analysis of those plant-based dietary patterns. And they found, uh, it's in five cohorts, and they found um, there was uh, no evidence for uh, non-linearity, and there's actually a largely uh, linear association with uh, type 2 diabetes incidence. Similarly, for the Nordic dietary pattern meta-analyses that we, um, we did last year, we also see a linear association with type 2 diabetes incidence. For the, <clears throat> for, sorry, for the Mediterranean diet, the um, association is slightly nonlinear, but it's kind of showing that um, there's a steeper inverse relation with greater scores of the Mediterranean diet with type 2 diabetes. And then finally, um, we also looked at this. This is just in the Women's Health Initiative, but we also see a linear association with um, type 2 diabetes incidence. So, Overall, these are important findings as it suggests that the more of these foods uh, you can consume or the greater adherence to these dietary patterns, the lower risk you will have of type 2 diabetes. So one of the um, interesting and frequent questions that I get about these plant-based dietary pattern indices is how uh, well they are correlated. So I did analysis uh, comparing um, a number of these uh, scores. So this is this table shows the mean Spearman correlation coefficients between dietary pattern indices in the Nurses Health 1 and 2 and Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the Nordic diet here, um, but it probably would look similar to some of the other correlations we see here. And I bolded the ones that um, were above uh, 0.7, and generally the portfolio diet, the Mediterranean, and the DASH diet were the most highly correlated dietary pattern indices. So I just want to do uh, a little bit about some future directions. I know Frank uh, nicely reviewed this. Study. So that's the incorporation of metabolomics into these analyses, objective biomarker for dietary assessment. And they can also be used to characterize adherence and metabolic response to these dietary patterns, as well as help identify signatures of the dietary patterns and provide insights into how they can influence disease risk. So here's an example that was also shown yesterday, it's diet indices and type 2 diabetes, um, and specific found which um, uh, metabolites were correlated with the healthy plant-based diet, and then saw if those metabolites would be associated with a lower risk of, of type 2 diabetes, um, and they did observe that. Um, so kind of gives some more strength to the findings of the self-reported dietary data. Another example here is from the Mediterranean diet. So I know Frank and Jordi were involved with this. Um, and in this case, they actually le leveraged samples from a, the PREDIMED trial um, so they could characterize a medical signature of the Mediterranean diet and then um, replicated that in the US Harvard cohorts and uh, saw if, it could if the signature could predict um, future CBD risk. And they did see that the um, signature could project CBD risk in both populations. So um, for the portfolio diet, we do plan to do a similar analysis um, to the one I just showed. So we were fortunate to receive funding from Diabetes Canada to, to pursue this work. And um, Dr. John Piper is the PI. Um, and we will be, um, or we are analyzing the metabolites from several metabolically controlled portfolio diet trial, so that all the food was provided, so hopefully we'll get um, a nice robust signature that characterizes the portfolio diet, and then we hope to replicate those in the Harvard cohorts and relate it to type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease risk. And right now, they're currently being analyzed at the Broad Institute, and um, we're hoping we'll actually get the results sometime this month, so hopefully at a further meeting or future meeting, we can share some of those findings with you. All right, so I'll end with some conclusions. So the um, evidence from the observational research shows that several high quality plant-based dietary patterns are beneficial for preventing type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. The findings from the dose response relationships show that even small changes could help um, or could positively impact cardiometabolic disease risk, but the more of those foods you add, um, the lower the risk. And even though um, 
There's a lot of overlap in some of these dietary patterns. They were not perfectly correlated with each other based on my correlation analyses. So um, I think this is really important because this can um, um, result in uh, patients and clients being able to choose one that best aligns with their values, preferences, and treatment goals to ensure the greatest adherence um, over the long term for preventing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So I'd just like to thank um, all of my uh, colleagues, as well as my current mentors, Dr. Frank Hu and Dr. David Jenkins, as well as my PhD supervisor. And thank you for listening. Well, thank, thank you, Andrea, for this <clears throat> extensive overview of the relationship between plant-based diets and the diabetes. Uh, and now um, we're going to have the next presentation uh, by Chris Mariangeli. Uh, and the title of this presentation is Evaluating Plant Protein in U.S. Diets Using Three Cycles of NKNs, Considerations for Protein Quality and Nutrition Adequacy. Uh, Chris uh, has been uh, involved for many years uh, with uh, pulses in Canada and now is with the uh, innovative uh, project of plant proteins in Canada. So he is an ideal person to uh, make this presentation. Time is thank yours. You. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, before I jump in, thank you to the organizers of the, the conference for giving me the opportunity to present here. Um, I work out of my home just outside Toronto and usually my business trips are to Regina, Saskatchewan. So this is a very welcome change. And if you've never heard of Regina, Saskatchewan, there's a reason why you've never heard of Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, so today I'm going to present some data that I've been working on um, over the last year or so with a colleague of mine, Dr. Kevin Miller from General Mills, looking at pr uh, protein quality in diets uh, of Americans using the Anna Haynes data set, um, and also looking at nutritional adequacy. Uh, just some of my potential conflicts of interest, I am an employee of Protein Industries Canada, I'm a former employee of Pulse Canada and Kellogg Canada, and this research was co-funded by Protein Industries Canada, Pulse Canada, and General Mills. Obviously, there's a career shift for me in between here. So um, I think the previous speakers have done a really great job of summarizing the, the linkages between plant-based dietary patterns and risk of, of cardiometabolic diseases. And I think uh, what's important to emphasize is global discussions are increasingly bringing in a third pillar here, and that is the environmental sustainability piece around plant-based uh, dietary patterns. And when we, when we interlink those three things, uh, the dietary pattern, linkages to cardiometabolic disease, and the environment, most of the conversations really do hone in on plant protein and the displacement of animal protein in those uh, plant-based dietary patterns. It really hasn't had a lot of conversation um, over the last decade or so, likely because uh, plant-based dietary patterns are quite rare, but they are picking up traction as these global discussions are happening, dietary guidelines are being modified, and this issue around or, or questions around protein quality are increasingly rearing their head in these conversations as dietary patterns are changing. So protein quality describes the characteristics of a protein in relation to its ability to achieve defined metabolic actions. And the, the two main ways that you measure protein quality is the PDCAS method, the protein digestible corrected amino acid score, or the, di the digestible indispensable amino acid score. But the fundamentals are quite similar. Protein quality is dependent on the supply of indispensable amino acids relative to indispensable amino acid requirements of the specific population, and then the digestibility of indispensable amino acids, which is a proxy for their bioavailability. And the challenge really is, is when we look at protein quality across animal and plant-based foods, typically plant-based foods or plant protein foods have a lower protein quality than their animal counterparts, with the exception of soy. So to the left of that red line, uh, you have basically animal proteins and, and soy protein, where the protein quality measured by PDCAS is generally close to perfect, over 90%. But there's a lot more variability in protein quality for plant protein foods, uh, just over to all the way up to 80, 85%. And the challenge with plant proteins generally is they're lacking one or more indispensable amino acids. The digestibility values are actually quite high, but it's that indispensable amino acid uh, content that is the challenge. And that's what this old notion around complementary proteins and making up for the shortfalls in indispensable amino acids between different categories of foods. To make things even more challenging, when we look at protein requirements in Canada and the US, we rely on the 
uh, the, the, uh, the National Academies of Sciences to come up with the dietary um, uh, reference amounts, the estimated average requirements for 50% of the population and the DRDA for 98%, based on uh, uh, grams of protein per kilogram body weight. These recommendations are actually based on very high quality protein diets. Even when looking at vegetarian diets, there was a high degree of complementarity when they came up with these, with these recommendations. And then obviously, whenever we're shifting dietary patterns, we can't ignore uh, nutrients of concern. And when we talk about replacing animal protein, vitamin B12, zinc, and vitamin D often make their way into those conversations. So similar to what uh, Andrea presented, when we talk about plant-based diets, generally there's, there's various degrees, but they are quite similar in the sense that there is this broad recommendation of the whole or part, uh, most, uh, the removal of most animal foods from, from dietary patterns. So what we wanted to look at as, you know, it's my job to, to grow Canada's plant footprint in the, the plant protein sector, we want to evaluate the protein quality and nutritional adequacy of, uh, of uh, diets that index higher in plant protein within the U.S. population. So we used three cycles of the NHANES data set from 2013 to 2018, focusing on adults, 15,000 individuals or subjects were analyzed in the study. And we looked at defined intakes of plant protein, realizing that the average protein intake amongst the majority of Americans is about 30% plant protein. We really want to look at ambitious levels of where we are in a, a cross-sectional analysis. So we use defined levels intake, 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and greater than 75% of plant protein in those diets. We use the various databases as a part of the NHANES data set to do the analysis using uh, day one, 24-hour recalls. And just to focus in on that protein quality piece, we measured protein quality for the population using the PDCAS method, the Protein Digestible Corrected Amino Acid Score, as discussed in the FAO's 1991 report. The indispensable amino acid reference pattern that we used from the, was from the latest FAO report from 2013, looking at older children, adolescents, and adults, because our population was adults. Uh, we assumed true nitrogen protein digestibility values to be 80, which is actually quite conservative and our PDCAS values are truncated to one. So looking at plant protein, uh, a protein, uh, uh, absolute protein intake as plant, pro as plant protein increased in diets, there was a reduction in absolute protein intake across the, the population with the greatest reductions happening in levels greater than 50% in the diet. And when we quantified that protein intake as grams per kilogram body weight, um, and looked at just a mean comparison to the recommended, recommended levels, generally looking at absolute levels of intake at, at up to 75%, individuals were meeting the, uh, the RDA and the EAR, and things sort of dropped off a little bit in the highest defined level of protein intake. We looked at the percentage of individuals consuming protein below the EAR, again, looking at the absolute levels of, of protein intake. And there was a jump in individuals uh, not meeting that uh, the EAR value in the, the levels of defined protein intake greater than 50% a part of the diet, and even higher jump at greater than 75%. But it's only one part of the story. When we applied PDCAS or evaluated PDCAS across those dietary patterns, there was a significant reduction in PDCAS as plant protein uh, consumption did increase, with the greatest reductions happening of no surprise when those plant protein intakes were greater than 50%. When we apply that to the, the, that correction factor to the absolute intake, obviously the corrected protein intake for quality is substantially reduced. And there's a reason for that, is when we looked at where individuals were getting their protein in the diet, so as plant protein was increasing, they were increasingly focusing on one food category to get their dietary protein, and that was the grains group. And then if you look at that 50 to 70% defined level of intake, followed by snacks and sweets, some meat and poultry. And those foods that we define as plant protein foods actually re um, made up relatively small amounts of plant protein in those dietary patterns. The same for the, the highest uh, defined level of plant protein intake. So I apologize, this is a bit of a busy slide, but it sort of represents the next steps in this analysis. So we have the protein, the corrected protein, and the red dot represents the, the absolute protein in grams per kilogram body weight overlaying the RDA and EAR, uh, we apply that corrected protein as grams per kilogram body weight, we are gonna see a reduction in not meeting their, the recommended intakes for, for protein, and that's the, the next steps in this analysis. Looking at nutritional adequacy across uh, the lifespan, 
um, as plant protein intake increased, there were some challenges with respect to um, um, substantial um, uh, number of individuals um, having levels of uh, calcium intakes, vitamin B12, vitamin D, and zinc below the estimated average requirement. Um, and as expected, uh, dietary fiber went up as plant protein increased. Sodium really wasn't an issue. Uh, There's still a lot of sodium consumed even at the highest level of uh, plant protein intake. So the key takeaways uh, from this uh, brief presentation, protein and corrected protein intakes were substantially decreased when plant protein represented greater than 50% of protein in the diet. The percentage of individuals with protein levels below the ER substantially increases in those greater than uh, 50 years of age. Uh, reductions in protein quality with, with plant greater than 50% was due to high reliance of cereals as a primary protein source with a lack of complementarity from known protein foods such as legumes and nuts and seeds. While the proportion of individuals with dietary, in, dietary fiber intakes greater than the adequate intake increased higher levels of plant protein, the proportion of individuals with intakes less than the ER, vitamin D and zinc also increased. Uh, protein quality through maturity as well as other strategies should be promoted as a nutritive pillar for effective transition from traditional Western type diets to ambitious plant-based dietary patterns that align with health and environmental outcomes. And with that, uh, thank you again for the opportunity. I do want to thank uh, my colleague, Dr. Kevin Miller from General Mills, who's actually an eye on me, and uh, Dr. Victor Fulgoni, who is also a uh, collaborator on the study from Nutrition Impact. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to ask the presenters to come to the front and uh, the floor is open for questions. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Okay. A question for uh, Neil Bernard and also Anna in relation to this clinical trial that we have published this year uh, on um, vegan diets in comparison to, to Mediterranean diet. It's an interesting study because it never has been uh, conducted this comparison. Uh, but I have uh, some... Uh, so I have been surprised when I have seen a reduction at the end of the trial of 500 kilocalories in the vegan diet and uh, an increase of, I don't remember, so 20, 20 kilocalories in the, in the group that has been relocated to the Mediterranean diet. So 500 kilocalories is too much kilocalories. It seems that we are giving uh, in order to lose weight for people that have overweight and obesity. So uh, I have seen also uh, the results in relation to the changes that occurs in the three-day records that you have used, if I remember. Uh, but you do not have, an, you, 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 you have some data in relation to ob objective measurements of adherence to the diet because uh, it for me is is surprising, uh, it's very, very interesting. And the second thing is that I have like to say a small correction to Neil that in uh, in case of PredMed, he said that we do not have observed uh, a loss of body weight. So at long term, we have observed small reduction in body weight in both groups randomized to the trial compared to the low fat diet that is not a vegan diet, okay? But uh, it's a small correction at long term, it is a medium term, one, one year and four months. But in case of PREDIMED was long term, at five years, we have observed also uh, a reduction uh, in body weight and weight circumference in both groups in both Mediterranean diet groups compared to the low fat group. Thank you, Diego. Do we have Dr. Barnard with us? 
Dr. Barnard, would you want to comment on the pred uh, on the um, on the VegMed study? If not, I will jump in. Oh, okay. Yes, please do, Dr. Kalyama. Oh, please, uh, and uh, you know, you jump in. Um, I'm sorry to say I had some technical uh, difficulties connecting during the Q&A session, so I only just this second got in. So uh, let me leave this question to you if I may. Okay, uh, let me jump in on this. Uh, so in the, in the study where we compared a vegan and a Mediterranean diet, there were no calorie limits in either group. It, it, you know, this was an ad libitum diet in both groups. Uh, and there were only key components, you know, that people were, you know, asked to do. And I completely agree with you. Um, you know, people consumed more calories on the Mediterranean diet, which uh, may well just, uh, you know, explain a large portion of the differences between the groups. Uh, but, you know, again, there were no calorie limits in either group, in on either diet. Um, and so... Um, People were consuming four tablespoons of olive oil on the Mediterranean diet would, you know, be a large portion of the 500 calorie uh, difference between the groups. Thank you. If you don't mind, my, if you don't mind my going ahead and jumping in in that case, was was the concern that the uh, diets were not isocaloric? That's right. Okay. Well, um, if, just very briefly, when you're patients come into a clinic, um, they, it's helpful to give them a diet that they can follow ad lib. They're not going to be regulating their calories. They're not going to be getting meals from a metabolic kitchen that, that, mod, that control their caloric intake. So a plant-based diet or a Mediterranean diet doesn't defy the laws of thermodynamics. Um, the reason that people don't lose weight on a Mediterranean diet is because it includes a lot of calorie-dense foods, whether it's poultry, or if it is 40% fat, it contains olive oil, which is 100% fat. Although we describe it with nice terms like virgin, it still has nine calories in every gram. And so that, that does explain the reason why people don't uh, lose weight on that kind of diet very effectively. On a plant-based diet, you're having a lot of fiber, which has some calories, but almost none. It has carbohydrate, which is low in calories compared to fat. And so when people's appetite is satisfied with fewer calories because of the high fiber, high uh, carbohydrate content, plus the increase in G1 that Dr. Calio, you've de demonstrated in your research, um, people's caloric intake drops, and that's the reason that they, that they lose weight. So they do it without intending to or without thinking about it, but it's very, very simple. Uh, do you want to do a follow-up? Uh, okay. Please be brief. Let's yes. not completely uh, answer it, Mike. Uh, uh, do you have some marker of tenants to the intervention, objective marker of attendance? Because I have seen this reduction of 500 kilocalories, and when you say you uh, analyze, for example, the post percentage of, uh, of fat coming from monounsaturated fatty acids, I have a small increase. In, 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 the, in the Mediterranean diet, a small increase in the percentage of energy from monounsaturated fatty acids that the, uh, perhaps uh, people do not have, do not adhere to the Mediterranean diet. It's for this that I don't know if you have some uh, objective marker of adherence to the intervention in order to understand the results. With regard to adherence to these diet things, you can ask people how they're doing, and, and we typically do that in the veg mill every week for their adherence to the various parts of the diet. That's self-report. And then you can look at the other markers that you might expect to go along along with it to see uh, what, what, what you see now. Now, I should hasten to point out that our results showing effectively no weight loss with the Mediterranean diet, as disappointing as that may be, it's exactly what we saw in PREDIMED term or the long term. The weight loss was really very modest in the Leone gain weight. Um, and that's just what one sees. And in clinical practice, when we recommend Mediterranean diets, or for those people who are still doing that, um, it is better 
typically than the diet people were following before. That should really be acknowledged. Um, but weight lag doesn't tend to occur for the reasons we've discussed, and lipids don't tend to drop. Um, blood pressure does improve, and overall, it's certainly better than, than what people were doing before, but, but it, it doesn't have the, the same effects that we see with a really plant-based diet. Okay, I saw. Okay. Um, I Go ahead, please. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Bernard. My name is Sabrina from Toronto. Um, I appreciated your, your perspective on the nutrition and, and doing these uh, studies. I was wondering if you offered any, um, I guess, social support for making these big diet changes. Um, I know a lot of people probably go home and their families are giving them grief for not in with them, right? Um, was there any social support or, or um, social groups maybe to help people adhere to the diets? Yes, and, and, and that's such an important point that you've raised. People need help with their diet. When, if a person goes home from a clinic and the clinician has a bad judgment, this is a genetic diet, nobody wants to go to dinner with them anymore. If somebody has a portion control diet and mom brings out the lasagna and you realize the amount that you can eat within your 100 calorie diet, um, there are all kinds of problems with that. Um, so a plant-based diet does have exclusions. Um, but you don't have these other restrictions. So it tends to be easier. But yes, uh, people will have all kinds of issues that come up with any kind of diet. So it's important not to abandon the patient. So what we do is we have a one-time dietetic visit, which can be followed up if you want to later, but you typically don't need to. And then in a research study, get everybody together on a weekly Zoom call to just ask what challenges anybody might have had. And they'll always have something. And then you work, the, the group works it out together. Um, clinics can offer these even live and in person, but just to make it easy, um, there are Zoom groups that meet every week um, throughout the world. Uh, we've sponsored them, they're free. And so people just join one of those. And if they've got a question, there are always people there to, to help them sort it out. That's great to hear, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another in the back, thank you. Uh, Stefan Kabel from Berlin in Germany. Um, I would like to know um, the, I, would, I would like to know something about the controversy between uh, weight loss when comparing the Mediterranean diet and the vegan diet and the long-term outcomes. So um, you noted that uh, using a vegan diet is more successful for weight loss, but if you have ever looked at uh, the PREDIMED uh, trial and the long-term outcomes, then this trial was able to, to see a strong impact on cardiovascular mortality irrespective of weight loss. So maybe weight loss isn't even necessary, maybe it's even uh, not helpful for this uh, long-term perspective. So what is your comment on that? Um, if that question was directed at me, let me invite others to comment first, and then I certainly just have some, some thoughts that I'd be glad to share. Um, feel free to answer. Um, it's, the question is open to anyone. Okay, it's addressed to Neil or to Hannah? Um, Professor Bernard. Yep. Okay. Um, the PREDIMED trial, I think, was a, a brilliantly done trial. It was a very large trial. The, the investigators should be complimented on their skills at recruitment and participant retention and their honesty and integrity in carrying the trial out. <clears throat> the um, changes were not dramatically robust with regard to cardiovascular health overall, I would have to say. But if you do a, a, a combined measure of all cardiovascular endpoints together, then you do see a good drop of about 30% um, over time. That's good. Um, and so they are to be praised and, and no one can take that away from them. Um, we see in individuals who make bigger changes, as Dean Ornish showed us 30 years ago with the Lifestyle Heart Trial, bringing in individuals and putting uh, them on a diet that is essentially plant-based and adding exercise to it. What he showed was that you could actually have angiographic uh, findings of the arteries actually physically opening. And then in his five-year follow-up, um, what you could see is that the, the benefits just continue. Um, and in talking with the individuals following this, that was actually our first study on, on adherence because we wanted to know it's, it's great that your angina went away, that you lost weight, and that your arteries are opening up, but how do you like it? And what we found was very strong um, appreciation of that kind of diet as well. Um, another way of looking at it is with people who have self-selected this kind of diet 
over the long run. And that's the advent of self-study too, where you have people who've been doing this kind of diet for years, maybe decades, and they maintain a BMI on average five points lower than omnivores. Um, and their other health measures tend to be very, very good as well. Um, but I do think, I, I, I have to say, I would love it to do a, 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 a study as large as Predimed, starting as they did with people on diets of an everyday life and following them as the Predimed researchers did. I think that would be a, a great study to do using a vegan diet. I am looking forward to the results of that study. Sure. Okay, <laughs> I think that's probably one of the last questions, unless there is a pressing. Yeah. Um, okay, please this, go ahead. This is one more question we've got for Bernard, um, and I'm sort of touching on some of the questions, the two of the questions that have already been asked. I guess um, we're really relying heavily on patients um, having a good education and knowledge of the diet, um, and we also already know that these, this cohort of patients are already lack motivation. So I guess my question here is, um, do you really think this diet is truly sustainable long term for the, um, you know, the management of, t of diabetes? And also, how would you deal with um, monitoring and um, like supplementing um, micronutrients, so like B12, iodine, zinc? Um, well, first of all, regarding micronutrients, um, all those things should be monitored in all patients. If you bring in patients with, with diabetes, they've been following all kinds of crazy diets. Um, they may be deficient in all kinds of things. Um, they're deficient in fiber and vitamin C and things like that if they're on an omnivorous diet. Um, we shouldn't imagine that an omnivorous diet is particularly robust with regards to its nutrient quality. When people do an alternate uh, healthy eating index evaluation of a transition to a vegan diet, needless to say, their dietary quality improves quite dramatically. But you do want to in ensure that people are taking uh, B12, um, and it's good to look at other indices as well that can certainly be done. Now, the question comes, can a person who has only modest motivation and not much education follow this kind of diet? They're not going to follow any diet very well. Um, if we refer a patient um, to um, a dietitian, and the dietitian gives them standard advice, telling them to cut calories every day of their life for the rest of their life until they reach an ideal diet, it's just not going to happen. Um, if you ask somebody to adhere to a Mediterranean regime and you give them the, the criteria, for example, as we elaborated in the uh, Predimed trial, um, the likelihood of that's not so high. So with a plant-based diet, it's really simple. We don't eat allies and we try to keep oils low. That latter part about oils is the more challenging part because let's face it, manufacturers are keen to throw grease into everything you eat. Um, and people do need support in making diet changes. But a plant-based diet is as easy as any other. It's substantially cheaper um, than other diets, and it's one that um, has other motivations that bring people to it. That said, we need to look at people with diabetes and weight issues. We need to support them, and uh, that's true of any diet, but it's, it's certainly true of a plant-based diet. And I've never seen anyone unable to do it. We've done comparisons by various races, various ages, and various ethnicities, and we see, see the same effect uh, regardless of these variables. I think I saw a hand over there. If not, okay. Yeah, you are the last one. No? Annette Bügel from Paderborn. I have a question to Chris. Um, because I think it's very important to see that there is apparently a large percentage of population um, within the um, people who are consuming plant-based protein who might end up not having um, uh, protein adequacy. And you said it's uh, mainly due because they are eating too much cereals and not enough pulses and legions. Um, can you um, quantify this in some way? Because if people do that, then we will have more people doing this because of all the planetary health diet thing going on. We would need um, practical advice for them. What could they swap? Do you have any indications in that direction? I, I think the, uh, the just cursory look at it is when they're replacing the animal protein, they're replacing it with, with cereals. It's, it's filling the gap. There's been studies out of France that show when you replace animal protein and you bring in a modest mix of beans, legumes, and uh, uh, nuts and seeds, the uh, lysine, the, the proportion of individuals that are lysine deficient 
drops off dramatically. So it doesn't take much. It's just that replacement portion. The grains consumption can likely stay the same. I don't think we want to veer people away from consuming whole grains. It's that protein replacement and what's filling that void and the foods that are being used. And in the case of this, it's cross-sectional. It's, it's cereals that are filling the void. It's the cereal consumption is going up. Yeah. So the message is really simple. Just if you do that, Plant protein make foods, sure. Because it'll, it'll complement cereals. It'll automatically fill the, the, the lysine challenges with cereals, and the lysine will fill the sulfur amino acids from the, from the legumes. Thank you. Yeah. I want to thank um, everybody. Um, do, do, you, do you mind if I just jump in on that really quickly? Uh, um, but please, please. Um, uh, very, very briefly. It's important to not miss the fact that when people are getting their protein from animal sources, yes, they'll get more protein. But the 2016 review that came out of Harvard, the first, uh, first author was Min Yang Song. They showed that when people substitute uh, in place of animal protein, plant protein, mortality over the long run goes way down. So people are getting adequate protein, whether they base their diet on grains or pulses or other foods. Um, but they also should be realizing that it's not just a question of getting enough protein. When the protein comes from plant sources, overall health and over, is improved and overall, overall mortality is substantially reduced, regardless of which animal protein we're talking about. OK, uh, thank you. I appreciate everyone. Contributions, uh, we had a very interesting uh, session. We have covered issues of adequacy and health. Uh, we have covered issues of theoretical as well as practical applications. And still, uh, the question has not been uh, answered. Uh, the question was, do plant-based diets should be recommended to all persons with diabetes? And I think uh, all went in the same direction, but nobody said a return. Yes, even Neil Barnard. Anyway, uh, thanks to everyone. And uh, okay, the the, okay. the co-chair wants to say can something. Just, uh, I'm sorry, I guess. Can we just have a hands up for those who believe uh, that the question asked can have a yes? Anyone who thinks it can have a yes, put your hand up. We've got quite a lot of yes hands up. Uh, and there are quite a few who are yes, but then don't go back to yes. So I think we've probably got sort of we're 50% there. Thank you. Okay, it's time for a break.
I will stand here. So if you get stuck. Hey! Hey! Now the fun ends. The doors are shut. You are all on tenterhooks. We'd like those at the back to come to the front um, and turn off their mobiles and turn off their computers. We have the fun session now where there are, goodness, about 16 presentations. They have been allocated five minutes each, and they're going to speak for three and a half minutes, and we invite them for one and a half minutes. And we're going to be fierce about this, and if there are no hands up and no microphones, one of us will, will ask the questions. We are going to ask the speakers to attempt to tell us why their paper is relevant to diabetes. That's important. Uh, to keep to time, to smile, and is there anything else that I should have said? <laughs> oh, and we're going to then introduce them one by one with the hope that um, that will leave Vladimir with less than everybody else because he's very tired. <laughs> so um, no delays. And thank you to the guys at the back uh, the projection guys, nobody's thanked them yet, but we'll thank them now. They have a bit of a job here, so it is important to keep to time, because otherwise they miss their tea. Um, Sarah, introduction's over, but I'm going to hand you quickly to Annette to do the introduction, which is not necessary. Yes, it's not necessary, but maybe the next person could always uh, be already present here at, uh, at the desk, uh, so that you can swap quickly. Okay, so Sarah de las Eras Delgado. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sara de las Heras, de las Heras Delgado from Rovira Gili University. This is short presentation. It's about the study, Our Plant-Based Alternative Healthcare, a two-dimensional evaluation from the nutritional processing standpoint. I have a not conflict of interest. Nowadays, uh, the tendency of increasing the consumption of plant-based food will continue growing in Western countries. As a result, has been an increase in, in the marketed availability of plant-based alternative products, especially for meat and dairy food, and their relative nutritional quality in comparison to the animals or molluscs is poorly documented. For this reason, the objective of this study was to characterize and evaluate the plant-based alternative available on the market in Spain in comparison to animal products in terms of their nutritional composition and profile and degree of process. To achieve the same, the following descriptive and between plant-based alternative products and their processed or unprocessed homologs of animal origin. We extract information of veggie-based database and Spanish supermarkets we focused on these five categories, as you can see in this slide. We use the nutritional components from the product labeling. To analyze this nutritional profile, we use the Nutri-Score Nutri algorithms and NOVA system criteria for processed degree. Moving on to the result section, in this table, we can see that plant-based alternative products had a higher content of sugar, salt, and fiber, and lower content of saturated fatty acid and protein in comparison to that animal homologs. In this slide, I can see the comparison of the nutritional profile. Unprocessed fish and meat have a better nutritional profile than their plant-based alternative according to the Nutri-Score algorithms. This figure shows the distribution of the nutrient algorithms of the study foods according to the NOVA classification criteria. Within food products classified as ultra-processed, there was a wide variation of Nutri-Score. In conclusion, the results of the current study show that most plant-based alternative products have a better nutrient profile than animal-based homologs. However, cheese, fish, and meat, P uh, PBAPs, or uh, plant-based products have poorer nutrient profile and were more Given the high degree of processing and variable nutritional profile uh, Plant-based alternative products require a multidimensional evaluation of their health impact. 
thank you um, for the opportunity. <laughs> Okay, any question from the audience? No. Okay, otherwise I'd ask a question. Don't you think that l a lot of the differences are due to the fact that nutri uh, the Nutri-Score considers fiber as a beneficial component which animal products by the definition cannot have? Yeah, and we didn't do the debate on the Okay, um, so when you look at the nutrient profile, you yeah. look at the Nutri-Score profile, right? Yeah. But by definition, plant products would have fiber which animal products would not have. Wouldn't you need to take that out of your co comparison? Okay, um, in this one, in this study, we compare to the nutritional content of all, all the sugar, of all, all sample, of sample of plant-based, of sample of uh, animal-based, but it's a uh, processed products and animal-based uh, with not processed, with not processed and. Also, we analyze the nutritional profile with, with NutriScore and mm, the processing degree with the NOVA system. Uh, we have Stefan Benici from Chile from Toronto. They say, they say Spain and Canada, so I'm not sure whether she's speaking English or Spanish. Don't worry, I'll speak English you for have this Spanish one. Eyes. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I have no potential conflicts of interest for this project. So as many, if not all, know, your COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 bug. Over 14 million people have been tested COVID positive, leading to a thousand deaths. Now, vitamin D deficiency has been related to reduced immune effect due to viral infection. And clinical trials have demonstrated that correcting for vitamin D deficiency can reduce the severity of infection. But what about in the case of prevention? So this brought us to our question, which is, what is the impact of vitamin D exposure from both medication and dietary sources in COVID-19 susceptibility in older Spanish adults with overweight or obesity and metabolic syndromes? Now, to do this, we conducted a case control study within the framework of the PREDIMED Plus trial, which we heard about earlier today. And this trial has 23 centers across Spain. And we looked at COVID-19 positive cases matched in a one to two ratio by age, sex, uh, BMI status, trial intervention group, as well as the study center to controls. We assessed their dietary intake using a validated and semi-quantitative uh, three item food frequency questionnaire and associated that with Spanish food composition tables. We assessed medication and supplement use by self-report at clinic visits, and we looked at COVID positive cases, and this was done by serological analysis such as antigen and PCR tests, as well as medical records and adjudication by the clinical event assertment committee at the trial. And then for our analyses, we conducted one-way ANOVA and chi-squared for our descriptive statistics and logistic regression to look at associations adjusting for relevant covariates. Now, what did we find? In this trial, there was over 600 individuals that tested positive for COVID-19, and this was matched to 1,266 controls. And as you can see by the table, they based on these characteristics. Now, when we look at their vitamin D exposure, we didn't see any differences from a dietary perspective in cases and condition. The main food sources of vitamin D were fish, eggs, fortified cereal products, oils, and meats. Now, I just want to put it into perspective. Um, the recommendations for adequate intake in the European population for vitamin D is 600. And so our study population was well below this. And when we looked at supplemental vitamin D exposure, less than 15% of both cases and controls took vitamin D supplements between the two groups. Now, when we looked at the odds ratios for the incident, we didn't see differences based on dietary intake exposure levels, which is higher versus lower in this uh, study population, or vitamin D supplement use. So, 
overall, what can we say? Well, one of the strengths of this study is that that collected prior to the pandemic, as well as during the pandemic. However, one of the major limitations of this study is that we don't have serum vitamin D hydroxy, uh, serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D level data at this time to assess. So overall, habitual vitamin D exposure from supplements and dietary sources does not appear to impact COVID-19 susceptibility in older adults with metabolic syndrome. However, future research is needed to examine the efficacy of vitamin D supplementation and reducing the incidence of infection with concentration of serum levels in different populations. And thank you. We have one question, Tom Wollover. Very good, thank you. Dr. Wollover. Yes, Dr. Wollover. I wondered if you were able to do any assessment of uh, sun exposure uh, in for vitamin D. That's a really good question. So we did take into account the study center, which looked at compared north versus south um, centers among, among Spain, but we don't have information necessarily specific to sun exposure. But there are some other questionnaires that were conducted during COVID time to look at what variables and what their living situations were like. So I'm really looking forward to delving into that data. Thank you, Stephanie. Could somebody bring the moving microphone to the front so we can use it when needed without wasting time? For the next talk, um, not many of you know this, but Stephanie has an identical twin sister. Um, and I, the identical twin sister, Stephanie, will present the next talk, which is on gamification. <laughs> Completely different field. Lucky we've got two of them. Well, thank you very much. And while the slides just get put up on the screen, I want to acknowledge that inspiration for this next project was from the Toronto 3D team and the portfolio diet app led by Dr. John Ziebenpiper, and who will, will be hearing presentations from Dr. Laura Kiroli and Megan Kavanaugh in the near future of this conference. So I'm not sure if the... Can we have the slides? If not, I can just speak to it just to save time if needed. Um, keep going. Okay, so I have no potential conflicts of interest to declare for this next project, um, but for, uh, I'm going to be talking about gamification in regards to cardiometabolic risk. So for this, over 2.5 billion individuals use a health-related um, app or application as what I'll be referring to. Oh, thank you very much. So I'll just skip through these. Um, and over 50% of individuals who have used one of these apps have installed a health behavior related one. However, it's active usage that has been shown to be effective, but who has downloaded an app and then never used it again? So factors that influence active usage require further study. So gamification, which is the use of game element in non-game situation, may support active usage. And examples of gamification include point systems, challenges, leaderboards, and so forth. So our question was, do apps with gamification have greater beneficial effects on metabolic risk factors in adults compared to apps without gamification? So to do this, we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials following the Cochrane Handbook and PRISMA guidelines. We searched the Medline, Embase, and Cochrane Library, as well as conducted manual searches. To guide our search, we used the PCOX framework. So we were looking at adults with an intervention of an uh, app with gamification compared to one without, and we looked at outcomes. So from behavior change, dietary intake, markers of adiposity, all the way to physical activity at, over at least a two month period. We conducted our analyses using primary pooled analyses and the generic inverse variance using random or fixed effects depending on the number of studies available. And we assessed heterogeneity by the Cochrane's Q and quantified it by the I squared statistic. We assessed the quality of the included studies using the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, as shown on the screen, as well as the certainty of the evidence using the grade approach. Now, for randomized controlled trials, they start off as a, relative, as a high grade and then can be downgraded by one of the factors shown on your right. So what did we find? Just under 5,000 reports identified, and of these, 24, uh, the majority were parallel with a duration of 8 to 130 weeks from around the world, but the majority from North America, and depends age, ranged in age, 
and health status was mainly healthy or overweight, and they were from multiple platforms and types of gamification intervention. So in terms of our analyses, I just want to draw your attention to the orange boxes. We found that gamification did result in decreases in energy and alcohol intake, a decreased as well as waist circumference, and increases in physical activity and number of steps taken by participants. So there are some limitations to the study, though. Specifically, there was imprecision and inconsistency observed. So overall, our, this evidence suggests that health behavior applications incorporating gamification may increase physical activity, improve aspects of dietary intake, and decrease aspects of adiposity, but future research is needed. And I want to give a big shout out, especially to um, my collaborators, both from the Human Nutrition Unit and Toronto 3D team, Megan Kavanaugh, who's in the audience, and Kim as well, um, who continue to work on this team. So thank you very much. Well, yeah. Well done. We have a microphone. We have two microphones now. Questions from Anne. Okay, thank you very much for two excellent presentations. Thank the latter you. one, I, I noticed there was some or quite a few variables that were not significant. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, body weight. So uh, did you just, you know, you've made a lot of comparisons. How did you well, adjust for that? <laughs> yes, that's a really good point and something, this is an ongoing project that we're continuing to look into and not all of the comparisons included the same trials within their comparisons. Um, but we recently updated the search and because a lot of things did go virtual over the past number of more studies that have looked at gamification. Um, so we're really delving into that search and taking that into consideration because I know there are a lot of different outcomes that we are looking at. So thank you very much for that. Well done. We have, is another question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was just very curious about um, if you've done subgroup analyses on the types of gamifications uh, and if some were more beneficial than others. That's a great question. and. As you can see, at time, there's only a small number of trials for the different outcomes. The only ones at this time that had 10 or more um, was for physical activity. Um, but the types of gamification that were identified ranged quite widely amongst them. Um, I didn't get a chance to show this, but there was a range from using point systems, challenges, leaderboards, and so forth. So hopefully with the updated search, we'll be able to look into that a little bit more. Thank you very much. Great job. So we're moving on to the next two presentations, which will both be presented by Marta Vigat uh, from um, Charité. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, um, I'm going to present your European project called PROTEIN, which is an acronym for Vision for Healthy Living. Oui. Um, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. And a bit to understand the background is that we know that an inadequate diet and a sedentary lifestyle are major contributors to the risk of non-communicable diseases. And uh, we believe that a personalized recommendation can lead to uh, change behaviors that can uh, help to manage successfully the control of diabetes, type 2, and pre um, smartphones and tracking devices are nowadays part of our daily lives, and we have more than 44,000 apps available related to healthy lifestyle, but still the evidence of all these nutrition apps is quite scarce, which brings us to um, our project where we developed an application called Protein, which incorporated information from the food preferences, CGM data, health conditions, physical characteristics, and the dietary intake of the party through machine learning and artificial intelligence, we created, well, we have created personalized meals and sport plans to increase, uh, well, to improve the lifestyle. And our main goal in this project was the improvement of time in range by 5%. We also assessed the usability and the adherence of this application. How did we do this? We did a wait list randomized controlled trial with 26 participants with type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes, and they were divided into two groups. The first one started with a protein app and also wearables, the fitness tracker in the shoe, for 12 weeks, followed by a six-week period without the app. 
And the other group did it the other way around where they used the application, I, the, set, the wearable for the six weeks and then incorporated the app for 12 weeks. In both uh, usability questionnaires that uh, were 21 questions. So as we developed an app, the first thing that we needed to know is does this app give the recommendation, proper recommendations? And here we see the nutritional rules on the left side and the protein, the, the ones that the protein app generated were inside of these rules that we established. So these are the characteristics of our participants. We had 16 women, 10 men, 12 of, uh, 12 of them had diabetes, 14 pre-diabetes, and the average age was of uh, 58. We also see the characteristics at baseline and also after the intervention, and there were no significant differences between them except for the GGT. Timing range. This was our main goal of the study. Here, what we compared is the time where the participants used the app was none, and we saw that there was a significant improvement of timing rate while the participants were using the app. I said that we divided these two groups and we checked what happened between these two groups. We saw that the ones that started with intervention was the ones who started with the waiting time. They had a better in range, but it was not significant. And the challenges that we face with this application is to maintain the participant um, using this application for a long time. So what we saw in our study, what happened is that they used it for an average of 45 days out of the 84 days planned. And as for the attrition rate, which englobes these two concepts, compliance and dropout quote, it was in both cases for 50%. And in the case of the compliance, which we defined it by participants who use the application for more than a third of the time planned, uh, we saw that the compliant participants use the application for 17 days, was the non-compliance for 19. And as for the dropouts, we were the participant, uh, participants who did not show up to their planned visits. They, the ones who did not drop out, used the application for 56 days, and the ones who dropped out, um, an average of 34. We also tried to check if there were some characteristics of the participants who could predict, uh, which could predict um, the attrition rate, but we couldn't find any. And, and so we come here to the questionnaires. The participants also filled the questionnaires to see what happened also, or what did they think of this application. This is this M Health Usability we Questionnaire, or MAUC, which is divided into three sections. Sorry about the time, I'm doing two presentations at once. Uh, you, you're combining the two? Yes, yes, okay. I thought that you meant, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, the first, uh, <laughs> the, 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 well, this question is divided in three parts. The first part is about the easiness of use and satisfaction of this application. And what they said is that the participants claimed that it was not easy to use this application, but still they could learn how to use the app. As for the second item, the participants did not feel comfortable using this application in a social setting, but still they said that overall they were satisfied. And as for the third item, they said that this app did not completely help them to manage their health, but still, I, well, sorry, but still they felt confident that the information shared with the health provider was actually good. Um, and then as a conclusion, um, through this study, we saw that a personalized recommendation through this protein app uh, could lead to changes towards a healthier behavior, uh, a healthier lifestyle that consequently improved diabetes control. In this case, we saw it through the improvement of timing range. And as the results from the attrition rate and the questionnaire, we also saw the limitations and the potential areas of improvement um, regarding all these mHealth apps. And as a future perspective, we did this trial from scratch. We developed all this app, we performed the clinical trial, and then like now we analyze the results. So what did we learn from all this? So we learned that app, all these apps need to be simple. <laughs> they really need to be easy to use. They also should be able to incorporate the real-time CGM data. 
they should not be time consuming. It's really a lot of effort to introduce all the food that you eat. So maybe like to perfection all this function with the camera. Also the flexibility in the meal plans that they can exchange food easily. And we saw also in the questionnaire that the two best rated items were actually, they had something to do with the exchange with the healthcare, healthcare provider. So the addition of a human interface would be also very useful. So that's it. If anyone has questions, thank you very much for listening. And also special thanks to my colleague, Elena Lalama, that we did the project together. Any questions on this paper? Um, maybe I will try and jump in. Um, one, why is it called the protein app? Um, in the yeah, that's very confusing. It was an acronym for this personalized nutrition for healthy living. It's, it's, yeah. Nutrition um, approaches often now say that you have to make uh, more goals. Are you planning to do this a little bit more so that the app can tell how is this now conflicting with your personal goals um, and feedback on the is that you could also check, like, choose your goals. For example, we have our, well, our participants had the diabetes feature. Um, but we also could choose the goals, and if the participant chose the goal, for example, um, reducing weight or um, they had an iron deficiency, you could also choose all that and change it also whenever it was necessary. Ah, yeah. Okay. Hello. 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 Um, yours. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, if you have any um, follow up with, we said the head is with the. Our intervention was only that. There were like these six weeks that we also considered them a bit of the follow-up because they were not using the application. It was our control time to see like, okay, what, what's happening? What are the changes between the app time and no app time? So, so you, did, you did not discuss the, the results with them? To, no, 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 no. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, speaker. We have uh, my dear colleague Ingrid Laval Mostad from Norway, please. Thank you. Do you hear me? Um, the background of this study the FDO gene is highly expressed in adipose tissue. And uh, whether non esterified fatty acids, NIFA dynamics, in, is impacted by FDO has not been thoroughly tested for in a study population of uniformly obese and comprising, comprising both sexes. NIFA suppression was investigated in a study named the F2 study using plan procedure and a meal test procedure to explore a possible significance of F2 risk allele on different metabolic aspects. The aim was to test for the association of 939609 F2 risk allele with NIFA suppressed individuals with untreated severe obesity. This overview shows several metabolic variables as well as dietary that were measured and also published. But for now, we focus only on the not yet published, but in the review process. NIFA suppression of the meal test and of the clamp procedure. NIFA suppression was measured in the clamp and in the meal test. The figure shows the insulin concentrations of each genotype before and after minute 120, the red arrow, when insulin infusion started the clamp, and no differences between the genotypes TT, AT, or AA. AA is the hit homozygote of the risk allele. The green arrows in the bottom are the time points of blood sampling where NIFA was analyzed. Based on NIFA was the average concentration of the 120 minute samples and insulin responding NIFA was the average concentration of the 220 to 240 minute samples in the end of the clamp. NIFA suppression in the clamp was the difference between the base and responding NIFA concentrations. And NIFA concentrations in the meal test was the difference between the fasting and the 120 minute prosperandial concentrations. 
The sample of 97 participants had more women than men equally distributed into three genotype groups. And median, median age was 43 years and the BMI 43. And men in the TT group were younger than men in the other groups. Apart from that, the three genotype groups were similar. Here just the anthropometric characteristics are shown. So the results, no genotype association with lymphoid suppression in the crab, neither with the basal lymphoid concentrations. And of the crucible values test appear convincingly non-significant. Independent of genotype, women had higher basal lymphoid and larger lymphoid suppression than men, significantly different. Lymphoid suppression is part of insulin sensitivity. In the active study, we measured both hepatic and total insulin sensitivity in the clamp and insulin sensitivity by the Matsuda index in the mean, all showing the women's sensitivity superior to men's, confirming what also others have reported. A strength of this study was that lymphoid suppression also was measured in the mean test, and the result of the mean test mimicked the clamp results. No genotype association with lymphoid suppression, neither the fast and lymphoid concentration. And again, hence the gene type women had higher fast lymph and large lymph and suppressed different. <coughs> Interest, yeah, some other results, neither fast lymph basal lymph concentration nor the were associated with total fat mass or BMI. This is not a novel result, when first published by Teddy Carter and his work. <coughs> Uh, our results of RQ and the basal metabolic rate in the active, active study were published in Metabolism Open in 2019, and now we were interested in any relationship with our NIFA result, finding that RQ was negatively associated with NIFA suppression. So a higher fasting RQ, signifying lower fat oxidation, was associated with less NIFA suppression. To conclude, in a gender mixed adult population of individuals with severe obesity, and uh, F2 obesity risk allele did not affect basal or fasting NIFA, nor success was displayed as patients both in, uh, in both testings. So this negative results appear strengthened by the confirmatory, but also extermination of associations between NIFA dynamics and levels of insulin sensitivity, as well as of gender. So thanks to the participants and the senior engineers and for the supporting resources and you for listening. Any questions from audience? I see hand on the back. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, we continue. Thanks a lot. That's good. It's, it, it, it's, it's me. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, the next talk will be... Lotte, run, run, run. I think the microphone works best if you're close to it. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Perfect. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, to start off with, uh, I have no conflict of interest. Uh, this uh, research project is funded by, publicly by Innovation Fund Denmark. And the purpose of uh, the research project is to investigate the effect of alginate encapsulated carbohydrates and branch chain amino acids on uh, endurance performance in the form of cycling, substrate utilization, dental health, as well as gastrointestinal symptoms. So what we know is that the carbohydrate intake during endurance exercise has been demonstrated to maintain or improve performance. Uh, current recommendations highlight a high carbohydrate intake with up to 90 grams per hour during exercise. Even though these high rates of ingestion might uh, be beneficial for performance, it also may potentiate gastrointestinal distress, such as abdominal pain, acute and chronic uh, diarrhea, vomiting, and so forth. Uh, also, it may increase the risk of dental erosion. So this is where the idea or the concept of encapsulating these nutrients in an alginate matrix comes in, as it presents a slow release effect, which uh, targets the small intestines and may, due to station, reduce the risk of gastrointestinal distress, as reduce the risk of developing dental erosion as less 
this sugar should be hydrolyzed. <coughs> so, in a randomized uh, crossover clinical trial, uh, 10 participants, this is ongoing, so 10 participants has completed the whole trial so far. Uh, the inclusion criteria were healthy men or are healthy men uh, between the 18 and 50 years of age, uh, accustomed to exercising on a bike, uh, such as cyclists and triathletes, and uh, they had to be quite well trained with a VO2 max of about 50. And uh, the study flow uh, consisted of a preliminary test to ensure that they could be a part of the, uh, uh, the project, uh, followed by uh, three experimental days as we were testing three different products. And there was a washout period of about uh, six, uh, six days to a week uh, between the days. So, a clinical uh, day consisted, or experimental day consisted of an exercise bout on a bicycle uh, for two hours uh, at different intensities, followed by a performance test until exhaustion, which was followed by a two hour recovery period. And during the day, we collected blood, urine, and saliva samples. The participants were provided with, as I mentioned before, three different products during the first exercise bout, and they, uh, consisted of a carbohydrate and branch chain amino acid encapsulated in alginate, carbohydrates only encapsulated in alginate, and uh, carbohydrates only, which was not encapsulated. Uh, and they were all matched on the carbohydrate content. So these are preliminary uh, results. Uh, if you look to the left, uh, the glucose and insulin response, uh, there were no significant differences during exercise. When we look at the recovery period, we found a significantly higher uh, glucose and insulin response for the intake of uh, the carbohydrate product, which was not encapsulated. We found no uh, differences in the time to exhaustion performance test, nor in the pH of the saliva samples. Uh, this is, uh, these are preliminary data and we are still recruiting participants. So if you know anyone uh, in Denmark or who is seeking, just contact me afterwards. Um, we are currently looking, analyzing the data on the gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, lipid response, hormone responses, and so forth. Um, and the idea of this is to understand how the substrate utilization is by prolonging the release rate uh, not only uh, for the beneficial effect for athletes, but also for, for example, uh, athletes with type 1 diabetes or uh, malnourished uh, particip uh, patients and so forth. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time, 20 seconds for the question. How do they taste? Um, there is room for improvement. <laughs> thank you. This is extreme ultra-processing. Okay, so the next speaker comes again from Germany, Stefan Kabit. Thanks a lot for having me here. I do have the ambitious task to present the results from three different randomized controlled trials in just uh, four minutes. And I'm presenting undesired side effects of formula diets on erythropoietic parameters. These are my conflicts of interest. We are funded by public sources, but also by the industry. Um, as you all know, uh, formula diets um, are a very helpful task, a very helpful tool to uh, support weight loss, even diabetes remission, and uh, different available products to support these goals. Lots of those are approved for the use of uh, very few weeks, but actually they are used for longer time, both in clinical practice and in research. Um, uh, quite surprisingly, we have only insufficient data on undesired side, eff side effects. And uh, if we have to look on uh, erythropoiesis, which is the production of red blood cells, we have very poor data, very few data on any kind of dietary intervention. There's some data on low-carb diets or various diets uh, in animals, which uh, mainly was dogs. Uh, and uh, there's uh, some sparse data from human studies showing either detrimental effects by low carb or low fat, beneficial effects by low fat or uh, a diet with an improved dietary inflammatory index, or neutral, in, uh, neutral effects by a low carb diet, or modifast, which is one type of formula diet. So we wanted to see 
if a low-fat diet, which is either conventional or formula, can affect iron metabolism and uh, hematobasis. Therefore, we looked at uh, the red blood cell count and the morphology of those cells and additional iron parameters. We did that in three different randomized controlled trials, comparing two different diets, the one of which was either was uh, low-fat and high-carb, and usually uh, with a lower protein content, and the other one we tried with, with a higher um, protein content. The first study, DNAP, was in pre-diabetes subjects, three weeks of diet just with, with uh, conventional food. Um, DNA D was a study in type 2 diabetes patients, also three weeks, same caloric deficit, um, low carb versus co conventional food. The formula diet was low fat. And uh, we used the Thayer study for this analysis as well. This is the study Bettina Schepelius already presented. Um, this dietary intervention was uh, for three months, and both study arms, um, high protein and low were formula diets. Um, we didn't include any with anemia, iron deficit, or hemochromatosis. We didn't have many smokers, and the blood sampling was 200, 200 milliliters per visit. In the first study, pre-diabetes subjects, both diet arms with conventional food, we saw a very minute drop in uh, red blood cell counts, uh, which was not uh, significantly different between the diets, and the overall effect um, was about 1.5% uh, drop in those uh, cells, and only very minute effects in uh, red blood cell morphology, and also iron and ferritin, which can be linked to other reasons. In um, the study on avert diabetics with um, one formula diet and a low-fat group, we saw a stronger drop in red blood cell counts um, by about 3.5%. Also, some minute effects on um, red blood cell morphology, uh, somewhat stronger effects on iron and ferritin. And uh, in the last study, which was the longest one, with three months of intervention, uh, both diets uh, based on a formula concept, we see a very strong decrease uh, in red blood cell count, hemoglobin and hematocrit uh, by about 5.5%, uh, uh, in particular in the OptiFast group, which is lower in protein, lower in fat, and higher in carbohydrates. We don't see a very striking effect on red blood cell morphology, and all the iron parameters haven't been uh, determined yet. We conclude that a conventional diet, be it uh, hypercaloric, low-fat, or low-carb, uh, doesn't seem to have an effect on red blood cells. Uh, the effects on ferritin might actually mirror an anti-inflammatory outcome. Um, uh, of course, a parallel loss of both iron and vitamin B12 might mask the altered RBC morphology on MCB, MCH, and MCHDH. Um, we conclude that um, low-fat, um, low-protein formula diets might have a stronger impact on red blood cells. This might be, uh, not this might be uh, a long-term risk for anemia. It might also be uh, some kind of a beneficial hemodilution, and we should uh, take care of the validity of HbA1c measurements in uh, those patients. Thanks a lot for listening. Okay, so again, a 20-second question. 20-second question. What was the weight loss on these diets? Bone marrow suppression in acute energy deficiency and weight loss is not surprising. In the first two studies, the weight loss was about uh, three to four kilograms in average in three weeks. Uh, in the FAIR study, it was 10 to 15 kilograms. That's what, what, what he aimed for. Thank you. That's one there. That's Andrea's second talk today, two hours ago. One more. Great. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to be presenting the results from the Portfolio Dietary Pattern and Risk of Cardiovascular Disease findings from three prospective cohort studies. Uh, here are my disclosures. Um, so during the last session, I introduced the Portfolio diet Dietary Pattern. So just briefly, this is a dietary pattern that was originally developed to lower LDL cholesterol, and it includes nuts and seeds, plant protein, viscous fiber, plant sterols, and um, heart-healthy oils, or MUFAs. And our group um, developed a scoring system to measure adherence portfolio diet in observational studies. So this was based on quintiles. So foods that were recommended in the diet would get more points. And then um, we would do the opposite for foods not recommended in the diet, which include um, foods high in saturated fat and cholesterol. So during my PhD, I had the opportunity to apply this score to the um, Women's Health Initiative. So this is a 
prospective cohort study of postmenopausal women in the United States, and we saw that higher adherence to the portfolio diet was associated with lower um, total CVD, uh, coronary heart disease, and heart failure. Um, but there was no uh, association with stroke and atrial fibrillation. So that was the first time we examined the portfolio diet in cohorts and looked at cardiovascular events. So we wanted to confirm these findings in other populations. So this leads to the objective of the current study, which was to examine the relation between the portfolio dietary pattern and the risk of total CVD, CHD, and stroke in three large US prospective cohort studies in men and women. So the three cohorts that were used for this analysis are the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2, as well as the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. Uh, these studies began in the 80s and early 90s, and diet, demographics, uh, lifestyle, and medical history were assessed every two to four years using validated food frequency questionnaires and follow-up questionnaires. Um, and for the primary exposure for this uh, study was a cumulative average of the portfolio diet score over each four-year FFQ cycle. For these statistical analyses, we use Cox regressions with time varying covariates to estimate hazard ratios and 95% confidence intervals with the CVD outcomes. We looked at um, high to low quintiles of the score, but also looked at, looked at it as a continuum. And we also assessed the linear trend. We looked at several different subgroup analyses, including uh, baseline hypercholesterolemia and diabetes status. And then we also um, looked at restricted cubic splines to assess the shape of the relationship. So we analyzed um, the, the um, analysis was performed separately in each cohort and then pooled. And for sake of time, I'm just going to show the uh, pooled results. So first looking at uh, cardiovascular events, um, we actually saw that uh, comparing high to low adherence, that the portfolio diet was associated with a 14% lower risk of cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, and stroke. And there was a significant linear trend. And when we um, analyzed this as a continuous variable, which was for six points, it was 8% reduction for each of the outcomes. And then the results remained generally consistent across all subgroups, um, including those uh, with diabetes. And then lastly, I'll just show the uh, dose response relationship. So we didn't see any evidence of departure from linearity for CVD, CHD, and stroke, so indicating a linear relationship with each outcome. So in conclusions, uh, we found that the portfolio diet pattern of these established cholesterol-lowering foods was associated with a 14% lower risk of each of those cardiovascular outcomes when comparing extreme quintiles with no evidence of departure from linearity, which confirms and expands on our findings from the WHI. And I'd just like to thank everyone. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we have eight seconds for question, but maybe not answer. So it's always between six and thirty. That's just how it's because it's population based. Um, so yeah, so it would be like six to ten in the first quintile, and then uh, twenty-five to thirty in the last. Thank you. Next victim, please. The next victim is um, Me <laughs> Megan Kavanagh, who was late, but hey, she's here hey, now. Hey. <laughs> All right, Megan Kavanagh here from the University of Toronto. I'm excited to talk about our Portfolio Diet app, where we actually got to test it in its intended population of adults at risk of cardiovascular disease. Here are my disclosures. So we've heard a lot about the portfolio diet today already, um, but briefly, it's five components, and when you take them all together in a por portfolio of foods, you get a drug-like benefit on LDL cholesterol of about 30% in trials. And they all have cholesterol-lowering claims or heart protective claims from the organizations listed below. Now, we've seen that it's beneficial, but not that many people are following the portfolio diet. So to help translate the diet into clinical practice, we developed the Portfolio Diet app. The Portfolio Diet app is a web-based application that's patient-facing. It's an educational engagement tool. It's fully automated, and it, it 
contains a variety of personalized and gamification elements, which as we've seen from Stephanie Nishi, are possibly going to help people follow the diet more. Now, last year I presented on a usability testing study where we assessed the app's usability in a convenient sample of users. But now we are going to look at the results of a pilot study where we look at the effects of the Portfolio Diet app on its intended population over three months on dietary adherence, so a behavior change, because this was run during the pandemic, so we couldn't actually have people. So this is an ancillary study that is be, that was Rex trial, which is ongoing. Participants were randomized one to one to either the Portfolio Diet app or the weightless control. We collected weighed seven day diet records because you don't need to see people in person to do that. And uh, it's, adherence was assessed using the Portfolio Diet score, but the clinical version, so it's a modified one um, to Andrea Glenn's. The results. We had a total of 14 people. They were mostly female and white. Their average age was 65, and 71% were on lipid-lowering medication, and 30% had type 2 diabetes. Now, when we look at adherence, if you look at table 2 here, uh, you can see that in the app group, the difference between week 0 to week 12 was about 5%. So these people were already following the portfolio diet. This is just um, them increasing it and then the waitlist group increased by 1%. However, these results were not statistically significant and there was no difference and then also the change between groups. Um, app usage had an average of 18 days per month where participants logged through the app and then app usability, or they logged into the app or they used the app. And then app usability score was 80.9, which is above the usability quality benchmark threshold of 70 for the system usability scale. So in conclusion, both groups showed good adherence to the portfolio diet, uh, which is good news for the Portfolio X trial. Um, and the weight and um, the difference between the two groups was not statistically significant, which can be related to a lack of power. This pilot study suggests the Portfolio Diet app is considered usable in adults at high risk for cardiovascular disease and a randomized control trial investigating the health-related outcomes, such as lipid targets, is warranted, and that's just a primer for what uh, Laura Chavrioli will be talking about in the CHEAP trial. And big thanks to the map. Thank you, Megan. I, because I'm going to ask a question about the C1. No, portfolio diet did they have diffi most difficulty adhering to? It's always the plant protein or the viscous fiber. I would say for this group, it was the plant protein for, for the 14. Thank you. Well done. Okay, so uh, we're next with Shari Laos. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, our study is on... Uh, is on the possible role of the breakfast intake and sleep quality in the glycemic control of patients with the type 2 diabetes. First of all, to give the uh, definition of breakfast, breakfast is the first meal of the day that breaks the fast after the longest period of sleep and in costume with, uh, two, within two or three hours uh, of waking. It is comprised of food of beverages uh, from uh, or at least one food group location. We know that uh, most of the patients with diabetes are di uh, of diabetes type 2, and we know also that lifestyle management, including the sleep and the, the chrononutrition, the number of the, uh, of the meals, or, but also medical nutrition therapy, are considered essential for the optimal man management of diabetes type 2. Skipping breakfast and sleeping habits seem to affect glycemic control in patients. The present study is the possible role of breakfast and sleep quality in the glycemic control of patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, the, uh, the people, the patients that were 
created between the period of time of October and January 2023. All of them, they uh, visited the outpatient diabetes clinic of Laiko Hospital. They were adults with type 2 diabetes, and they, they, they were provided with a questionnaire, validated questionnaire, including individual and clinical characteristics, eating habits and lifestyle, and also they have to uh, answer to questions uh, uh, on a, a sleeping quality scale. Uh, the results, the mean age, it was uh, 65 uh, years old, BMI, it was uh, the mean BMI over 30, and uh, the sleeping uh, quality sleep was 6.5, which is fair to, uh, to uh, good control of uh, sleep. As you can see, a, a quarter of the participants didn't have uh, the habit of eating breakfast. So the breakfast keepers reported eating dinner as the largest meal of the day, which we talks that it's not very good for the weight control and the glycemic control. So 30.8% 30 of the participants were breakfast keepers, and most of them, they are the younger people, they have shorter duration of diabetes, and only 7.8% were breakfast eaters. We found no significant correlation between breakfast consumption and uh, glycemic control, and there was a significant difference between the sleeping quality uh, sleep uh, scales uh, grade and people having larger dinner. So the breakfast keepers tend to eat a larger meal, but in the same time, sleep quality appears to be associated with a better glycemic control. The relationship of breakfast, sleep quality, and the regulation of type 2 diabetes need further investigation. Thank you very much. Questions? Any questions? And perhaps a uh, girl of dinner and the timing of the breakfast that you were considering? Uh, the timing of the breakfast? Mm -hmm. the, the, the breakfast is a period of time between the wake up and three hours after the wake up. But most of the people didn't, the quarter of the people didn't have breakfast with habit. At the same time, they moved the calories during dinner, which seems to be a negative point for the glycemic control. So when did they consume the dinner? Yeah. When did they consume the dinner? Uh, at night, the meal? When, at the at what, what uh, time? After nine o'clock. Most of them after nine o'clock. After nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. And those who had breakfast, at which time did they consume it? Usually it was between seven and nine, which mm. is very usual for the habits of Greece and uh, the timetable of Greece. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next one, we have Nancy from Spain. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to present my presentation. My work, uh, our work uh, um, is adherence to a healthy lifestyle behavior, composite score, and cardiometabolic risk factor in coral children cohort. As you know, childhood obesity is a global public health concern. In Europe, the prevalence is higher, especially in Mediterranean and Eastern uh, European countries. And uh, the most strategies to prevent or to treat this disorder are based increasing physical activity, decreasing sedentary behavior, and promoting healthy diet. But several studies, such as other behaviors, such as eating speed, can affect. The eating speed, uh, we can define the time the, that the person required to eat, to eat one meal. The different lifestyle behavior could interact and contribute to obesity onset and its comorbidity. And different authors created different a priori healthy lifestyle behavior composite score. And they demonstrated was uh, uh, showed uh, demonstrated uh, was inversely with obesity. But none of these composite score include breastfeeding, or, uh, eating speed, and adherence to the Mediterranean <coughs> diet. For this reason, our uh, aim was to assess cross-sectionality the association between adherence to a composite score comprised of six healthy lifestyle behavior and its individual components with several cardiometabolic risk factors. This is a cross-sectional study with the first um, children recruiting in the corals, coral childhood obesity risk assessment longitudinal study is ongoing 
a perfect case study, multicenter, conducting children uh, from seven uh, Spanish cities. This is the, com the composite score. We categorize the, the population complying this uh, each of uh, life uh, behavior, lifestyle behavior, exclusive breathing, uh, sleeping, physical activity, subterranean diet, and low eating speed. We zoom in this score and we categorize intertypes. The outcome were, were adiposity, blood pressure, fasting plasma glucose, and lipid profile. In this table, you can see the general characteristic of the study uh, participant across category of the adherence to the composite score. Uh, in, in orange, you can see uh, the, the significant difference, and you can see that those who participant in the third tertile uh, had um, lower uh, overweight uh, and lower fat mass index, and systolic and diastolic blood pressure. There you can see the association between the adherence to the composite score and positive. Uh, those participants in the third tertile, comparing to the first tertile, um, uh, presenting lower risk of the overweight, white circumference, and fat mass index. The same inversal association uh, were uh, observed in systolic blood pressure and plasma glucose. The no significant difference we observe in the um, lipid uh, um, cardiometabolism factors. When we ass assessing the individual association among each of the six healthy lifestyle uh, we positive, uh, we can observe in red um, the style inversal association we observe in the, in the different uh, parameters. And in all of them, we can observe that low eating showing to be the healthy behavior with the most of the individual cardiometabolism factor. factor. In the same, uh, we can observe with systolic and uh, diastolic blood pressure and fasting glucose. Uh, we have uh, a cross-sectional study, and we cannot dismiss uh, the association maybe due to taking in mind this uh, limitation. We can uh, conclude an and priori healthy lifestyle behavior composite score was associated with low city and cardiometabolic risk. A slow eating to be, to the, to be the healthy uh, behavior associated with the most of the individual cardiometabolic risk factor. However, further study are requiring to confirm this association. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any question? Quick one here on the back, please. Which question? <laughs> Um, maybe the uh, the different family. This we we don't assess is a hypothesis, but uh, maybe the uh, adherence to the Mediterranean diet uh, is um, higher in family with um, children have uh, a low eating. Um, and in general, the, the, the family is conscientious uh, uh, in relation to the healthy lifestyle, maybe. Uh, uh, sorry, and in the, in the characteristic, um, we observe that those family uh, um, who, um, uh, with a higher level, edu education higher level, uh, is um, associated uh, especially in the third tertiary or higher than to the major uh, the composite score. Thank you very much. Thank you. After Aditi to speak about web based uh, typing, <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. I see my slides. Uh, yeah, perfect. Hello everyone, um, I will present the validation study uh, of a web-based diet registration program in type 1 diabetes and I have no conflict of interest. So in Sweden we have uh, a lot of different uh, programs and apps uh, for diet registration. 
that what we were missing was a validated instrument that um, includes all the elements that we uh, are interested in when we work with type 1 diabetes. Um, so we chose nutrition data, which has the potential to be used uh, both for diet registration, uh, for carb counting, but also to report blood sugar levels and insulin doses um, in a clinical and in a research set, uh, setting. So the aim here was to evaluate the relative uh, validity of nutrition data and of method of dietary assessment in, in, in uh, type 1 diabetes. Uh, the study sample was a subgroup of a, a bigger RCT that we run in our clinic. Um, here we have 40 men and women. Uh, and uh, the comparison was uh, two unannounced 24-hour uh, recalls um, in overlapping days. So one weekday and one weekend day per person. Outcomes was uh, macronutrient intake and energy intake. And uh, we assessed also user acceptability and usability uh, with a questionnaire. See, here you see the characteristics of the sample. Um, they had uh, quite a high educational level, we could say. As for correlations, the, the, the two methods were uh, good correlated. We could say them. We can see the Spearman correlation coefficient ranged from 79 to 0 0.9 uh, for macronutrients and 0 0.77 for energy. Here we have the plan outcome to show the agreement between the two methods. Um, on the y-axis, we have the difference of the two methods, nutrition data minus 24 recall, and on the x-axis, it's the average intake. So for carbon uh, intake, um, there were some outliers, as you can see. Um, we could say there's a bit higher differences uh, in the methods, the higher the intake of carbohydrates. Uh, when it comes to fat and protein, um, there were also some outliers, um, but no consistent bias, and neither for energy intake. I can go back, because there are some people, yes. <laughs> Great. Here is the um, results of the questionnaire, and um, the um, found nutrition data easy to, um, to use and uh, they helped with uh, carb counting. There were also um, some areas for improvement. Um, oh, and I would like to mention it took, in average, uh, the main median uh, time was 20 minutes a day to register. So in conclusion, nutrition data can be a useful method for registration and carb counting in type 1 diabetes, in, uh, in adults with type 1 diabetes. Um, some improvements are needed at this time and further analysis are underway. So thank you very much. Thank you and well done. Um, how many people will give up 20 minutes a day and how often do you expect them to do this? That adds up to 50 hours. Uh, uh, well, I can't do it now. I worked it out a few minutes ago. Yeah. In a year, it's a lot of days. It's a lot. It's a lot. I, I agree. Um, we also thought that 20 minutes sounds a bit uh, a lot, but when you try, if you have a bit of more qualitative uh, investigation, you can check what are the um, limitations that each participant had. Because some people could do it in five and ten minutes, so it was okay. If we could identify those that have uh, that have these kind of difficulties in registration, I think that would uh, actually facilitate better. Uh, no other questions. Time. Are you are you proposing this for routine practice or for research use? Uh, this was in a research setting, but I have tried it also in the clinic in some people, not in every, not everyone. I think. Uh, Younger generation is quite keen on doing that instead of writing on the paper, and it really facilitates our remote assessment and analysis. Thank um, you very much. Maybe I missed it, but uh, uh, were you able to connect that to CGM data? Sorry? Can you connect that to CGM data? Um, not for the validation study, but we, we use this program in a large city that we have CGM data. We will do all that, yes. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to the next speaker, Andreas Huba. And I think you're giving two papers, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Zerbo from the University of Toronto. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is one of our systematic reviews, meta-analyses, where we are looking at associations of food human sugars with incident adiposity outcomes. So, uh, main organizations globally have been looking for a reduction in sugar intake. Um, we saw a really nice uh, session about this and about strategies on how these, this has been approached. Fructose has often been labeled as the main concern. And when this is translated by the public eye, we see that uh, the general perception is to reduce uh, all food sources of fructose containing sugars, and that includes fruit and 100% fruit juice. So is the questions of what is the role of food sources of fructose containing sugars on incident cardiometabolic outcomes? Um, I think there should be another slide here. So I don't know. Is there another, um, there should be an image here. But anyways, there's this, we did this uh, through a series that was led by um, our supervisor, Dr. John Seaton Piper, where we looked at different uh, cardiometabolic outcomes. Many of them have been presented here at the DNSG conference by my colleagues. So today I'm gonna be presenting only on the incident adiposity outcomes. You're all very familiar with um, our systematic review meta-analyses protocol. So we follow the Cochrane Handbook, we report according to the PRISMA and the NEWS guidelines, and we do register our protocols at clinicaltrials.gov. This particular analysis is including prospective cohorts of adult populations and individual uh, populations that were followed for at least one year and reported on incidence adiposity outcomes associated with food sources of fructose containing sugars. And that includes sugar sweetened beverages, yogurt, 100% fruits, fruit, and so forth. Our systematic search yielded 16 eligible cohorts. The, um, the adults were followed up for around two to 20 years and ranging, and they included mostly American populations, but we did have some cohorts that were representing European and Asian populations. We identified um, only some of the food sources of fructose containing sugars, so that includes sugar sweetened beverages, 100% fruit juice, fruit, yogurt, and confectionery sweets. So this is a summary of the preliminary data that we have. So you see the exposures on the first column, followed by the, um, the, the, the outcome, the number of cohorts, and the number of individuals included and the number of cases as applicable. Uh, the data is plotted uh, with uh, risk ratios, but to also include the waist circumference data here, that, that has been um, adjusted to be able to be plotted together with the risk ratios. The waist circumference is actually a change in centimeters from baseline. Um, so we saw harm associated from an increase, uh, sorry, from the highest level of intake of sugar sweetened beverages compared to the lowest intake of sugar sweetened beverages on all three um, adiposity markers, and some uh, minor indication from confectionery sugars or confectionery sweets. And we saw benefits or trends towards benefits from highest levels of intakes of 100% fruit juice, fruit, and yogurt compared to the lowest intakes. Oh, there's an image here too. Oh no, I pushed the black button. <laughs> There we go. Well, there should be, do you see an image on your side? No, it's not coming up. Well, this was a really beautiful heat figure <laughs> um, that maybe you've already seen in some of our earlier work John put together to summarize all the, um, all the associations that we have on the cardiometabolic outcomes. And what it was really showing was that these markers of adiposity were in line with the other outcomes that we saw from the same exposures. So sugar sweetened beverages at high intake levels showed to be harmful for cardiometabolic risk factors, uh, sorry, for cardiometabolic risk versus lower intakes, and fruit and 100% fruit juice and yogurt were shown to show. And this is our wonderful team that contributed to this work. Thank you.
Sorry, you're missing half the figures. But <laughs> Any other sugar categories besides food sources? Uh, no, not in this course. Just food sources. Okay. Food sources are fructose and some sugars, yeah. Um, can I just ask, the yogurt story, how does that relate to fructose? When they're sweetened. Sweetened yogurts. Sweetened yogurt. Yeah. Okay. So why did you look only at sweetened yogurt, not at sweetened other dairy? Because of the fructose containing fructose added. It's sucrose containing. Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry. The fructose containing sugars and the sweetened yogurt. So we were only looking at food sources of fructose containing sugars. So oftentimes, when the yogurt is sweetened, there will be sources of sugar in there, um, not the lactose, of course. Yeah. There's one more. <laughs> Can we Hi, have the second Zerbo. presentation? <laughs> yeah, I'll introduce myself again. Um, so now I'm excited to share with you some of the preliminary data that we have on um, exploring associations of dietary phytosterols with mortality outcomes in the American population. This is one, our first uh, looks into the NHANES cohorts. Share my disclosures. So you um, are all very familiar with the portfolio diet. You know that our group has an uh, interest in exploring the portfolio dietary pattern and its effects on health outcomes. Um, oh, sorry, well, so uh, plant sterile supplementation is one of the pillars of the portfolio diet. Uh, my, my colleague, Mark Evroli, she conducted a really nice systematic review meta-analyses that highlighted that yes, we do see a reduction in LDL cholesterol from following a portfolio diet dietary pattern, but we also see improvements in the other cardiometabolic risk factors. When um, we look at the data available for this similar story, so there has been uh, four systematic reviews, meta-analyses on random trials that have been recently published, and um, they've highlighted that yes, there is a reduction from uh, supplemental plant sterile intake on um, on LDL cholesterol, and of course these do have health claims, and we've helped to substantiate health claims in Canada, Europe, and the U.S. But we also see improvements or indications of potential improvements on other cardiovascular disease risk factors, including blood pressure, inflammation, and BMI. So very in line with what we see from the portfolio diet. So this work has been in supplemental plant protein sources, they're all, sorry, uh, supplemental plant sterile intakes. We wanted to look at diet and associated with cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality outcomes. So we chose to look at the NHANES uh, cohort. This is a nationwide problem. It includes individuals that are two months of age or older. Uh, you saw an earlier presentation from Chris Marinangeli when he was um, discussing the continuous NHANES cohort, so that, that's a much more recent analysis. We're looking at the NHANES 3 cohort, so this was a uh, survey that was done in two phases between 1988 and 1994. This particular survey had every uh, individual completing one 24-hour dietary recall and a subpopulation completed a second 24-hour dietary recall. And this is really important for us to be able to determine what the usual intake of um, a dietary component is in this population. And in October, uh, there was the release of the 2019 National Death Index. So we linked the cohort with this death index to get our uh, cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality outcomes. So the NHANES cohort has uh, nearly 34,000 individuals, but uh, it's a very young population, so only about half of these individuals are of adult age. So our final analysis is just under 13,000 people. The population was an average age of 44 years old and had a follow-up time of only about 24 years. When we look at the main uh, food sources of dietary minerals, we see that potatoes, particularly fried potatoes, are of a high source. It's followed by wheat and other grains, and then beans, nuts, and legumes. So this is our, our preliminary data, looking at dietary phytosterol consumption and CVD mortality. <coughs> In the 
the first row, you see the absolute plant sterile intake per day in milligrams, but this analysis is actually uh, looking at the nutrient density. So it's uh, the second row there, which is the plant sterile intake per 1,000 kilocalories per day. So what we see is that in our minimally adjusted model, we do see an association between a uh, higher intake of dietary phytosterol consumption and uh, reduction in CBD mortality, but this association is no longer when we have a fully adjusted model in this nutrient density approach that we took. However, when we look at all-cause mortality, because of the size of the population, we had very uh, limited number of cases in CBD mortality, but when we look at all-cause mortality, of course, we have um, a lot more cases, and so we do see a nice uh, reduction from an increase in dietary phytosterol consumption um, and reduction in all-cause mortality in CBD. So our next steps, again, these are preliminary analyses, so we do need to look um, at additional adjustments in our model. We also want to explore healthful versus unhealthful sources of dietary phytosterols. We're going to look at the shape of the relationship and see if it's linear or nonlinear relationship and then do some further subgroup analyses. Thank you. I was just uh, wondering about the potatoes. Is it the oil? Is it? Yes. Yes, it's larger. There is phytosterols in the potato as well, but the reason why they're the largest source is mostly because they're high. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We have a speaker from Canada, Dan. I don't see her. And Dana, yeah. Please. Yeah. No, no, I'm from Canada. Canada. Yeah. But we weren't we quite sure. The next one is cancelled, right? So we were starting uh, get, getting on with the cancelled. I did. Italy, Josefina, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to present my research today, and I am very excited to continue the conversation on reducing blood pressure. So, no conflicts of interest to disclose. Okay. I will sum this up in three statements because this was covered extensively yesterday, but as we already know, cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of death globally, and we also saw from a previous presentation that it's the leading cause of death as well for diabetes. Um, the burden is attributable to modifiable risk factors, with the top two right now being high systolic blood pressure and dietary risks. And we see that there's been an increase in adults affected by high systolic blood pressure, and we also know that this, of course, leads to increased risk of cardiovascular disease and other comorbidities like chronic kidney disease and stroke. So across the board, our guidelines, um, of course, recommend us to reduce our salt intake. That is usually the first line of defense for lowering blood pressure. Um, but we can't forget about uh, recommendations that emphasize us to have a diet high in whole fruits, vegetables, whole grain foods rich in dietary fiber, and also protein from plant sources. These are also uh, dietary patterns that you see in the DASH diet, which was explained to you very beautifully by um, Andrea. So I won't go through it very um, in detail, but a nice parallel is that it's actually very similar to Canada's Food Guide. And Canada's Food Guide is really promoting a dietary pattern that is meant to just promote good health and also to help reduce our disease risk. So why am I here to talk about soy in my research? Well, whether you're plant-based or not, there has been a growing interest in plant-based diets in general, but also dairy alternatives. And we even see a shift in national guidelines um, in recommending us to eat more plant-based eating patterns for both health and environmental reasons. And this quote here that I have in blue is actually taken straight from Canada's Food Guide, telling us to choose more plant protein foods more often as they can be beneficial for our heart health. Now, when it comes to soy, it already for cholesterol reduction, 25 grams per day. And when you take high cholesterol, high blood pressure, these two are very well connected for CVD risk. Um, and when you have one, the, uh, the increase of the other tends to go up as well. 
And there is some RCT and cohort data to show hypotensive effects of soy protein, but clarity in the research is needed. We do want to see if soy protein can also be beneficial for reducing blood pressure. Which brings me to my project, a systematic review meta-analysis of randomized controlled feeding trials to see if soy protein can reduce blood pressure. So this was also mentioned quite a few times today, but I follow the Cochrane Handbook. I use the following databases to search, including a manual search, and I searched articles up until January 19th of this year. I included randomized controlled trials that had adults in, um, with an intervention length of greater or equal to three weeks, comparing any form of soy protein versus any form of non-soy as the comparator, and as my two outcomes would have to include systolic and diastolic blood pressure. My primary analysis, I pooled mean differences using the generic inverse variance method and using the Dersimian and layered random effect models. I also looked at heterogeneity, dose response, and publication bias. So overall, I found uh, 1,083 reports, and then I included a total of 45 trials and 59 trial comparisons. So I will just brief by this. I know it's a lot of information, but the median age of my participants were 53 years of age, uh, me median BMI of 28, various health status, and I just highlighted in bold um, the amount of trials that had type 2 diabetes patients. Um, and as you see across the board, I had a variety of hypertensive status, also normotensive and prehypertensive. Okay. So my main results. So just to, I know it's, it might be a bit small for you. So what you see in the top half there would be for systolic blood pressure and beneath that would be the different types of soy food sources. And then in the bottom half, I have the diastolic blood pressure. And I found that total food sources of soy did result in a significant reduction in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure when comparing it to controls. And more interestingly, I found um, a significant interaction by food source and we found significant reduction from the soy milk and soy nuts group specifically for both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And another interesting thing I wanted to mention was that two out of the seven soy milk trials were completed with uh, type two diabetic patients. So to conclude, my systematic review meta-analysis showed a significant but trivial decrease in both systolic and diabetic total food sources of soy protein. There was an effect modification by food source specifically in soy milk and soy nuts, showing a moderate and small import reduction in systolic and diastolic blood pressure respectively. And this may contribute to the benefit of soy protein as a health promoting food for CBD risk reduction. And with that, thank you. Any questions? Well, maybe I can I can add one. Um, if you say that, and this is trivial, and in the end, then you conclude that it contributes. Maybe you can clarify a little bit. Um, I'm just saying it may contribute because I'm still doing further analysis mm -hmm. to see if I will maybe have a stronger effect with more studies or as I um, investigate some of my subgroups. But considering that I had such a strong effect for soy milk and soy nuts, um, and it is clinically significant, it, it could. I would still. Personally, I would still recommend it as a, to consume it to help reduce blood I'm pressure. thinking perhaps because of other health benefits that you have in mind? No. Other, Be, other health benefits beyond um, blood pressure? Uh, well, you will hear a presentation tomorrow on the benefits of cholesterol from soy milk. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> so put it in that context, perhaps. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, we were instructed that the last presenter was not here, but maybe... The last presenter is here. Mm -hmm. Ah, the last presenter is here. The last presenter is going to have to read the title and explain what it has to do with diabetes. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> I hope you've had a good holiday. So, thank you so much for this opportunity. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Well, today, these chemicals on human sperm quality. So you these chemicals, dioxins and furans, uh, take an important place due to the widespread distribution and their presence in food and in our day-to-day -day products such as food packaging or food contact materials. Dioxins and furans are toxic chemicals that persist in the environment and accumulate in the food chains. 
it is known that more than 90% of the total shot to these chemicals came directly from bios. And uh, they are recognized also as endocrine disrupting chemicals, and they are related with um, potential and chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes and obesity. But there is growing body of evidence suggesting that uh, they can be also related with uh, infertility. So nowadays, infertility affects around 15% of the world's population. Male factors are responsible for almost 50% of the cases. And in the last 40 years, it has been so a decrease in sperm quality parameters. So are these chemicals related to infertility? Can they alter the sperm quality? So our hypothesis was that the dietary exposure to these chemicals, thiopsins and furans, recognized as endocrine disrupting chemicals, could negatively impact the sperm quality parameters. The objective was to assess the associations between the dietary intake of these uh, chemicals and the sperm quality parameters in a core a study population named Left Fertile with 200 healthy men between 18 and 14 years old. So to achieve that, dietary intake was assessed using a validated food frequency questionnaires and the most updated levels input of these chemicals were considered. On the other way, the seminogram parameters were assessed by CASA system. So here we have the descriptive baseline characteristic of the participants. Uh, we divided our, po our population in tertiles of uh, energy adjusted total dietary intake of these chemicals, being the tertile three, the one with the highest dietary intake of these chemicals. I would like to point out that in tertile three, participants present higher body mass index. This was in line with other available articles. And it's important to mention that these chemicals are also recognized as obesogenic factors. In addition, in tertile three, we can see that participants saw a higher um, amount of these uh, dioxins and chemicals in fish and red meat um, products, as we can see represented here in this pie chart, being meat in red and fish and seafood in blue, the major contributors to the total dietary intake of these chemicals. So here we have the seminogram parameters across the energy adjusted total dioxins and furans dietary intake in tertiles and in continuous form. And as you can see, participants in tertile 3 and also in a continuous form show an increase in their normal sperm head. No other significant association were found, however, the trend was in the expected duration for several sperm parameters. This analysis already point out important findings that need to be studied further. So what we have on the literature data regarding that topic? We have recently published a meta-analysis, uh, meta systematic review meta-analysis enti entitled Lack of Association Between Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals and May Fertility, as with this title, you can imagine what we found on the literature data. Anyway, a total of uh, three articles regarding dioxins were included in our meta-analysis, and we really realized that um, this was very disparity among studies. The participants also included in this meta-analysis were very, very few, just less than 200. So I think we have to make an effort and, uh, and to further study uh, these chemicals. So coming back to the main conclusions of the study, minimal research exists of these dioxins and furans, dietary exposure and human sperm quality. Current studies show significant associations between higher dioxins and furans intakes and a negative impact on sperm morphology parameters. And in addition, in all results, uh, we saw that higher dietary intake of these chemicals was related with higher body mass index consumption of fish, red meat, and beverage. Finally, we would like to advise the population to minimize exposure to these chemicals as much as possible until more robust data are available. Thank you so much. We have questions at the front here, but two, two points from me. Firstly, you cannot have a, a non-significant association. No such thing exists. What you mean, the evidence does not support the statement that there is an association. Okay. And the second a question from me is, um, do you think the overweight, the greater prevalence of in overweight is because um, these disruptors are causing weight gain, or do you think overweight people are eating more food?
Okay, the first point was simply your slide saying that there were um, non-significant associations, I'm afraid is incorrect. So this, I hope David Allison, uh, he's probably doing something more important, but he is here, he would scream to see that. If you have something which does not support the statement there's an association, you can't say there is a non-significant association. It isn't, it is a grammatical and scientific error. But my question was, uh, the association with overweight and the disruptors, is that because they are causing weight gain or is it because overweight people eat more food? You know, it's difficult. Um, at the end, to calculate this dietary intake of these chemicals, we have to take into account the amount of the different food items that uh, these uh, men uh, consume. But of course, uh, the concentration of these chemicals in, in, uh, in these uh, food items. And um, at the end, you just, this is an, uh, a dietary intake uh, um, estimation. So uh, it's, I think the next step is to go for the biomonitoring uh, to measure directly the, um, the chemicals in, 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 in samples. And uh, in that way, we can see more or less how, how it's going. So I don't know if you answered your question. <laughs> <because> <laughs> so what, what database are you using to estimate the dioxins and purines? For the EFSA. Yeah. From EFSA, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. two, hands, two hands were up, have they gone down? Mm -hmm. Two hands still up, quick, quick. I wonder what are the sources of these substances that we might touch, such as in furniture and plastic, um, plastics yeah. of all sorts. It's not just coming from the diet. So can you measure the level in the blood as well? Yeah, you can measure the levels in blood. But uh, of course, I think it's important to have a background of uh, the kind, the dietary patterns that these uh, people um, take or are used to, to consume because it's not the same, for example, to for ex uh, if you try to avoid the packaging or like a polycarbonate plastics, uh, canned food, um, you know, paper plastic. Also, it's important that maybe if you buy this kind of uh, food, if you warm this food, also the immigration of uh, this came increased to six to ten times more. So I think finally you can measure the, the levels of uh, these chemicals in, in, in blood, for example, if there are persistence. But you, how you can know if they come directly from diet or maybe for, for the profession, for their, uh, you know, for another habits that they have. So I think it's important to have this uh, background. Okay, so this is already the question. Oh, you, you want to, to add something? <laughs> Jordi? You, you can hear me. Uh, only to say that these endocrine disruptors have been related in several studies that are related to body weight. So um, in PREDIMED plus, we have an association between these uh, chemicals and the risk of uh, changes in body weight and cardiovascular risk factors. And we have observed also this association. So probably, probably are causal this relationship, but we cannot uh, say anything. So we need, it is impossible to conduct clinical trials in order to have causality. Okay, so we're coming to an end, I think. <laughs> I'm very glad that we all made it through this uh, very urgent <laughs> ride. <laughs> Thank you all for abiding with us and, and uh, yeah, making it possible that we're almost on time and see you tonight. Two within the, the allotted time. Well done. <laughs>